Okay, is the city clerk ready? I am, but I only see you and Council Member Kalantari Johnson logged in. So. Okay, I will begin as I pull up my notes. If city clerk is ready. Okay. I am ready, but we do not have a quorum. Okay, I will begin. Good morning and welcome to our 9 a.m. May 25th, 2022 special meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Kalantari Johnson. Present. Boulder. Currently absent. Cummings? Here. Brown? Here. Myers? Absent. Vice Mayor Watkins is absent. And Mayor Bruner? Present. Thank you. Today's presentation is part two of the city's budget presentations. We will receive presentations from the remaining departments that we did not get to hear from yesterday. At the end of today's presentations, I will call for public comment on the departments who have presented today. Today, we will be hearing from uh, economic development, planning and community development, and public works, police, city attorney, parks and recreation. Uh, and I think that's it. Um, I will now, and I will, after each department, uh, call for council questions and comments after each presentation. So with that being said, we are anticipated to be here until about 5.30 p.m. today. And uh, I would like to begin by calling on Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development, to give a presentation on the economic development and housing budget. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and members of the council. Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development and Housing. And I'm going to share my screen. And today's presentation um, will be uh, presenting the fiscal year 23 economic development and housing budget for the city of Santa Cruz. And I wanna first just start off and um, say thank you to all of my staff. Um, everyone had a hand in preparation of today's budget as well. Specifically, I wanna call out uh, Catherine Mintz and Tiffany Lake who pulled this presentation together. So uh, this would not be possible without, without their support. So uh, first going to start off talking about some of our core services um, achievements. And um, as we talk through each of the core services, business services, um, housing development and, pres and preservation, infrastructure development and asset management and arts and culture, we'll talk about the accomplishments as we go through each of those. Um, I will say overall economic development is a very small department. We're roughly 2.9% of the net general fund budget. And um, that's possible because we, we do work across a lot of different funding sources um, and as well as our funding sources specifically for housing um, and then grant funding. And then we still have uh, redevelopment bonds that we're moving forward with some of our CIP projects. We also have our economic development trust fund, which is um, a small 1% uh, of the TOT revenue that comes in to help us move forward with many of our infrastructure um, projects as well. 
Um, I will say overall, we've been very busy the last few um, years, the last couple of years specifically, um, really working on economic recovery efforts um, for the city. Um, and you'll see that as we go through uh, some, of, some of the following slides. Uh, specifically, um, focusing on business services, we do, we do support business creation, permitting, technical assistance, and promotion of small businesses. Um, a couple of the photos you see there are from our recent small business uh, business summit with small business development center that was at the mall. Um, we do other other events and coordinate other events like the new tech meetup um, with Santa Cruz works and other other events uh, across the city. Um, we do convene business leaders. We collaborate um, regionally on economic development initiatives and we do promote business growth through financing incentives, uh, beautification grant like our facade improvement program. This one you see of the buttery and site selection efforts. Specifically, some of our business services accomplishments over the last year um, is our Shop Santa Cruz campaign. Um, we also have uh, over 100 temporary outdoor dining permits um, through our program. We will be in the process of transitioning that. We've been working on the permanent program uh, for the last six months or so and meeting individually with businesses prior to the expiration in December. Uh, we've uh, launched uh, with National Development Council um, an expansion of our pre-existing Gross Santa Cruz loan program, but we were able to um, really partner during the pandemic with our neighboring jurisdictions to launch a countywide Gross Santa Cruz loan program, and we're really proud of that collaboration. Um, we've also assisted and provided assistance and retention efforts to more than 300 businesses in the last year, and then through our Downtown Pops program and related efforts, we've secured five spaces through the program, three pop-up activations with more to come in the works, and then one business relocated through support related to the program. Um, looking at some of our housing development and preservation, we do obviously affordable housing uh, creation. This is a rendering of on the far left of our Taxation South project, which we'll talk more in in just a minute. Um, we also do uh, affordable housing preservation, monitoring affordable housing units um, within the city, a couple thousand units um, every year, and then community development programs from community development block grant to home, some of the funding and funding assistance we have with some of our community partners like Housing Authority of Santa Cruz County and uh, Community Action Board for a couple of our housing assistance programs. Um, specifically on some of our housing accomplishments, securing American Rescue Plan Act funding um, over a million of CDBG and home through our annual action plan, um, really taking advantage of some of the state ordinance, state legislative changes um, by updating some of our housing related ordinances and obviously working on that with planning and then securing several large grants for affordable housing. Um, <laughs> Again, this is the PAC Station South groundbreaking, which was last week. Um, this project, which is now underway, is over 70 is 70 units of affordable housing. It includes uh, a new home, a new downtown home for the Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Deensis, providing uh, low cost uh, medical and dental care for Santa, for the Santa Cruz community. We will have a, a sort of a retail, hopefully a cafe component on the corner to really help activate that lower Pacific Avenue. And then as you can see, um, a Paseo that connects as part of the downtown plan with the Riverwalk. Um, and specifically, you know, on this project, um, we, and I'll get into that in a second, but we've been able to secure some major grants that really help pay for some of those uh, public infrastructure improvements. We have over 20 million between two grants, um, totaling over 51 million. That's specifically for infrastructure improvements and lower Pacific Avenue improvements related to these housing developments. So we're really excited about being able to implement uh, the original vision as part of the downtown plan related with these two affordable housing projects, Pack Station South and Pack Station North. Um, we've also secured um, 350,000 through state HCD relocation funds that we've been able to put into the creation of affordable housing. 1.2 of the state permanent local housing allocation that matches our own affordable housing trust fund. This is a permanent source of funding going forward. I will say this allocation is over five years. So we get roughly 300,000 a year for that. And we do have to come up with a five-year plan. So each five-year five year increments, we plan sort of the next, the next allocation. 
And then we applied for and were successful um, in actually two rounds, but for included in the current fiscal year 22 budget, we have 5 million um, that was secured as a grant fund match to our affordable housing trust fund through the local housing trust fund at through HCD. New funding in fiscal year 23, we applied for and received another $5 million grant match um, second round to our affordable housing trust fund. And additionally, through the American Rescue Plan Act, we secured another $1.3 million through HUD. Um, so uh, quite a bit of funding that we've been able to secure and really take advantage of being in that sort of both developer hat and partnering on public-private partnerships, being in a position to be very competitive um, for state and federal funding sources. Um, on our infrastructure development and asset management side, we do a considerable amount of master planning. Um, here's an example you know, of the work master plan. We've also done this for the, the Tannery Arts Campus, Ocean Street Corridor. Um, we do these and obviously work, work closely with planning on a lot of these efforts, um, but do a lot of economic analysis um, and really looking at it from the lens of promoting um, economic sort of vitality and prosperity in Santa Cruz. Uh, we also do uh, a lot of real estate management and managing of the city's assets, um, as well as looking at the city as a whole and looking at future op opportunities. So the middle photo shows the Tannery Arts Center, which is a city-owned asset, one of our former redevelopment, now housing successor assets. And a real opportunity we have going forward is looking at what you see in that sort of uh, pink purple uh, section, looking at the Caltrans owned property as a future opportunity for a mixed use affordable housing project. So working with our legislators, working with our council and our, you know, our city leadership to really help secure these new opportunities to create affordable housing in the future. And then finally, we do manage, um, you know, over 80 leases and license agreements across the city for city owned property, manage those tenants, do contract administration, and uh, leasing property and kiosks for um, city use. Recent awards, I mentioned these, so I won't, I won't talk too much about them, but uh, securing actually over 52 and a half million between these three grants um, for uh, two, of our, two of our main uh, affordable housing projects um, in the downtown on Pacific Avenue, Pack Station South and Pack Station North. And of that 52.5 million, uh, you know, 20 million of that is specifically for infrastructure and the balance of that over 30 million goes straight into the affordable housing creation that the actual construction of the affordable housing. And then additionally, working with some of our partners in the city, including um, Tiffany Wise West and Public Works, um, we secured um, a, a million dollar Epic Challenge Award through the California Ener Energy Commission. Um, so specifically in sort of designing and modeling a state of the art energy and water sustainability infrastructure for Pack Station North. Uh, some of our recent uh, sort of accomplishments on the infrastructure and asset management side through pandemic recovery, uh, specifically looking at the photo that you see here is of Midtown Fridays of really trying to create these um, activation and vitality of some of our areas and city owned assets. This is again, a former redevelopment agency owned uh, asset. This is the east side, what we call the east side parking lot. And uh, we're excited to be kicking this off again um, with event Santa Cruz this June, June 3rd, um, for another long period of Midtown Friday. So we're really excited about that. Um, we are in the process of finishing up. Um, it's been a very long haul, the Del Mar um, storefront is going in, I think later this week, and um, we should be finishing up uh, early next month and be ready to lease out that space, as well as some renovations that we did to our kiosk at Cafe Campesino. Um, we're getting really close back to pre-COVID uh, rental revenues across our leases at the city, which is really great to see, but we also have been as a city entity in a position of support during the pandemic. And so that's something that we will come forward to you um, in the months ahead um, to look a little more closely at that. Um, and then uh, we also received um, a economic development administration grant for just a little under 4 million to do um, the last sort of vision that was for the Tannery Arts Center campus, which is the dance building. So we've been working closely with uh, leadership um, at the Tannery Arts Center campus on moving forward and what that uh, new center would look like. The arts and culture side, um, we have a number of, and this is our newest program, is the City Art of Recovery Design Pilot Grant Program. This is a close collaboration with the Arts Council. 
Um, we also have the Santa Cruz Equity Collab was created around the Black Lives Matter mural, um, the Tannery World's Dance Center Black Health Matters, a Frinda initiative, and then the sponsoring of the Seawall Santa Cruz. This is the, the last, uh, last salmon, I think, um, which is one of my favorite, uh, favorite murals um, in the downtown um, on the backside of the Soquel Garage. Um, but through the Santa Cruz sponsorship of Santa Cruz Seawalls, we were able to help support the creation of 18 city murals citywide within three weeks, which is a pretty incredible accomplishment. Um, also want to reaffirm the recognition of the importance of the creative economy. Um, that's why one of the reasons arts in economic development, um, this study, which is already kicked off um, by the Arts Council, does have funding from uh, the city of Santa Cruz through our arts program. It's going to take uh, place over the course of the next year. Um, the last time this study was done was in 2014. Um, and we're really excited to be to be a part of this effort and really important to show what that direct impact is. Um, the other photo that you see is actually the first completed um, the Mariachi Eterno uh, with UCSC, um, which was performed at London Nelson, which is one of the first completed projects of our card program. Um, arts program accomplishments, I mentioned seawalls already, our card uh, pilot pr uh, grant program. Um, the mural shown here is Kaya Koopman's Let's Solve the Dissolve um, and uh, worked, uh, worked also through on Storm Drain Mural at Poets Park and as I mentioned, the Black Health Matters of Frinda. Um, want to just talk briefly uh, uh, as we move into our budget about our department team. Um, this year we have um, 14.5 positions authorized, but 1.5 of those, those are in the light blue, were vacant. And actually we were slated to delete one of those positions, but we do have a, a request to fill those positions as well as add a development manager specifically on the housing front to really help us move forward with the um, really complicated affordable housing projects, development projects we have underway, as well as the management of um, the uh, affordable housing grants and other funding sources that are that are helping us move these projects forward. This is our team. Um, and as I said, they've all um, pitched in uh, in helping prepare this presentation and obviously in doing all the all the work that we do. And I'm just I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of this team um, and all the work that they've done over the over the last year. Um, and with that, I want to acknowledge our new name. Santa Cruz Economic Development and Housing. Obviously, housing has always been a critically important part of our department, but sort of acknowledging that and expanding our name that reflects more uh, the proportion and the, the emphasis on the work that we do, and particularly the work that we have underway and going forward um, into the future with the recognition of the importance of really creating housing in Santa Cruz and that need that we have in our community. Um, looking quickly at our budget, um, our total expenditures, our total revenues are 10 million. And you can see the majority of that is through our affordable housing trust fund, our home funds. Uh, less than 2% of our funding comes from the general fund. Um, and we do have um, quite a bit of work uh, across these areas on the housing and community development front. Our total expenditures um, for this year is, is 6 million. Um, and you can see the breakdown from business services, housing, community development, project support, and personnel. Um, as we look at um, overall funding, uh, this is sort of our CIP funding, sort of a, a snapshot for coming forward later, new grant funding, affordable housing trust fund, ED trust fund, and former redevelopment agency bonds. We do not have any general fund in our CIP projects that we have going forward. Um, if you look at the middle column for fiscal year 23, that 12 million is our new funding across the funding sources that I just briefly mentioned um, across grants, ED trust fund, and, ED, and uh, former redevelopment agency bond funding. Our budget reductions this year, we proposed, um, we identified 86,000. Uh, um, we are moving forward with these with the exception of the allocation of graffiti program staff at 19,000. We're not going to, to do that portion this year, and we are not uh, moving forward with recommending the annual funding to the Arts Council. We're keeping that one point, the 1,700 in, in their budget without that reduction this year. Um, but we are reducing some of our planning services, facade improvement funding, um, as well as some of our contributions to the Get Virtual website program. That program is still ongoing. 
And with that, I'll wrap it up and happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, uh, Director Bonnie Lips. Um, that was a very thorough and quick summary and great presentation. Um, if if you could go back to that last reduction slide quickly. Is that possible? Thank you. Uh, and so let's see, what do you, these are all the reductions that you're, you've identified. These are the ones that we identified and through a meeting, um, a, a staff meeting with the city manager's office and sort of talking through these, we um, agreed to move forward with all of these reductions with the exception of the very first one, which is the allocation of graffiti program staff. This is what we allocate the work that we do um, administratively on our end for the other departments and allocating um, for, for example, if uh, a graffiti is in a, a parks, you know, so right. it's sort of our internal allocation. We're not going to do that piece and charging that to other departments. We're just going to absorb that through our existing team. Um, and then the other piece we're not moving forward on is the reduction, the 1700 in reduction to the Arts Council. Okay. So the, the new total is about what, 60, 66, 60, yeah, I'd say, yeah, 60, 63,000 roughly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will now bring it out to council members for questions and comments. Uh, I see council member Cummings, go ahead. Bonnie, thanks for that presentation. Um, it's great to hear about all the good work that's happening, all the funding that's getting secured. I'm just wondering, and maybe um, we can circle back to this question, but um, I'm just curious. You know, it seems like there's funding that's going, there's a lot of funding that's moving around as it relates to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And I'm just kind of curious about what is kind of like the, I guess, what's like the, balance right now if you take into account kind of what's been allocated towards the various projects that are you know underway and what we've received yeah i will say actually all of our affordable housing trust fund is allocated right now and that's largely a result of um the type of funding that's coming in to match our affordable housing trust fund so for example when we do the rounds of the five million that we did for the local housing trust fund we had to match that with our affordable housing uh with our affordable housing trust fund. And on top of that, we had to allocate which projects it was going for in order for them to award us the funding. So when we try to leverage our funding, we often have to commit it to a specific project. So we do right now have all of the current funding allocated across um, that's coming into the affordable housing trust fund that's currently in, I should say, across PAC Station South, PAC Station North, and uh, the, li the for library affordable housing um, mixed use project. But I will say we do have ongoing funding sources that that will be coming in this year that aren't yet allocated. So we do have some funding coming in, some small amount of funding coming in um, that's part of a development agreement on 555 Pacific Avenue. Um, we do have funding that will be coming in on in lieu fees or development fees that will come into the project. We don't have those budgeted yet because we don't quite know what the timing of those will be. But as that funding comes in, that funding will be uh, will be available. And that's important and I'm glad you brought the question up because we will be coming to you at some point in the next few months um, looking at some really important and critical uh, private, privately led projects, um, really looking at the city on whether or not there could be a waiver of a certain of number of city fees. And so, you know, we want to support all those projects to the extent that we to the extent that we can. We do have um, roughly, I think it's 650,000 that should be coming in within the next six months off the circles, the Eret Circles project. Um, and we were hoping to have that available for the Natural Bridges for, um, Housing Authority project. And, but there are some other uh, privately funded projects that are really hoping to have uh, their fees either waived or, waived or deferred. Um, and um, so we're looking at those and looking at ways that we can help that where possible. But that's gonna is going to be a major decision point for you coming forward in the next few months. 
Great. And then I'm just curious uh, how the, um, you know, we launched a small business, um, small business microloan COVID-19 program. And that, you know, a lot of businesses took advantage of that. And I'm just curious, are we starting to see some of, I mean, it's a bit, you know, it really was intended to help small businesses and, you know, as they recover, slowly pay that back. And so I'm just kind of curious what the status of that program is. Yeah, so we had two different programs. We had one early on, like really early on in the pandemic, where we quickly got out 50 mm -hmm. loans, 500,000. And the majority of those, at least half of those have already been paid back. A lot of them were bridge funding. Um, and by and large, um, we should go back and look at the number of those visits. But I believe by and large, they're all um, still open and running active businesses, which was really the intent is to keep these businesses alive provide some much needed emergency sort of capital, um, whether or not it's paying, do, you know, paying for payroll, just keeping those doors open during the pandemic. Um, what we do see right now, um, particularly as we look at vacancies in the downtown and through our re recent broker breakfast that we had with the downtown association last month is that while there's still a number of vacancies, particularly downtown, when you look at that, because that's where we have the greatest concentration of businesses in a, in a, in a you know, sort of core area, there's a lot of leasing activity underway right now. So I do think that we are going to be seeing um, a lot of the remaining vacancies um, be filled in the months ahead. And um, folks are, are, are feeling better about, uh, you know, about the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Does that conclude your questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bonnie, for the presentation and all the work. It's it's amazing to see it um, synthesized in this way. There's so much that's been done. I just had one question about the the reductions. Um, so, in particular, I was I was curious about the Get Virtual website marketing program. I know that there are pretty small programs, sort of a shoestring budget. What happens to their capacity to to fully implement with our cuts, and how are we working with them to help them get some other resources? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I I just will say I absolutely love the Get Virtual program and that collaboration that we have with UCSC and NADA. Um, when it first started and was really kicking off, we were the main. Um, sponsor of that program and then during the pandemic we gave it additional funding so and, and that was critical actually during the pandemic for helping some of those businesses quickly get online when they no longer had a brick and mortar you know access point for the community so get virtual was critical it's still a really important tool but they have a they're a little more established now they don't need us as the main funder um, so we are still uh, providing funding. It's 10,000 in our budget. Um, it's just not the same amount that we had uh, previously when we were really trying to make sure that this program stayed afloat and provided that resource critically for businesses who didn't have online platforms or that e-commerce tool. Um, so we, we still are a big supporter of the program. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for all the work. Thank you, Calentine. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Brown. I thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Bonnie, for the overview. It was great to see um, all of the wonderful work that's happening and just so impressive the funding that you've been able to leverage for affordable housing projects. <clears throat> so <clears throat> just can't can't thank you enough for all of your work and your team, small and mighty team. Um, I just have one question and I feel like I already like I've asked this and I can't remember the answer so I'm just gonna ask again um, wondering um, about the economic development trust fund in the um, fund balance recap in our budget it's by page 49 you'll know you'll I don't think I need to refer you to it but it's page 49 it's um, number economic development where am I oh, 136 fund balance and I said so we have a uh, projected other financing uses 1.3 million and I'm I'm just wondering what that allocation was about it's about half of the trust fund balance hold on I have staff coming in because I don't I can't find that page and I'm sorry I'm sorry I was gonna send this to you earlier or yesterday and I just ran out of time but um I thought it, it, it's not yeah 
Can you repeat that number, please? It's page 49. It's item. It's the public. Um, it's the Economic Development Trust Fund. It's um, Fund 136. Okay. Sorry. Just Sorry. a quick debrief, quick debrief there. Okay. It's a rolling up of two programs um, that we're continuing and expanding next year. Um, 500,000 of that is um, anticipated for potentially another round of loan funds, um, recovery funds. And, um, and then we have, as part of that, of doing the permanent outdoor expansion program, we wanted to have a loan fund available, um, which would have a forgivable element for those doing outdoor dining expansions, recognizing that that transition from temporary outdoor dining um, to permanent is costly. Um, particularly as we're looking at having uniform, having an option to have a uniform design in the downtown specifically. And the estimate of those is between 40 and 70,000. So we wanted to have an opportunity to have uh, forgivable loans, a portion forgivable uh, loan funding available to help finance that over a five year period. And then if they keep that their business open for that period, they would have a portion of that forgiven each year. So it's, it's to really move forward with some of our economic development programs and financing tools that we have available in the budget. Thank you. That was my only question. Okay, great. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, it looks like that concludes our council questions. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation and um, I will continue on to the next Great. department. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Okay. Uh, I will now call on Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, to give a presentation on Planning and Community Development's budget. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and Council members. Good morning. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. Let me get my presentation going here. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes, thank Great. you. All right. Um, <clears throat> I've got about uh, 15 minutes here and I'm gonna go through the five things identified here. Our core services, our team, the budget, our achievements for last year and our goals for this coming year. Um, our mission is to enhance quality of life, safety, and civic pride for our community by providing land use and development guidance through responsive, respectful, and efficient public service. So let's dive into those. In uh, land use and development, we've got long range planning, current planning, and building working on those aspects. Uh, we, have in we have community engagement components and we have, um, of course, our plan review, permit issuance, and inspection functions. In public health and safety, we inspect rental housing to ensure the safety of that. Um, we respond to code compliance issues. Um, we work with Tiffany Wise West on sustainability issues like um, green building practices, such as the building electrification. Um, and we inspect construction to ensure structural integrity, escape and rescue, emergency lighting, and a whole range of other safety measures. Um, with respect to efficient delivery of our services and quality customer service, we are shifting to uh, improve and um, interact more in the digital realm. So working on online and electronic plan review and submittal services while still recognizing that uh, it's important and helpful to be able to talk with some of our customers face to face. So um, here we are talking with some of our customers in our permit center. And of course we do lots of plan review in the office and in the field. As I mentioned that those paper copies are shifting to electronic more and more. And um, then of course we're Conforming, confirming that the plans um, are matching what's getting constructed out in the field. You can see here uh, some of our team at work looking at rebar and electrical and structural and so forth. We've got five divisions in our department. We've got 36 FTEs, full-time equivalents in uh, the upcoming budget that's proposed between administration, advanced planning, current planning, building and safety, and code enforcement divisions. 
And here are the individuals on our team who work hard day in and day out to serve our community. They've done a lot of great work this past year and um, really have a great team. Here we are together as uh, uh, coming together, not on a screen for the first time. This was the first time we were together, not on a screen in a long time. So it's exciting as we're uh, able to do that again. Um, jumping into the budget, um, we have about 7.5 million um, in our total budget for the fiscal 23 request. The vast majority of that 83% is in personnel. Uh, about 17% is in supplies and services. And um, those supplies and services, the biggest chunk of those are in advanced planning and in building where we've got consultants who help us with some of our work. Let's take a, a quick closer look at our um, uh, revenues and expenditures compared to the past few years. Um, let's look first at revenues. The red lines on the top here are actual numbers. So in 21, we had about 4 million in, in revenues. In 22, this is um, as of Monday. Um, and so that can go up um, and, and it will go up um, before the end of the fiscal year. And depending on when some of those big projects, we've got a few big projects that are about to pull building permits. So those could hit later this year and bump us up pretty substantially. Um, but um, we do expect that with some of the big projects that we have in the pipeline, we are gonna see a bump in revenue um, in this next coming fiscal year. Um, looking at personnel, you can you can see that there has been an increase in personnel costs. And I'll talk, there is um, uh, one additional position that the council has previously approved. Um, and I'll talk to you about those positions in a moment. And you can see here in the services and supplies, um, in fiscal year 22, um, we actually had a bump um, and that was due in part to some grants that um, got funneled into those services and supplies. Um, and you can see in 23, we are, um, uh, back down, but slightly higher than 21. And um, we would, we are planning for um, some additional costs associated with our housing element um, in that 20 fiscal year 23 um, services and supplies budget. Um, as far as budgetary solutions go, the biggest one was one that the council approved um, uh, last month and that was an increase in our, build, our green building fee. That's gonna bring in, that's anticipated to bring in about $170,000 annually in um, additional revenues. And then um, we did also end up having reductions in our um, administrative division in the services category, um, about 44,000. And um, we spread that out to limit the impacts. And I'm happy to talk to you about any of those if you like, but you can see some of the things here um, with um, some of our Tim staff and office equipment and so forth. Um, we, we are reducing our community TV budget, but we do expect that we'll still uh, be, uh, be fine with respect to having plenty to televise the planning commission on uh, at each meeting this coming year. Um, jumping into the personnel changes, I'm going to talk about these first three together um, because they're tied together. And as we move towards more electronic plan review and online services, we need our team to have the technical skills to support our internal customers um, and customers out in the community with these digital services. So the planning community development technician would do just that. They would assist with project intake. They'd um, confirm that the required materials are provided. They're gonna set up projects in Bluebeam and our permit tracking system. And then they'll troubleshoot with customers if they're having difficulty in that process and in, in getting their plans submitted or in accessing the um, online information that we're providing. And so um, we're looking at, at changing the title. We have a code compliance technician right now, and they are um, focused in uh, rental inspection and code compliance. They would still work in that realm, but to provide that flexibility and to provide uh, potential coverage options, we would change that to a planning and community development technician. And then we would add a planning and community development technician that would assist with building and planning and then um, on vacations and so forth and cross-training with, with cross-training, 
those two would be able to cover each other. Um, we would at mid-year delete an administrative assistant too. So the thought is essentially that we would um, have um, a, uh, an essentially an upgrade of um, our positions and admin two would be dropped, a planning community development tech would come in and then we've got the lateral with um, the code compliance tech to planning community development tech. The last thing I wanted to point out on this slide we'd be adding a code compliance supervisor and the um, the council approved the um, senior code compliance officer um, with the sidewalk vending ordinance and in consultation with human resources, that individual would really be supervising both our internal staff and our, uh, our contract staff in um, enforcing the sidewalk vending ordinance. And so, um, we've changed that title to um, code compliance supervisor versus a senior code compliance officer. Um, the next slide here is just, um, I mean, we're, we're gonna go through some of these accomplishments, but I just wanted to point out that with all of these re envisioned Santa Cruz categories, as well as our um, interim strategic plan with infrastructure, downtown support, fiscal sustainability, equity, and so forth, that we really hit on all of these categories. And so I'm gonna jump in to some of these here with some statistics starting off. We're expecting to issue over 1700 building permits this year and um, we're fielding um, over 8,000 calls for um, individuals in our permit center. I wanna flag that one for you because that's actually a reduction. And um, this, this 8,000 calls, that's just to our main admin line. And as we're going into this electronic plan review, a lot of these customers don't have to go through our main line anymore. They're able to, to get these services through our online uh, portals. And so um, that number is down. We're keeping a close eye on that to see how that, to see how that goes. But um, that is an indicator that people are getting directly to the people that they need to get to at first. And they're able to do some of their business without calling in. Um, we expect to have um, nearly 11,000 inspections completed between um, building and um, code and rental. Um, and then our building permit valuation is over 56 million. And again, there could be a substantial bump in that if we end up with, um, if we end up with some of those big projects hitting this year. The um, pipeline housing stats, um, Right now, this is this is from um, preliminary review that's been submitted <clears throat> through um, construction. We have about 813 affordable housing units, 224 of those are supportive housing units, <clears throat> and over 2,300 units in the pipeline. So let's jump into some of the projects that we had substantial milestones in this past fiscal year. 831 Water, I'm going to run through these quickly. You can ask me questions later, but I think you're all familiar with these. Um, 831 water, uh, 55 to 82 affordable units there out of 140. That um, uh, passed uh, through SB 35. A lot of work on the team went through that, um, but no building permits submitted for that. 130 center that has 35 very low income units and uh, over 200 uh, single room occupancy units. That was approved in planning earlier this year. Um, and they just submitted their building permits last week. So we're excited that that project is um, moving forward expeditiously. And uh, PAC South, Bonnie talked about that, 70 affordable units there. Um, uh, we um, processed the coastal permit and um, issued a grading permit. We're ready to issue the planning permit, or excuse me, the uh, building permit for that. <clears throat> Pacific Front Laurel, our building division has been working hard on the um, inspections out there. And you can see that building beginning to take shape that helped um, facilitate the pack south with the land dedication they had there. 350 Ocean, that project was completed completed construction. So all the inspections were done and that has over 60 uh, deed restricted affordable units there. 314 Jesse, 50 affordable units there and a coastal permit was processed this year. Calvary Church, that one has um, 65 affordable units. And that one is uh, nearing building permit issuance as well. And then La Quinta that has 60 rooms in that hotel and that construction was completed. So all the inspections were finished this year. Looking at some additional stats, um, 
so far this year, the multifamily projects, we have um, approved 519 multifamily pro uh, units in um, the planning division, uh, in current planning, and 223 or 43% of those are affordable units. So that's, that's really impressive. And that is a reflection of some of the great work that um, not just um, our team has been doing, but economic development. And, and I have to mention, you know, all those projects on the prior page, um, these are really team efforts between our, not only in our divisions, but public works, economic development, water, fire, police review these plans. A lot of work across the city goes into this. And so it is certainly a team effort. Um, a few initiatives. Um, we implemented some new fees, public safety, child care, and code compliance. We um, made a lot of progress on our electronic permitting. We brought in Bluebeam as a consultant to really kickstart um, the baby steps that we had been taking towards that. And we um, are expecting full implementation of that next year, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, we've got our land use and management, or sorry, our new land use management system. Uh, the vendor selection is underway there. Um, and that's a, a real partnership with information technology group. And then um, we updated our green building fee, as I talked about. Lots of, um, of progress on the uh, policy initiatives. Um, objective standards are going to planning commission next week for the first round. We expect to have those. Uh, we're going to have multiple rounds at the planning commission. And um, then we expect to have those to the council later this summer. We made some substantial progress with our local coastal program that hasn't been um, updated since our new general plan was adopted in 2012. Um, we had a public review draft that was released. We brought that to the coastal commission and um, we are pumping the brakes right now as we were responding to a bunch of the coastal commission comments, but we have made some substantial progress there and um, want to keep that progress going as uh, we address the uh, coastal commission comments. We've got a uh, housing element RFP that went out and uh, we've got some respondents. We're hoping to bring um, uh, that contract to you next month um, and get that process underway. The downtown plan expansion, you'll be seeing that on uh, June 14th with respect to the um, preferred land use alternatives. And then um, the sidewalk vending ordinance, our team was instrumental in the um, enforcement um, components with uh, police and um, code compliance primarily, and then also with the, um, the permitting components um, in conjunction with parks and others. Some of our goals for next year, keeping a lot of those advanced planning things moving, we've got some really big milestones coming up for those. We do want to have full Bluebeam implementation this coming year. We want to, we're bringing on that uh, consultant for our land management system. And um, then we um, are expecting to complete a new building fee study so that we can help uh, better align our fiscal sustainability in that regard. And with that, I'm available for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you for that in-depth presentation. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I will bring it out to um, council members for questions and comments. I see council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for that presentation. And it's great to see that, you know, of the units, the multifamily units have been approved that, you know, 43%, that's a really good achievement. and. Hopefully we can exceed that, you know, each year and, and set goals for ourselves to get more and more um, of that ratio of, of affordable to market rate housing in our community. Um, I had a question about one project in particular, which is the hotel that's being built on Riverside and LeBrant over in the beach flats. And it's kind of where, I mean, that thing's been going for like four years now. Um, and a lot of, you know, um, projects have you know, started and finished, and that thing's just still kind of slowly making its way along. And I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit about kind of what's what that project is and kind of what's why it's been taking so long. Sure. So um, that will be a Marriott hotel, and um, 
that project um, has undergone um, a number of shifts in the general contractor um, and um, they have um, they have finally um, started making some substantial pro progress. I'll tell you that project was under construction um, before I started here um, almost five years ago. And um, it's uh, proceeded in fits and starts, and uh, I'd say more fits um, than starts. Uh, but um, it, I, I, I will say, I, I've asked recently about that, and I will say our team is hopeful that late this summer um, they will be ready to issue a, a certificate of occupancy. Um, and, um, you know, this has been a long process, so I, I, I don't know if other things are going to come up. Other things can come up, um, but that's what we are hoping for, that they will be ready at that point. And um, yes, that, that's a good example of how in our department, sometimes things out of our control will um, actually create um, expenses for us over many, many fiscal years, right? So even in a, a uh, regular uh, project, you know, these big projects will be 18, 24 months of construction. So we might get Pacific Station South this fiscal year, but we'll still be spending that money in fiscal year 24, not next fiscal year, but the fiscal year after that, right? And so there is a lot of carryover and um, that particular project has taken um, a, a particularly long time, but we're hopeful that, that very soon um, we'll um, have that ready to get occupied. And similarly, I'm wondering if you could speak to also uh, where the um, lava here used to be. That sure. Because that, that stalled out during COVID, but then people have been asking, like, there's this giant hole in the ground and what's going on. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for asking about that, Councilmember Cummings. Um, we, um, they did, they did stall out. Um, as you know, um, you know, COVID created um, hardships for uh, a lot of different businesses, and um, that um, was poised to move forward and actually had building permits issued um, back um, just before the pandemic. And um, they have recently um, started that back up. They have um, uh, finished up some of the demo work that they have out there and they are uh, finishing up some of the groundwater testing and sampling so that they can um, proceed with that construction um, and the commencement of the construction of the hotel itself. So we do anticipate that happening, uh, the, the actual construction beginning in the very near future as, as they are ramping up. And um, there, was a, there was a time frame in there where um, it, um, it, it stalled due to the pandemic. Great. I think, um, I think that's all I, have. well, I do have one more question, you know, with inflation going up, um, and the cost of kind of everything going up, that also impacts, you know, workers because of the fact, and you know, our departments, because, um, you know, people are impacted with the cost of everything going up. Has there been any consideration of increasing any fees to account for the increase with inflation? So um, we do want to um, do a new um, building fee study this coming year. We budgeted for that. And um, actually our hope is, and one of the things that we've talked about with other groups, uh, other departments here, is that we make that more comprehensive looking at um, the process that we undergo in public works and in water and in fire and our various development review partners, uh, economic development, how those folks also um, play into that entire um, development review process. And so we're, uh, our plan is to actually partner with those different groups and um, complete a fee study so that we can increase our revenues to, to be closer to cost recovery. We do have, you know, some of our services are not cost recovery. You know, we've got code compliance services, for example, where, you know, if someone um, has a violation, 
uh, someone calls in, they complain, we go out and we work with that owner to fix it. If they do that, then there aren't any fines or anything associated with that. And so those are not going to be cost recovery, but um, we do want to um, get our development review services aligned as much as we can with uh, cost recovery. So that uh, the people that are benefiting from those services are the ones that are paying for the service. Great. That's all my questions. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. That was also one of my questions on the uh, building fee study and what that um, entails and and what that um, what would that cost be? Is that and how often do you do that? So it's it's been some time since we did that. Um, what what it entails is um, essentially we bring in a consultant that does an analysis of our time spent on those activities, the costs uh, that our department has, um, both internal as well as with consultants, and the time that we spend with customers, and then they adjust the costs for building permit applications, um, and um, so both for plan check and for inspection services, they adjust those accordingly to hopefully better align with our, our cost recovery efforts. And there would be a similar process that would uh, happen with public works and others. So, you know, we route our building plans um, to all the different review departments. And then they also have some of their own permits that they do. For example, you know, public works will have an encroachment permit if someone's closing a sidewalk for construction. And so I, I'd like to, and we've talked about doing this, um, talked with Mark and others, uh, the other department heads about doing a, a more comprehensive study. And that's where we anticipate heading um, with this fee study is, is really uh, getting more bang for our buck. What that, you, you asked how much that study costs. Um, I would say that typically if we were just doing building, um, I would estimate that would be somewhere between 30 and 45,000. Um, we could get some economy of scale if we are, um, if we're working with other departments. And so, you know, how much economy of scale, I'm not sure, but um, we've, we've budgeted um, for that in our services and supplies for this year. So we expect okay. uh, that we'll be able to accomplish that with the funding that we have. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Lee. That was a great overview as well. Um, good to see all of the projects that are happening. And um, let's see, I have so some of my questions have been answered, but just following up on the um, fee schedule and the cost recovery, um, it was so I know that we adopted a full cost recovery policy the council did a while back. I, Confess, I can't remember if it was 2018 or 19, somewhere around there. Um, but so I'm really glad to see that this is moving forward in a comprehensive way. The idea of really getting a handle on what um, full cost recovery looks like and where it's possible. Um, and the bar chart was really helpful too, just looking at that in your presentation as you talked about it to show um, how those the kind of revenues can be uneven because they the revenues from permitting come in when permits are pulled, you know, at various points in time. And so it doesn't kind of correspond with the cost of, of you know, running the planning department uh, and doing all of the other functions. So that it was really helpful to just see that and think about that. And I'm wondering if that's um, something that is like, how does, how does that work? I mean, that's, is that a real challenge for you all to, or if, if as you budget, does it kind of just work out that you, get it covered. <laughs> um, so great question. Thank, thank you, Councilmember Brown. Um, yes, it is a challenge. And yes, it works out. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you briefly how it does is, um, you know, one, the revenues that we get go into the general fund, right? So we're anticipating, all right, here is, um, here is the workload that we've got coming up, because we can predict that based on where projects are in the process. And we can say, all right, are we going to need to have more consultants um, this year? And and sometimes we have to come back to the council and say, hey, um, 
we need more consultant budget because we got these big projects that came in and we're sending them to plan check. We don't have the ability to process them in within, the, within the expected timelines. And we've got um, one plan checker right now, plus a green building specialist who works in that realm. Um, and so a lot of our um, applications, a lot of our plan check applications go out to a third party. And depending on what we get in, sometimes sometimes we get surprised, right? A, a, a project will come along and they won't have talked with us at all in advance. And so what we do when we're, when we're predicting our revenues is we, we take all of our known projects and say, when is, when is this gonna come in for building permits to middle? When is it gonna come in for the, and when are they gonna pull their building permits? Um, and it, sometimes that doesn't always uh, align, you know, somebody, something happens and someone doesn't pull their permit, but then somebody else comes along and we say, hey, we knew nothing about this project and they're ready to submit. Um, so um, that's where it somewhat balances out and it, it's kind of an art and a science. We, we do talk with all of the developers to, to kind of project out, um, but then sometimes we do need to make those changes. But you know, the revenues right now are covering the, the costs for some of the projects that paid last year um, because we're still doing those inspections. And so it's kind of a, a carryover from year to year. Um, at one point, we were we were um, carrying over our consultant budgets. We've actually switched that um, because it's it's actually better for accounting purposes, and so that's why you might see um, some additional uh, so a need to increase some of the consultant services. But that helps us really understand like all right, here's how much we're spending each year instead of how much was carried over from last year and how much was carried over from the year before that. Thank you. That's that's helpful. So just a follow up to that uh, in terms of the, the study itself and kind of the, the steps moving forward for council to take action. Do you have a projected timeline for that? I know it's, it sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. One of the things that um, uh, I will tell you I am nervous about just being up front is that um, our land management system is also going to take a lot, a lot, a lot of work from our teams as they're, you know, really pulling apart not only our procedures, but also um, the, um, the how that translates to our tracking system and how we um, uh, log each of those steps and what information we need to track for reports like our budget report and the statistics that we send to the Department of Finance and to Housing and Community Development and so forth. So tons of work there. Fortunately, some of those efforts align well, right? Dissecting the process for that works um, with, uh, for the land management works with dissecting the process for our, um, our uh, fee study. Um, that said, they're both heavy lifts and there are some very independent components. Um, so um, I would say best case scenario, we will have that study um, early, completed early next year. We've got a draft RFP together. Um, I would like to get it done. Um, a lot of cities end up doing that towards the beginning of um, the calendar year so that they try to hit the start of the new fees at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, I'd like to avoid that busy time if possible, but we also need to make sure that we're not overloading our team with um, heavy lifts on the land management system and heavy lifts in the fee realm at the same time. And so we'll know a little bit more about the specific timing when we bring a consultant on board for the land management system and understand that. But I do want to get that um, RFP out in the near future. We need to coordinate with our um, colleagues in the other departments. Um, and so that that could um, create a little bit of a delay, but um, fall, um, I, I'm hoping we would start that. And it usually does take a, a few months of work to, to get it done. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, and then let's see, I was glad to see mention of the local coastal program because I didn't see it in the goals in our binder budget. And um, so I, I was going to ask about that, but I appreciate that you mentioned that. And then my last question is really, and I assume, I'm, I think I'm, I think I know the answer, but I just want to make sure. 
Um, in terms of the upgrade of positions and the dropping of the admin two, in particular, that was a position I see as being dropped. That's not, um, is that an actual person who's working in that position? Is that potentially a layoff or are we looking at somebody moving? So, so we do have a vacant position uh, okay. as an AA2 right now. Okay. Um, and we do need to consider how that recruitment occurs. Um, and, you know, we, we do anticipate that it would be an internal recruitment. I can tell you that. Um, and so um, AA2s across the city um, would have that opportunity to potentially move in. And so even if that position were filled, um, you know, there, there could be some shuffling. But um, that uh, our goal is to not have you know we don't we don't want to impact individuals right in, in terms of layoffs. So um, that's something we'll be working with HR on. And um, I, I am 100% with you on <laughs> where I think you were going <laughs> with that of not not wanting to impact individuals. And if I could just on the LCP, um, the reason why we didn't include that in the goals is because. Um, I can't say that I'm confident that we will bring that we will work with the Coastal Commission this coming year and get that in a position where it is ready for um, council to adopt and for um, the Coastal Commission to certify. We got that to the Coastal Commission um, last year and we got comments from them this year, um, just a couple of months ago, um, and there was a long lag time in that and they wanted some they, they wanted some pretty substantial restructuring of that. So we're off doing that, but just understanding the, the workload um, that we're sending to the Coastal Commission and the delays that we're seeing on some of those, um, uh, I'm not confident that we'll have that done this year. Uh, I would love to say that we do get it done, but we'll have to see um, how that goes. We're, we're working to get it back to the Coastal Commission ASAP. Um, and um, we don't want to bring it forward to the council with a lot of Coastal Commission questions because that just creates more work on the back end. Our preference is to work with the Coastal Commission in advance and hopefully bring something forward that the Coastal Commission will be able to support so that we don't have to come back to the council afterwards, particularly if there are significant changes. It's really helpful as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, it looks like that concludes our questions and comments for this department. Thank you so much, Director Lee Butler. Thank you all. Okay, uh, it looks like now I'll call on Laura Schmidt, Assistant City Manager, to give a presentation on the City Council and City Manager's Office budgets. And then we'll hear from Tony Kandati, city attorney, to give a presentation on the city attorney's office, city attorney office's budget. Thank you, Mayor. Um, actually, the entire presentation is consolidated for everybody that I'll okay. be doing. Great. What I'll cover today with everybody are the services in uh, the city manager's office including all of our subsidiary divisions, as well as um, the city attorney's office, the fiscal year 2022 objective, object, achievements, and that will include the city council as well. And then what we are projecting for our fiscal year 23 budget and the attendant goals that we want to achieve with that budget. So to give you a little bit of background about the services in this space and who delivers them, when you look at the city manager's office and step back, we have the city clerk functions and the we have administrative and council support. We have program and project management and strategy and communications. Drilling that down a little bit, within the city's clerk's division, we are one of the main thoroughfares for the community to access information about the entire um, city and all of our functions. So we have a reception area and a lobby where we triage requests from the community as well as through email and other means how, how to help people basically navigate to the other departments within the city. 
within the clerk's division. They also manage all of our historical records and meet the archiving requirements and any statutory requirements from the state of California or the federal level. And then the, they also coordinate all of our elections. And the other thing that you guys are very aware of and near and dear to your heart is our city clerk's office manages the agenda and the meeting administration for the council. And then they also serve as a subject matter expertise for any staff person who is also acting as a clerk for a commission or a committee. So they help um, coordinate all of that and the use of the chambers and the technology. On the city administration side of it within the city council and administrative services, we do administrative support. We do the human resources functions for the city managers and clerk's office and all of our divisions. Um, contract support, and then all of the support for the council and the mayor. We also develop and help coordinate the city strategy. So as council policy gets determined, we translate that into a strategy. We help facilitate the strategic plan that the council puts together. Usually every other year, that's the cadence that happens there. It may differ depending upon things like COVID and um, fires and, and other things that might intervene in the cadence. We also have a very uh, robust communications function that we've been building out over the last couple of years. And that falls underneath this uh, vertical as well. On the program and project management, this is where there's a variety of work, the general programs and projects, and I'll give examples of that subsequently. Those can change at any given point. So some of our programs are constant and that would be climate action and sustainability and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are constant programs for us and the homelessness response space as well. But there are also programs and projects that will come and go, things like the charter amendment and um, district elections due to the California, California Voting Rights Act challenge that we received. So those things um, will ebb and flow and increase and decrease in any given cycle. One of the questions we get sometimes on the program and project side is when does the city manager's office get involved? Oftentimes we'll get involved if it's a citywide request. So if it impacts all the departments, we would be the logical coordination point for that. The other time that it may happen is if there are three or four departments involved and there's not an intuitive department to lead it, nobody has the um, charter to necessarily lead that, we may end up involved in that sort of program as well, where there's a lot of interdepartmental work to be had and we'll be asked to um, take part in that and help coordinate. We are also usually involved in interagency. So if we're working hand in hand with the county or a joint powers authority or um, another local agency like the city of Capitola or, or Watsonville or Scotts Valley, we'll get involved in that. And then um, sometimes it is council direction and other assignments that come and go and will be asked to step in and help out as well. That program and project set of functions that happens in our office, um, I already talked about a little bit about contract administration, but to, to kind of make that come to life, that includes things like our core programming and any social services grants that there may be out. Uh, uh, our independent police auditor program is an ongoing one and the, the legislative program as well are things that we um, coordinate on an ongoing basis. And all of those have attendant contracts that we help coordinate. On the committee side, there are ongoing standing committees like the Climate Action Task Force, the Commission for the P Prevention of Violence Against Women and the Community Programs Committee that we coordinate. We also help uh, staff the Public Safety Committee and now that we are going to establish a children's fund oversight panel, uh, the city manager's office will be working with Parks and Rec, but we will be coordinating that oversight panel um, and getting that formed and kicked off. On the ad hoc committee side, these come up and council directs on occasion ad hoc work to happen because there's a hot topic going on and we want to have a subset of council um, go off and work on a particular issue and then um, report back into council for recommendations. And um, right now we have a budget and ad hoc revenue committee and we have a charter amendment subcommittee going and then we also have health and all policies. 
the other programs that we are involved in on an ongoing basis are joint powers authorities. So our city manager, Matt, sits on the uh, Santa Cruz Public Libraries Board and the Santa Cruz Regional 911 Board. And I represent, along with a Santa Cruz Police Department represent, representative, um, I sit on the Santa Cruz County Animal Services Board. Other examples of projects that come up, Re-Envision Santa Cruz, our interim recovery plan was a project. California Voters' Rights Act, I already mentioned. The grants management integration and improvement work that we've been doing citywide is another example. And then ballot measures along with finance and other uh, departments within the city. On the climate action and sustainability front, um, our climate action manager is currently coordinating our new climate action plan for 2030. She's coordinating our health and all policies and updates to annual work plans and annual reports of achievements related to those work plans. And then our West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan. You've heard a lot recently about our homelessness response program area. We just delivered in March uh, our first time uh, three year consolidated homelessness response action plan. We also um, from the city manager's office, uh, coordinate regional partnerships and relationships and conversations with our other um, partners in our region related to homelessness response. And then we do citywide regional encampment coordination. And then as needed um, examples of our ordinance development like CSSO, our camping services and standards ordinance and our oversized vehicle ordinance. And then um, any implementation associated with those ordinances or council direction. Looking um, back on fiscal year 22, anticipated and actual achievements for us within our clerk's department. Uh, they've been working uh, hand in hand with our information technology department to deliver the hybrid meeting format. And we were lucky enough to launch that recently and then had to back off of that given the COVID numbers and going on the uptick a little bit. Um, for the fiscal year 22, they will have coordinated approximately 27 regular and special council meetings. And then um, they also coordinate compliance with statements of economic interest that we have to do related to our work as council members or as staff and our purchasing and other uh, economic interest declarations. And um, they have a 98% deadline compliance on that. And then they also manage or will manage about 225 public records requests for the city, and that involves a lot of work. On the council side of it, uh, Groovy Tuesdays. So if y'all have felt like you're making uh, a little bit progress on the duration of our meetings, you have. The blue bar represents the average hours of a regular meeting, and then the lavender bar represents the average hours of total meetings. So that's a little bit less because that includes special meetings and study sessions which tend to be shorter. So you have shaved off about 1.5 hours on average for a council regular meeting. So congratulations on that. The last three fiscal years, um, this is the, the yo-yo effect of council meeting time. So I track from August to April because we don't meet in July and then our presentations are usually in May for council um, budget hearings, and this gives you the up and down of the of the hours of um, per meeting through those months. So as you can see, the trend line here is a little bit lower. You had like an uptick here, and that's probably a study session there, but um, you're kind of hovering around this underneath the 10 to 12 hour mark right now. On this uh, city council and administrative services functions, other achievements for fiscal year 22. Um, the team has managed thousands of email over the course of this fiscal year. We've hosted five citywide employee communications meetings to date, and we plan to do another one by the end of fiscal year 22 at a min minimum. So that'll get us to six. Uh, you've heard every quarter are the many achievements of all the city departments related to re-envision Santa Cruz. And then our quarterly updates that we've delivered around the performance measures as well. 
We also delivered a citywide two-year work plan, and it's a bridge document between re-envision Santa Cruz and the anticipated updated council strategic plan, which will happen at the beginning of calendar year 2023. On the program and project management side, uh, we've coordinated the California Voters Rights Act follow-up for seven districts plus the charter amendment measure for potentially six districts and a directly elected mayor. We've also done polling and facilitation work for the sales tax ballot measure that is on in this June election. We've delivered an updated 2022 legislative program and then helped coordinate along with many city departments the sidewalk vending ordinance and the permitting program. And then we also have developed a citywide grant target list of opportunities for additional revenue sources for the city, which is very critical right now. Additionally, we delivered the three-year homelessness response action plan, and we've coordinated conversations and uh, worked um, directly with the County of Santa Cruz related to the 14 million homelessness funding that we received from the state of California. We've stood up additional sheltering and hygiene um, resources. The list includes um, the ones that you see. In August, the plan is that you will have before you the draft of the 2030 action plan. So that's a little bit outside fiscal year 22, but wanted to put that on your radar. And then for health and all policies, um, we've delivered a two year plus work plan and also a draft of the community well-being indicators as it relates to that program. Looking forward into the fiscal year 23, these are the boxes we hope to tick. We want to deliver an updated three-year strategic plan to you all in the beginning of calendar year 23. We want to have found additional revenue capacity and sources, and that is a combination of the work with the Council Budget and Revenue Ad Hoc Committee, as well as grant um, beating the bushes and any other sources that we can find. Legislative advocacy will be another key point there. We will deliver various achievements within the Homelessness Response Action Plan, as well as the Climate Action 2030 Plan, and the Health and All Policies and Youth and Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Spaces. We'll launch a city branding plan and take the first steps there. Probably that work will continue into fiscal year 2024. And then we will uh, develop specific training for staff leads for advisory bodies. So these are basically when a staff in another department acts as a clerk, as it relates to like the planning commission or the transportation and public works commission. We will also put together emergency response protocols for the clerk's functions. Those are the targets. So that's what we want to achieve. Those are the smattering and examples of all from different functions within the city manager's office. So let's talk about our asks as it relates to our ability to get to those achievements. This is a functional view that I showed earlier of the city manager's office and the lavender boxes represents asks for us as it relates to personnel. So within the clerk's division, that community information function, um, we are asking for a deletion of a vacant position and an add of a vacant of a new position for that vacancy. And that request will help us be able to triage better the um, visits to the lobby, but we'll, it will also bring uh, an additional level of resource for our ability to answer requests and route requests within the community request for service portal. Y'all talked about CRISP yesterday with the information technology department. So we get a lot of requests that are general, and that means that it doesn't fit a specific category of activity within CRISP. So we need somebody to really own that and be that stable presence to be able to route those, those requests and follow up with them with the other departments, as well as if it goes internally to the city manager's office. That request goes in concert with a request over here on the administrative division side where we need additional support for council as well as just the overall administrative functions of RFPs, contracts, invoicing, and um, giving our executive assistant some additional bandwidth there. So um, 
and I'll show you organizationally how that would work. And then on the communications front, we're asking, and you already have approved a half FTE there as a, a community relations specialist to help do community outreach and implement parts of the homeless response action plan. And then we're also asking for additional capacity in the climate sustainability and equity function. We have over the years, um, our manager in this space, she is a division function of one. And it started out very narrowly focused for climate action and sustainability. And over the past couple of years, we've added health and all policies to that. And then now diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there's a lot more work on the plate of that one person division. So we're asking for additional capacity. What does it look like as far as actual position changes? So the community relations specialist that you approved in the last meeting is a half of an full-time equivalent. So it is a half person that we would hire as a community relations specialist. And then the functions that I talked about, a combination of clerk capacity for community information, routing and triage, and um, being able to be that conduit to the rest of the city, as well as council and administrative support. That would be, we have a vacant administrative assistant two position. We are asking to delete the vacant AA2 and replace it with an AA3. Just um, that additional analysis, triage and coordination with the council, the mayor, as well as the community request for service portal. We think it's a better fit as an AA3 than as an AA2. And then finally, I talked about the increased functional scope of this space of climate action and sustainability because we've added things like grants management and um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as health and all policies, being able to give the manager there additional capacity by adding a management analyst to report to her. And between them, they would cover all of those functions that I spoke about and then also coordinate, we believe the grants management function with the roadmap we've established, even as we hire and go out to RFP for additional capacity for grant writing on an ad hoc basis, we still need additional capacity in-house to be able to do this area justice to coordinate it and um, be that across the city integration point for all the departments. And um, it's just too much for one person to handle. So we're asking for a management analyst to cover all of those functions. So those are the personnel changes, giving you an understanding of the city council budget. You guys have about uh, 493,000 in your budget. So 500,000 in your budget, about 25% of that is in your services and supplies, things like um, being able to host the employee party, holiday party, uh, do participate and contribute to the strategic plan efforts when you guys want to do that. And then personnel, you're about 75%. The city manager's office budget is about 3.75 million and that covers uh, the city manager's staff itself. CP, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women has a specific budget. Our independent police auditor budget is here. City clerks, climate action and memberships and dues. On the community programs front, these are the ways that we invest in different programming. Um, we have made a sub shift in the homelessness response space and in order to implement the three year homelessness response action plan, we've got about 80% of our community programs budget goes to sheltering and storage. Um, contractors and other service providers, outside agency par partners like um, Housing Matters and the county, and then our actual personnel is here as well. And then you guys know about our core investment and we have added to core for this fiscal year for the set aside as you directed a few months ago. So that is included in this part of the pie and then other community programs and services where we have contracts with the county to assist us that are 
sometimes related to homelessness response, but not entirely homelessness response, like our um, downtown outreach worker, for instance, is funded in this other community programs and services space. And then our animal shelter JPA participation is in the community program space as well. Our city attorney's office budget is a little bit, almost 1.6 million. Our base services where they provide support of the city council, other um, case analysis and work, it is the major part of the pie at almost 70%. We do have split out code enforcement and litigation related to code enforcement into another section of the pie. And then um, there's a retirement contribution as our city attorney's office. We um, fund part of that contribution for him. And then um, we have other litigation, um, other fees that are not related that they we may need to hire specialists that are not within the city attorney's office. And that's about 2% of the budget. A summary of the changes um, on the council side, we are adding a community co-sponsorship fund um, at council request, we actually stuck that in the community programs budget, though not in the council budget. But um, every year we get ad hoc requests related to waivers of fees and sponsorships or co-sponsorships of events. And it's been very hit and miss and ad hoc. Um, the city manager's office will be working directly with Parks and Rec to implement an actual update to council policy as it relates to co-sponsorship. So we'll bring that back to you in a formal request to adjust council policy. And you'll be able to weigh in on the proposed process and the structure of doing that. At a high level, we are looking at recommending that our community programs committee. Um, so you have three council members on CPC that they be the review branch for the co-sponsorship requests and that um, we do that on a periodic basis and those recommendations would come to the larger council to be able to have you weigh in and approve or adjust them. On the city attorney's office, we made a little bit over 2% of a reduction in the code enforcement and outside council buckets. Um, and we did not touch the base services because those tend to be actually expended in a fiscal year. On the clerk side, we made some changes um, and reductions in training, travel, and administration across various uh, accounts there. And on the climate side, we added 10000 or $20,000, sorry, in uh, to participate in a regional grant service. And we also did a very minor reduction in travel and temp there. For the city manager's office, we reduced the animal shelter participation amount uh, based upon the run rates that have been happening with COVID. The animal shelter um, has actually been very accommodating during COVID and understood the budget constraints that the participating agencies are under. So they their run rate um, actually got reduced. So we have made a, an adjustment to be able to match that. We're still participating at our normal level here, but we're just making the budget structurally lined up with where we are right now with the JPA estimates. And then for our independent police auditor, we're making a reduction there. Um, we have uh, we went out to RFP and have had a new independent police auditor. And based upon the billings that we saw for the previous fiscal year, we made an adjustment and think that's going to be enough to get us through there. And then we've also reduced some on the training travel and administration front. Uh, we created a uh, uh, Interim Finance Director Bobby McGee mentioned yesterday that we worked with finance and they've done a, a lot of, they've been a lot of a, of a help to help us create a homelessness response activity code within our financial system. So we actually, in your budget book, you'll notice 6105, it's a new thing that if you've been here previously, that wasn't there. So we've moved everything over to consolidate homelessness response revenue and expenditures into 6105. And then on the community program side, anything that was purely homelessness response, we've moved over into that homelessness response division. And then we've also put in here um, a set aside 25,000 for co-sponsorships. Um, historically within the council budget, you would set aside 
1500 for Santa Cruz neighbors and open streets for 7000. So that will if you d decide as part of the CPC recommendations to continue this funding, it would net out of the 25,000 that you have set aside for, for this programming. On the climate action front, um, I already mentioned that we added in the climate action budget a 20,000 participation for a grant, a regional grant writer, and that the community foundation is organizing and coordinating on behalf of all the agencies. These are the details as far as um, how it ended up being um, aligned by our different functions. We had a target of 163,000 and we met at, a, at about 188. Um, we did notice after publication that there's an error in the numbers and the police auditor um, and the CPVAW was um, swapped as far as police auditor was supposed to be reduced by 15,000. Um, but it got taken out of CPVAW. So that will be an adjustment that we'll make um, and you'll, the budget book will have to get adjusted when it comes back in June. So um, independent police auditor will be $15,000 less. CPVAW will be $15,000 more. So just wanted to make note of that. But this is the breakdown of how um, the different activities within our uh, department participated in it in uh, our ability to meet the reduction goals. What that translates into potential service impacts, um, we'll have obviously with all the changes for the homelessness response space, we'll have improved capacity to implement our homelessness response action plan. We will be able to fund and fully participate in core as you directed earlier. So the set aside is there and then uh, we will have reduced capacity for the city attorney's office based upon the almost 2% that we cut in the, the two areas there. And that could be further impacted by contract updates. Um, the city attorney's office has not adjusted their rates since um, fiscal year 2015. So um, they are well overdue for some sort of cost of living adjustment. So um, those rates would obviously probably be higher and with a higher rate than the set dollar amounts that we have um, would not go as far. As we figure that information out, we will come back to you if we need to do a budget adjustment. Um, we could either do that off cycle or we could just do it during the mid year. And that usually happens around February. Ongoing professional development, I had mentioned in various buckets, we cut um, the travel and training budgets across almost all of our divisions. That just means um, professional development might take a little bit longer. We might just have to take turns more as staff of who gets to go to something on any given fiscal year. And then um, we've increased the funding for co-sponsorships. So that's something that we definitely heard a desire from the council and the community so um, that will be an improvement in a service level. And then um, if the management analyst is approved, we'll have a better ability to meet all the needs in health and all policies, diversity, equity, and inclusion and the grant space. That is the summary for city manager's office, city clerks, city attorneys, and council and community programs. Thank you. And what questions do you have? Thank you so much, Laura Schmidt. That was- um, I love that you call me Laura Schmidt and not just Laura. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That was, um, thank you for the visuals, very thorough um, overview. Um, there was a lot in there. And um, in conjunction with our budget binder, um, I have a little more clarity. Um, I do want to, um, I have a, a couple questions, but I do want to call out a big thank you for adding the community co-sponsorships um, into the uh, budget. And um, I think that'll be really important. I know this past year and a half, we've had a lot of uh, community requests and kind of the system to address those has not really been there. So I think this will help um, add to our community requests for sponsorships and be able to support some of our very important 
um, community requests going forward. Um, let's see, my question on the police auditor reduction, mm -hmm. is that, I'm trying to understand the reduction is because there's a new police auditor? We had, um, we had originally estimated $65,000 per year for the independent police auditor. And um, it was based upon um, historical run rates. And we also adjusted it based upon the research that we did when we went out to RFP and looking at other agencies um, because we hadn't really updated our budgets in a while. So, um, but we've, we've gotten about a year and a half underneath the belt with our, um, the selected auditor from the RFP process, the request for proposal process. And we, the current run rate is around $40,000. So we reduced okay. the budget to $50,000 to give us some wiggle room, depending upon um, the work that gets done in any given fiscal year. So that's why we made the adjustment. Okay, no reduction in services. No reduction in services, yep. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to pull it out to council members for questions and um, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Laura, for uh, that great presentation. I had a question about the um, the council. I had a question, maybe a comment um, regarding the first is with council support. I'm just curious. So, since I've been on council, there were a number of times where we approved new positions, and the idea was that council would get you know support, whether that's with checking emails and getting back to people. And like each time we approve those positions, we don't see that happen. So I'm just kind of curious, like what would the person's role be and how can we kind of make sure that there's some level of accountability with that? Because I mean, yeah, we're all working full time, obviously. And um, it would be great to have that support, but you know, the fact that a couple of times we've approved positions and then we don't really, you know, I don't feel like I get that support. And, um, in terms of um, assistance with whether it's, well, largely a lot around communication. So I'm just wondering how we can kind of build that in to make sure that it's effective for council members. Um, I think what has happened over the last couple of years um, with the pandemic and the retirement incentive, uh, we've held vacant and that administrative assistant too for almost two years. So um, that has obviously had a big impact. And then we've also had our principal management analysts try to be the kind of sole navigation point for the mayor. And the mayor usually has a lot more duties, public appearances and coordination of schedule work related to that, that office. So all of that has been channeled through the principal management analyst. So with the approach that we're taking for the administrative assistant three request is um, to be able to have that person contribute on the clerk side, have our city clerk coordinate them, but also take some of the administrative routing and support that normally historically has only been the principal management analyst because that person gets pulled into project work, the PMA and all the um, commission and committee um, support as well. So that, that's the general idea is to have that person act as um, pull and give some capacity to the city manager's office, as well as fulfill some of the city clerk's work and then have our city clerk be the coordination point and the person that oversees that and helps maintain that balance because um, the city clerk is very good at that sort of supervisory coordination and logistics piece of it. And then I see our city manager, Matt Huffaker, is on as well. I think Laura Schmidt answered the question well. I would just add that um, we've been fortunate to have some supplemental help from uh, Casey Hamard as well as um, Sarah De Leon mm -hmm. on special projects that have come through at council's request. And, you know, on a daily basis, we're triaging requests for council originated uh, staff items, um, assistance with responding to constituent questions and emails. So the structure that we're standing up is all really intended at building a more robust support structure, uh, council member Cummings. And I'm happy to talk through as well of, you know, what that looks like and how we can best support the council going forward. 
uh, given some of your feedback on uh, past commitments as we as we build to the, the CMO team, but I appreciate the question. Yeah, so I guess, so for clarification, it's not necessarily individual support of individual council members. It's more along the lines of um, some of the support that's needed for, whether it's like subcommittees, obviously the clerk. Um, and and it, I guess one question along those lines though, is there any potential support with uh, public records requests because uh, there are times when we don't get many and then there are times when we are like inundated with those and those can take a long time especially depending on the time frame from when they want information and I think that that can be something that would really benefit and help uh, council members so I'm just wondering how that might be factored in. We could definitely take a look at that. We understand, um, and I think staff feels it too, depending upon the uptick um, at any given point, a, a department or an, a staff person could be triaging just as many, if not more, on um, public records requests. So it is definitely a pain point. Um, I think the challenge that we face, whether it's public records requests or support of individual council members, um, even with the request that we are bringing to you for staffing now, um, it's that supply and demand curve. The, the demand for FTE hours far out, out seeds what we are asking for. So even with the asks that we bring to the table, we are trying to thread that needle of fiscal sustainability um, and being able to hit that demand signal that's out there. So it's a constant struggle for us. And, and we do appreciate the council's patience related to that. And um, we'll do what we can, but it, it is, we know you feel the pain. We're, we're, we're empathetic with it. Um, but we also have, we have a lot of pain ourselves as well. <laughs> so. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Kellen Curry Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Laura Schmidt. <laughs> um, I'm going to be forever Laura Schmidt now, yes, not just Laura. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I didn't have questions. I wanted to thank you for all the work. Um, the city manager's office does so much. You wear so many hats, and it's it's hard to turn it off and turn it on and go into different gears. So I just want to acknowledge and thank you for that. And, and I did want to point out, thank you, Mayor, for um, bringing up the sponsorship. I just, I want to point out that this really is in the effort to support the health and all policies work and support our DEI work. It's often um, communities who uh, don't have access to resources. Um, you know, we work with the AAPI community and um, Black Health Matters initiative. So it's, it's often those community groups that don't have the resources. So it's advancing that. Um, that commitment that we made as a city. So I just wanted to highlight and acknowledge that and, and thank you and the whole team for all your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the, Laura Schmidt, I have to say it too now, uh, for the uh, overview. I mean, that was a lot and, you know, the, the various functions that Kind of fall within the city manager's office. It really is complex. It really is ever changing. Um, and so I, I just appreciate, uh, you know, all you do and how you make that legible to us in this process. Um, and I want, so I'm glad to hear that the, so I see Tony's turned his camera on that the uh, city attorney's budget is going to reflect some changes to their fee schedule because when I heard that, that um, they're, they don't increase their fee, their rates for the city, um, despite, you know, over that amount of time since 2015, seeing considerable inflation, I'm, I'm glad to see that um, they'll hopefully get a little relief there with that. And hopefully we'll have corresponding reduction in uh, legal needs, <laughs> legal representation needs, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath. Um, the question that I have is just, is really, uh, about this, the, the branding item. I mean, I have a couple of other really kind of minor questions, but I'm just wondering if you could talk more about that because, um, I mean, I get conceptually what that means, but I, we haven't really talked about it at the council level. And I, I you know, branding has a certain kind of, 
you know, there's, there's, you know, there, I have a sense of what that means, but like, just for you all, what does that mean? And what does that work look like to develop the city's brand? Um, the, the reason why it says planning and first steps on there is there definitely needs to be a coordinated conversation and our communications manager will do that strategically with the council and the community, as well as the departments to put together that scope and, and the plan before we begin to take the next steps in that space. So I believe fundamentally, if you, if you look, whether it's at our website or at the diversity of, of city graphic presences that you may notice over the course of a council meeting or correspondence from us, um, we don't have a unified uh, message and presence there. And part of that branding is being able to put the identity there of our mission, our vision, and our, our graphical coordinated presence. And, and to know that this is the city of Santa Cruz and recognize that. And then um, I'll also uh, ask Matt to our city manager, Huffaker, to uh, respond as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Laura. Um, just to add to that, it's really, I think the spirit behind it, Councilmember Brown, is to have consistent, compelling, effective branding and communication across all of our functions. Uh, we're a little bit scattered right now. Each, each department has their own way of approaching uh, the way in which they present themselves to the community and to the world. I think the same is true for, um, for citywide image and branding. Had some good conversations with Elizabeth on this front as well of how we can ensure that we continue to capture uh, the wonderfully weird way we are as Santa Cruz um, in the work that we do. Um, and it also bleeds into the work that Bonnie and her team are, are doing around economic development and business attraction. So that's the idea behind it. And of course, we would love to hear the, the council's thoughts uh, as we move into that process. I also think there will be an opportunity to align some of that with the upcoming strategic planning we'll be doing um, in the new year. All right, that's that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Oh, I, and I also wanted to thank you for uh, um, really taking seriously the needs for it with our uh, climate and sustainability manager and that workload. It's something that I've, I think every year I say, <laughs> Tiffany needs somebody if she needs help. And so I'm really glad to see that that's getting built in to the budget this year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings, you have your hand up. Did you have something else to add? Yeah, I, I did have one more thing and it was related to what Council Member Brown just said in the position with um, Tiffany Wise West. And, you know, I think that um, maybe what should be considered is that we in the future potentially create a position that is focused specifically on kind of diversity, equity, inclusion, health and all policies that can work as a single person with the different departments and the various initiatives, um, because that is a field that has, you know, there's a lot of research and work that's gone into that field and there are professionals who specialize in that work. And I think that given that Tiffany's background is in environmental studies and with all the environmental impacts we're gonna be seeing that are facing our community, like that's something that we need somebody specifically focused on understanding how we're gonna address our environmental issues around sea level rise, um, increased or coastal erosion, fires, water, like that's something that somebody should be specifically focused on because it's only getting worse. And if we're really committed to DEI, then we should hire somebody with that background to focus on how we can make sure that we're meeting all the needs around diversity, equity, inclusion, and as it relates to health and all policies um, across all the different departments. So I'm just going to put that out there as a suggestion because, um, you know, health and all policies and DEI knows not what uh, Tiffany's background is in, but I know that if we were able to really have her focusing on environmental issues and having a, somebody who's trained in DEI work to focus on diversity issues that We'll be able to meet the needs um, and reduce workload. Thank you, Council Member um, Cummings. Really appreciate your feedback. Um, the more strategic, fundamental um, view of that function is something that Matt and I have talked about um, turning to next. One of the things we wanted to do this fiscal year was as 
Council Member Brown alluded to um, getting help in this area. On the on the flip side of that, I, I think Tiffany has done an amazing job of stepping up to the plate and and figuring out health and all policies with the council members who sponsored those efforts and really pulling. He is an amazing um, practitioner of pulling in experts in areas if she doesn't have the expertise herself and working effectively with consultants and other subject matter expert professionals and then being able to tee up productively project work and content um, while tapping into those experts. So I wanted to acknowledge that she she has done a, a tremendous job of being able to put together the the fundamental structure of our program in, in these spaces. Yeah. No, absolutely, and no doubt um, about that. I just think about, you know, as we're, con you know, having just gone through one of the, the biggest fires in our county's history, just knowing that we need to be somebody, we should have somebody dedicated to working on those kinds of issues around climate change, climate impacts, that's focused on that. And yeah, Tiffany's great, and she's an amazing person, but I think that we can do both. Um, so just something to consider, and I totally understand, we got to take baby steps, and we don't have all the money in the world. Um, but just wanted to put that out there so that we could start thinking about that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings, both and. <laughs> um, it looks like that concludes our council questions for this presentation. Um, at this point, I will call a 10 minute bio break and we will return at 11.05 and continue Thank you. with the next department. Thank you so much, Laura Schmidt. And we will resume. Is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, so um, we will resume our presentations our budget presentations from each department. I will now call on Bernie Escalante, Chief of Police, to give a presentation on the police department's budget. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Thank you. Not often I say good morning. It's usually an evening session. So thank you for your time. Um, and can everybody see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes. The presentation. Okay. Um, I will get started. Uh, I also have uh, Patricia Dodge, our principal management analyst, operating the slides and, and with us today to answer uh, any other detailed questions you might have, as well as uh, Deputy Chief Garcia and Deputy Chief uh, John Bush. Um, also to assist if, if need be. Uh, next slide. Patricia, are you ready? Mm -hmm. I could also stop her share and run it if you want me to. Okay, why don't we go ahead and do that? I'm assuming she's having some difficulties. Is it not showing up on, on your screen? Uh, no, it is. I'm just, are you ready to move to the next slide? Yeah, it's advancing on my screen, but apparently not on Zoom. Okay, why don't you, uh, Bonnie, if you don't mind. Thank you, Bonnie.
Okay, I think we're good now. Everybody still see it? Okay. All right, so the agenda for uh, for today, we're gonna go in to speak to our police corps services. We'll show our organizational chart. Uh, we'll talk about some 2022 achievements and then present our budget proposal for 2000 fiscal year 2023. Next slide. So core services, um, right now, obviously the biggest chunk of our services is general patrol police services. It also includes uh, three canines uh, and two traffic officers um, and some other auxiliary duties and assignments. But the, the bulk of what we do and are doing now is, is general police patrol. Um, in the future, I, I would like to add some more proactive sort of uh, assignments, but right now with some staffing challenges, we're, we're really kind of down to the general police patrol services. We do have one school resource officer, um, <clears throat> and obviously we have uh, homeless services related to uh, the CSOs that we've been newly added to, to our budget. Um, our record section, again, does a tremendous job uh, processing all the paperwork behind the scenes. Uh, investigations, um, we have a wonderful volunteer program that's probably 30 to 40 people now um, that just does great things in the community. Uh, professional standards uh, works closely with our independent auditor. Um, administration, community relations. Um, property and evidence is really part of investigations. It's where all the processing of our evidence and working closely with the district attorney's office for uh, case preparation. Um, as well as hopefully you've noticed, uh, we've, we've added some uh, community service officers into the downtown and we hope to continue to build on that. Next slide. So our organizational chart here, um, you know, it's, it's really kind of down to the, the bare bones here. Uh, we're really trying to build and um, and so out of the, you, you see over here on the left-hand side with operations, we have three patrol lieutenants. Ideally, we would have four. Um, we have six patrol sergeants. That's the bare minimum we um, can have. We have three shifts on each side of the week. So um, uh, we don't have much room for air there. Um, and then below them, there's, there's a total of six patrol teams. Um, currently staffed, uh, we're working 12 hour schedules due to our staffing challenges um, and, and no real room for replacements there. Over on the right side, um, you got uh, acting deputy chief John Bush that's kind of trying to balance two positions between the deputy chief of administration and uh, also overseeing investigations. Uh, we have two sergeants and I think it's about uh, four detectives in investigations and ideally we have uh, eight positions in that section that we would like to fill uh, or four additional. We should have eight, um, but we have four. Uh, professional standards, community relations and the admin assistants also doing a, a lot of great work behind the scenes for us here. Uh, next slide. So some of our achievements for 2022, um, you know, we, we brought in a, a leadership uh, team building consultant around uh, uh, November of 2022 that's been working with our leadership team ever since um, and has really made a, a tremendous difference for us as an organization and for some individuals in their professional development. Um, obviously we've made a lot of, uh, efforts and, and we've made some positive strides in the area of, of recruitment and, and staffing. Um, we're just waiting for some of those folks to make their way through, you know, the, uh, police academies and, or the field training programs to actually, um, be useful for us out in the field. Uh, we also really focused on, um, you know, trying to diversify our, our staff uh, and our team here um, around really uh, representing our community. So that was also a focused effort for us. 
community engagement, um, you know, we, we thoroughly believe in, in working with our community and building relationships with them. Um, we were super excited to bring back the Citizens Police Academy this year. Um, and we also are kicking off in collaboration with the district attorney's office and the fire department, um, a week long teen academy. Uh, I believe it's scheduled for around mid June. Um, something that both of those is something we had probably about four years ago and, and we, we no longer participated in those, but it was important for me to bring those back. Um, also, we just continue to build on a great volunteer program that does does great work in the community. Um, so those are those are some engagement activities that we're excited about. Uh, as you know, we've been working hard through uh, some legal updates. Uh, AB 481 it was the latest and, and biggest one. Uh, we also continue to work through the Racial Identity and Profiling Act, um, which requires our officers to document uh, basically on almost every stop um, a, a ton of information about the individuals stopped, um, which also adds to their their time um, to, to input the, that data that's required. So that was that was a big project this last year to get that up and running. Uh, we were also able to reinstate some of our traffic officers, um, not only for the needs and, and the wants of the community, but also for internally, our staff really enjoys the opportunities to do something a little different. So that was really um, great for, for us to be able to implement and roll out for our staff and the community as well. Um, and we also were able to apply uh, to, to get this new solar traffic speed sign, which um, is extremely useful and, and uh, helpful in dealing with some of the concerns in our community around speed in, in our neighborhoods. Next slide. So uh, usually one of the top three questions I usually get is around staffing. What does staffing look like for us now? And um, obviously we, we are challenged uh, in staffing right now, I think the, the profession in across the country is challenged. Um, and we continue to try to make proactive efforts in, in increasing our staffing and recruiting. And on top of all of that, we sometimes forget about retention and, and retention slips through the cracks, um, which is really important um, in, in a lot of the challenges that our officers face today. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we are on mandatory overtime 12 hour shifts. Um, and we really have gotten to the point where I have not been able to implement any sort of real proactive or specialized patrols that, that I think ultimately um, would benefit the community to address some of the, the ongoing issues. Um, our current staffing, um, as you see there, we, we, have, we only have six vacancies on paper. Um, proud to say we have 12 in the police academy, seven in the field training program. Uh, we have five that are on uh, light duty, which means uh, the doctors have heard them to come back to work on a limited duty status, um, which is still helpful for us. Uh, and five that are on uh, more of a long-term medical leave um, that we don't anticipate returning anytime soon. Um, so. Having said all that, that really boils down to about 59 people uh, out of the 94 budgeted sworn staff um, that are on duty for us. Um, and you can see the pie chart there and, and you can see that uh, about 37% of our workforce, sworn workforce, um, are, are not useful to us right now. Next slide. So for fiscal year 2023 budget, um, you know, it's a fairly status quo as far as materials and services. Um, really the only increase is any personnel costs based on, you know, negotiations and contracts. Um, and there are no new positions that we are requesting. And um, as requested, we're, we're submitting a status quo budget. Next slide. Just a brief uh, history glimpse here. Uh, back 
to 2019 and and what it looked like. Uh, you you have personnel services, uh, the cost of that, and then supplies and services and other charges in the red. Uh, you could see there has not been a whole lot of change over the last uh, four years, five years. Um, the 2021 dip that you see there was a result of, of concessions that we made uh, as a result of COVID, uh, early retirements and such that, that all of the city departments went through. So um, that's usually, uh, that that's signifies the dip there in 2021. But you can see that uh, really the only increase from 2022 to 2023 is uh, personnel and costs. And as well as the services and supplies, that includes services such as the SART exams, uh, the MDIC interview center for, for child victims, those sort of services are incorporated in that, that we've seen a, a slight increase. Next slide. Uh, so again, a quick uh, historical glimpse back in 2020, um, again, status quo budget, other than we did incorporate the, the team of Rangers into that year, uh, did not, not add any new positions other than the Rangers. Uh, 2021, we made a $1.7 million cut, uh, which resulted in you know, the Ranger program, the prime analyst position, temp positions, uh, the community programs, I think that I talked about related to uh, the Citizens Academies, Teen Academies and such. Um, and then multiple positions that were either frozen uh, or early retirements. And then last year, uh, most of those frozen positions were made available, which I believe is part of what we're dealing with now and trying to catch up uh, a status quo budget this last fiscal year. And we do have one lieutenant's position that remains frozen until early 2023, which was part of uh, the contract negotiations and cuts from 2021. Next slide. So moving forward, uh, 2023 budget, our proposed budget, here's here's the kind of high level breakdown of personnel costs. You know, 80% of our of our budget is is personnel costs. The other 20% is supplies and services, but I would um, we will show you here shortly that it's not entirely discretionary, the whole 20%. A lot of that has to do with Again, um, certain contract agreements like with NETCOM, uh, with the SART exams, MDIC center, um, insurance liability is all incorporated in that 20% as well. So it's a very small um, room for discretionary funds in our budget. Uh, next slide. So here is that kind of a little bit more into the weeds breakdown of of that 20 percent that you just saw uh and you could see how a large large chunk chunk of that uh, 20 percent is is not necessarily uh discretionary funds um such as you know work on our vehicles uh i mean in, in some of this that's not shown here you're talking about like building maintenance really getting into the weeds of, you know, building maintenance, electricity, water, all of those things that we would obviously say would are necessary to run our, run our facility. Um, next slide. So uh, asked to come up with some proposed cuts to meet a 2.5% reduction goal, which is a total of 665,000 for us. Um, you know, here's just some options. Uh, we don't have a lot of options. Um, so unfortunately it does, in order for us to get to that amount of money, um, it does require us to dip into to personnel because that's one of our biggest costs. Um, we currently have a vacant admin assistant two position that we could freeze. Um, we currently have a vacant police officer position and a sergeant position that we could freeze, as well as a property and an evidence specialist position. All four of those positions are currently vacant. Um, and then we could, uh, or we will cut 
we had two grant funded CSO positions that were working for a couple of years on uh, the tobacco grant, um, educating, going around the schools. Um, COVID really put a, uh, a stop to all of that work. Um, and so those positions have been vacant, so we can cut those positions at this point. Um, the other supplies and services, I mentioned earlier the team building consultant that we were working with this year. Um, we, we plan on trying to wrap that up uh, close to the end of the, the end of the fiscal year. Um, although she's been very beneficial to the organization. Um, we do have two independent, attorneys that we've outsourced to help us work through some backlogged um, internal affairs investigations. Um, and they've been a, a tremendous help to get us back to where we'd like to be. So uh, that's another uh, option for us to cut some, some money. And then um, last but not least is the training reduction. Um, I honestly, you know, really worry about any sort of training reduction, but, you know, if necessary, that that was an option as well. Uh, next slide. So here's some of the impacts to those those cuts. Um, the admin assistant and property evidence specialist, you, you know, you're going to see uh, obviously the evidence specialists and their, their ability to keep up with the amount of evidence and processing that's needed. For the prosecution and in, 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 uh, cases that are going on over at the district attorney's office, um, the admin assistant too, you know, it just really uh, bogs us down with um, some of our revenue resources as far as permitting, uh, alarm billing, DUI billing, all of those things uh, kind of get put on hold uh, without the extra extra help. <clears throat> The elimination of specialty units is something that would come when you start cutting personnel. Um, and, and those are just some examples of as far as downtown, uh, the gang task force, traffic enforcement, uh, if it's a narcotics team, if you know, whatever specialty assignment that we feel is, is the greatest need for the community, those things uh, have to be put on hold until I can ensure that our, our response to emergency services on a day-to-day -day basis are, are, are being met. So um, those are some of the risks or, or impacts when you cut, you know, like police officers and sergeants. Um, the reduction to uh, our development, organizational development around the team building consultant, uh, the IA consultants, we have two of them uh, in our training, those, those all come with a risk and an impact to, to our staff. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of demands on, on training uh, for our staff to respond to a variety of situations and scenarios that are very challenging. And when you cut training, that, that's, that's a risky uh, proposition in my opinion. Um, next slide. <clears throat> So for fiscal year 23, uh, you know, priority goal is, is, is staffing. Um, hiring a, a high quality uh, character workforce um, that fits our community uh, and they're hard to find. Um, and, and it's a tough profession to recruit right now. So uh, hiring development or retention is our primary goal. Um, we do that through um, you know, a variety of recruitment strategies. We continue to try to think outside the box, look what other people are doing in the profession to try to expand our options there. Um, we, we obviously try to develop our staff through special training and special assignments uh, throughout their career. And, and then also uh, I'm really big into the health and wellness of our staff um, and taking care of them and their health to, to be able to be well enough to respond to the challenging situations they're asked to deal with. Um, next slide. I think I met my timeline and uh, that's all I have for you today and um, available for any questions. Thank you, Chief Escalante. Um, okay. I was 
just comparing some of that information with our police budget binder. Um, I have a question before I go out to other council members on the training aspect that you had mentioned potential uh, reductions. And I know over the past um, couple years, council member Cummings and I worked with um, Chief Mills and really looking at uh, training and, and um, the anti-bias training, use of force training, um, all of those aspects of training. And we learned all about, um, I think it's post and required post training um, for new incoming um, officers, as well as a required uh, um, every so many years, I think it was every three years, there were um, trainings required for officers. And knowing that we just received um, five new officers and um, my um, question is um, around the training and, and my first thought is around public safety and our officers need to be trained on all levels as new incoming as well as um, seasoned officers and, and regular updated current required trainings. And um, so what does that reduction, potential reduction in training entail when you mention that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's really complex. There's a lot of layers to it, but uh, I think the best way I could describe it is our departments historically has had a training season that runs from uh, roughly uh, October to um, the end of May, um, September-ish, October to the end of May. Um, I think that we have prided ourselves in the amount and in the um, quality of training that we provide our staff that is above and beyond the post-mandated hours. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I think that uh, POST has every year, you know, a mandated of, let's say, 48 hours uh, per officer, and our department usually does, you know, over 100-something hours um, in quality training across the board. Um, so, um, you know, what the cuts really do to us is, uh, you know, that starts getting us down to that minimum requirement required by post uh, that we feel is is the minimum. Um, and it certifies us with post, but it certainly limits our, our development in, in training and, and educating. I, for one, would... Um... Hope that we we don't go that route. Our officers really are supported with the training and the tools they need to really carry out public safety and um, their their jobs. Um, so I'm happy to bring this out to other council member questions at this point. Council member Kalantari Johnson and then Council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief Escalante, for the presentation and the work. Um, I just I had a couple questions. I was curious when when you spoke about you know innovative ways of doing recruitment and outreach. Are we connected to um, the high school CTE programs and and community colleges? And do we go out there as well? I'm sure we are. I thought I would ask. Uh, you know, we're we're not as connected to the high schools. Uh, but I do work with uh, former, um, well, Ginger Charles from Cabrillo, and we've collaborated as an, actually an entire county, and she's very interested in how she can help all of our organizations uh, prepare students in, in, for the profession and, and to be successful in the hiring process. So that is definitely one thing, um, and, and you know, Quite honestly, uh, in the past, we've had a recruiting team 
um, that comes together with creative ideas and, and works closely with the schools. And we've gone to job fairs and such. Some of it just comes down to bandwidth and being able to dedicate the time. But, but I, I do like our um, our relationship with Ginger Charles and, and Ada Cabrillo. Great. Okay. High schools may be another place to connect with, so we can maybe talk offline. Um, the other question I had is, I'm, I'm going back to my community prevention partners days, and I know that we were engaged with that initiative and we did um, responsible beverage services trainings as part of our community engagement efforts and worked with local merchants to decrease um, alcohol sales to minors. Do we still have those types of programs or have that, has that sort of subsided given our um, staffing capacity challenges? We, we currently have an officer that is technically assigned as the alcohol enforcement unit, mm -hmm. uh, unit of one. Uh, and we have one lieutenant that tries to root, to manage uh, alcohol permits, uh, entertainment permits, all of those sort of events, um, and, and, and define them with conditions that hopefully are helpful for our staff when the events are happening. Um, and, and that particular officer at times collaborates with, you know, alcohol, beverage and control. Um, and, uh, but yes, we are very, uh, limited in, in the proactive, uh, educating and or enforcement. I mean, historically, we used to work with establishments, educate them on what to look for on IDs and right. such. Um, quite honestly, it has not happened in a while. Okay, good to know. We'll have to bring in some additional resources for that. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the question because some people don't, I think, realize the, the challenges the alcohol establishments have in our community, especially yeah. downtown on a Friday and Saturday night, and, and then you mix in, you know, a significant college population. Right. Um, it's a lot of work, and it would be nice to be out in front of some of the issues, and quite honestly, we're usually sure. chasing them. Sure. Yeah, we used to do party patrols, too, to implement the social host ordinance. So not that there's a whole lot of parties happening with COVID, but <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and the work. Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Bernie, for the overview. Uh, it was really informative. Um, I have a couple of questions related to the, I think that, well, most everything relates to the capacity questions uh, and, and issues that you, and challenges really that you laid out. Um, with respect to the traffic enforcement team, I'm glad to see that being reinstated. I, um, I know that it's an issue in across the town, but also in particular parts of town. Um, and so I wanted to ask about how, um, you know, how you prioritize where traffic enforcement is happening and how it's happening. Um, I ask um, because while I recognize that this is an issue ar across the city, we get uh, communications from particular neighborhoods, and and I'm thinking about specifically the kind of Grant Street, Emma Line Market area. We and, and those are pretty consistent, and you know, high a significant number relative to other parts of town. I know there have been issues in Seabright. Appreciate the work that's happening there. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask um, how that, you know, it, it, how that gets prioritized or what areas get prioritized, how you um, deploy the traffic enforcement folks or that that element of the work. Yeah, you know, uh, so Lieutenant Mori, uh, Lieutenant West Mori kind of oversees the, the two traffic officers and, and he kind of, you know, goes through. Whether, whether it be, you know, phone messages that get passed his way, whether it's email complaints or, or you know, requests maybe from, from city staff. Um, uh, and I also believe that we get uh, phone calls, you know, not so much on our tip line, but um, through our website, you know, you get a variety of uh, phone numbers. People will call any one of those numbers and leave messages. And so uh, those all go to one lieutenant and then the lieutenant is the one that really starts delving those out as assignments to the to the traffic officers. Uh, and obviously, 
you know, there's other thoughts um, around that as far as will we look at data as far as recent traffic collisions and or, you know, some of the more significant incidents that we have seen uh, those rise to higher to the top. Thanks. Um, I, I, yeah, I hope that, uh, and this is, pro this is also kind of a cross department. So talking with public works as well, but um, you know, people are just asking for traffic calming measures in that, in that particular area. And so I'm, I'm wanting to try to be responsive and figure out what resources we can bring to bear there. Uh, another question I have is about the CSO, um, the, 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 the staffing for of CSOs and, um, you know, as, as, as you showed in one of your slides, the Ranger program was eliminated in, in 2021, um, which I did not support, but um, here we are. I, um, um, and, and the thought at the time was that some of that work would be uh, accomplished through the CSO program and uh, increased number of officers that potentially rangers would move into some of those positions. Um, and so I'm just wondering how what's how that's work how that's happening and how what's working and you know what challenges or opportunities you've seen with that transition. Yeah, so I can think of uh, two rangers uh, that are still with us as police officers. Um, so that, you know, has worked out well. I know, uh, I think at least one of them, uh, applied to be a community service officer, but did not pass the FTO program for that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we currently have two, uh, CSOs. One, unfortunately is out injured, but we have two CSOs that are assigned kind of to open space sort of, uh, work, um, most of it comes down to, you know, encampment sort of issues, but um, they're, you know, out there uh, in those open spaces. Uh, it certainly is not enough with the amount of open space that we have in our, in our community. So, um, you know, we recently uh, got two additional community service officers uh, to assist with the homeless action plan. Um, and so that brings us, I believe, up to a total of 15, and currently uh, we are at 12. So we're getting there. Uh, we have two that are, um, I'm sorry, we have, I believe, five CSOs. Is that correct, John? Five CSOs in the FTO program. Um, so uh, hopefully as we work through getting them trained and getting, getting them out there, that we can certainly use them downtown, uh, down in the beach area for, you know, the significant um, uh, crowds down there during the summer, but as well as, you know, uh, getting people assigned to the open spaces is certainly our goal. That's great. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that. I'm, I worry, as I'm sure everybody does, about fire season. It seems to be year-round now, <laughs> but certainly... Uh, uh, certain times of the year are, are more challenging, and and I, I do worry that that's um, something that <laughs> is going to end up costing quite a bit more in terms, not just monetary, but um, you know, just you know, the for our community. So I'm glad to hear that that's um, you're getting those positions filled, and and hopefully um, have people out there. <laughs> um, thanks. I think that was all of my questions. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Council Member Brown. Okay, um, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, most of my questions were, have been answered, so I'm just going to make a comment, which is that um, I think when, we, when it comes time to make decisions on this, we really need to not cut the um, training of officers from the budget. Um, training is like one of the number one things that people ask for when it comes to public safety that we have well-trained officers in our community. And so I think that um, if there are areas where we're going to try to, you know, save money and not make those cuts, I think that's one of them. And, and also want to acknowledge the cuts that we made for the 2021 budget. Um, of all the departments, I remember back that year, I think PD was one of the departments that took the most cuts. And so I think we need to really make sure that, you know, when speaking about equity and needs for services that we, um, Think about where some of the other cuts can be made so that everybody's doing their fair share to uh, make sure that we can balance our budget. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. And and my my understanding was that there weren't any cuts, but reductions um, proposed, and that you know, even that to me is a concern. So I'm happy to um, talk more, learn more as we get to our June budget. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, welcome. Thank you, and I I apologize if I missed. Um, your response to my question. But I wonder, did you have a chance to touch on some of the mental health liaisons and work that's happening within your organization, within SCPD and the needs? And if that's sort of a factor in not necessarily the budget, but part, potentially in terms of being able to help meet the needs um, for some of our folks who are struggling in that way. And if you did touch on it, totally fine. I will go back and watch and I apologize for being yeah. No, I, I did not. And as you mentioned, it's not necessarily directly related to our budget, but we, you know, we do have the two county mental health liaisons that are funded by the county that work, you know, seven days a week in our organization. Um, yeah, certainly if there was an ability for us to fund um, at least one, if not two more to work in the evening hours, that would be uh, unbelievable. Um, I also know that there's a lot of work being done at the county level including with netcom as far as um, a, a better avenue of addressing some of the mental health calls that we receive that uh, might be able to be intersected at a at more of a mental health level professional level than a law enforcement level so there's a lot going on a lot of great things going on that uh, i think we're going to see hopefully a shift but uh, there definitely is a need to to have mental health liaisons with us you know um, a little more into the evening. Um, so yeah, if, if we had the ability to maybe work with the county and, and co-fund some of that, that would be really okay. nice. Yeah, I, and I know that there's some, you know, work happening within the city, especially around some grant resources and grant writing resources, but I do believe that within the state, there's gonna be a significant amount of money coming into communities for mental health needs and behavioral health needs. And so, um, you know, just keeping an eye on what could be potentially available to us, um, creative or through the county or um, through a, a CBO. I, I definitely think that could definitely support a lot of individuals and probably the officers in that really meaningful way. So anyways, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Mayor? Um, yes. I did want to note that um, in the Homelessness Response Action Plan, the council did approve um, usage of part of the California 14 million toward mental health liaisons. So we will be starting conversations and Larry and Wale um, will be working with the county on the expansion of the mental health liaison work that we do with the county and um, that'll get funded for fiscal year 23 through the Cal state of California funding. Uh, so those conversations have begun to look at what that expansion looks like. We haven't we haven't had a chance to start them at this point, but we do have funding in twenty three to do that, and we, we okay. will reach out to them. And it's on the list. Started. Yeah. It okay. Is on, it Thank is. you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, are there any other council member questions for Chief? Galante or Deputy Chief Bush. Um, okay, I did want to quickly uh, plug a, a community safety meeting that is happening on Tuesday, May 31st, 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Um, here it is at the Civic Auditorium um, and uh, community members can uh, come and participate in, in a, a meeting around community safety and future priorities of our Santa Cruz Police Department. So please register scpdfuture.eventbrite.com. And um, thank you for sharing that. And um, thank you for that presentation and for all of your hard work and to your entire department. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will move on now to our next presentation, our budget presentation. I will call on 
uh, Rob Odie, Fire Chief, to give a presentation on the fire department's budget. So we will continue with our essential public safety departments here. Well, Welcome, thank you. Rob. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. As um, you would expect, Chief Escalante is a tough act to follow. I uh, will give it my best. Um, you guys can all see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. I want to make sure I don't have any technical difficulties. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our department and our budget for fiscal year 23. Um, our agenda, very similar to many of the other agendas that you've seen, but of course, in department overview discussion as to what our core services are, what we've done over the last uh, fiscal year. Um, those achievements, I want to highlight um, some important ones. Um, of course, discuss our proposed budget reductions for fiscal year 23. And uh, within that context, discuss some of our goals that we have uh, moving forward as well. So um, again, um, like many, this is sort of our organizational chart of our department broken up into two divisions, um, primarily fire prevention and our fire operations. The operations, as you drill down a little bit further, um, obviously have our three shifts that are on at 24 hours a day, um, as well as our marine safety um, division down at the beach and uh, training. Um, on paper, we have 69 total full-time employees. We're currently at 67 with, uh, we have one funded firefighter position and then one position that I vacated as the division chief of prevention. Um, 62 total sworn personnel. Of those 24 hour shifts that I talked about, uh, A, B, and C shift, you have 55 line personnel that are on. Um, fire prevention itself, um, while it looks uh, relatively deep in terms of staffing, um, it's basically when fully staffed, uh, an army of three, um, um, and comprised of some temp inspectors that we've added recently, and also some temporary hydrant workers that uh, work in conjunction with the water department in terms of maintaining um, the fire hydrant system within the city and other surrounding areas that the water department serves. In terms of staffing, um, you know, we have also had some challenges similar to PD in recruitment and retention, but more importantly, um, workers comp. Um, we currently have one who's out on a uh, job-related cancer workers' comp claim, um, as well as uh, two other individuals that are currently out on workers' comp. Um, and then, of course, like everybody else, we've been dealing with um, COVID as it, as it rears its ugly head. Um, we try to stay in front of that with a pretty robust daily testing program, and it's been rather successful for us. And then, of course, moving into fire season, we're concerned about you know, our ability to offer up um, you know, protection here locally, and then of course participate in the statewide mutual aid, mutual aid process. Um, and then again, just to touch on the, the Marine Safety Division, again, it looks as though you, know, you have our, our Marine Safety Officer and a Marine Safety Captain that are, that are down there full time. But again, uh, what you don't sort of see from this slide is the fact that there are, you know, especially this time of year, 60 to 70 temporary lifeguards um, that uh, we share again a portion with Parks and Rec for the Junior Guard program. And of course, the rest provide lifeguard services on the Santa Cruz Main Beach and the city of Capitola Beach as well. Um, moving on to, um, you know, again, sort of our description of our department, I think it's important as we move forward in this discussion to, to talk about what we in the fire department refer to as our uh, three pillars. Um, we call them our foundation and our future. And with that, you know, that references personnel, response, and community. Um, for personnel, you know, for us, it's imperative to ensure that our workforce is healthy, engaged, satisfied, and prepared to meet the challenges of this um, challenging job. Um, for response, you know, our mission is to respond as all risk. Um, you name it, we'll respond to it. So as an all-risk organization, our top priority is, you know, is to minimize impacts to our community and improve the quality of life for all those that we come in contact with. And lastly, for that last but not least pillar is the community. And of course, for us, it's imperative to have a strong sense and genuine connection to the community that allows us to excel in our delivery of service. And so I bring those up only because when I'm making a decision or I'm working with my command staff to make decisions, and of course, um, developing our uh, budget plan for the upcoming fiscal year, we really focused on these three um, pillars. 
to help us make decisions that we thought were best, not only for the department, but for the community that we serve. <clears throat> so to talk about some of our core services, um, of course, we have fire operations. That's your day to day. You call 911, the fire engine will come to your house or wherever you happen to be. Fire prevention, uh, marine safety, which is not just our lifeguard program, but also sort of uh, bleeds into operations where we have um, firefighters on the engine that are trained as rescue swimmers. So it's sort of this collaborative effort to respond um, to the marine environment for ocean rescues and cliff rescues, like you can see in this photo uh, just a few months back up in Davenport. Um, of course, we can't do any of this without a training program. Um, it's rather robust, but it is run by one individual, um, and then he is supported by three training captains on each shift, um, as well as the marine safety captain. They sort of help um, in terms of developing and coordinating and delivering that training. Um, and then last but not least is our, um, our Office of Emergency Services that sort of delves into the EOC that we have for any uh, local disasters, as well as some of our grant funding, um, cost recovery with FEMA, um, for a variety of things, whether it's storms, the CZU fire, and or COVID. Um, so to drill down a little bit deeper into each of these core services, fire operations. Last year, um, we responded to um, 8,701 calls for service annually last year. It was uh, you know, significantly higher from the year prior just due to COVID. These calls um, include you know, fires, EMS, medicals, uh, rescues, water rescues, public service. Those can, um, you know, range from a vehicle lockout uh, to someone that's fallen out of bed and they need assistance getting back up. And then, of course, our statewide mutual aid, um, both in county and throughout the state. And so, to put some of those in context, our, our biggest uh, draw in terms of um, calls for service would be um, EMS calls. There are about 56% of our total calls. So, of that 8,000 plus. 4,800 were medical calls, um, 208, 281 were fires. Those are, you know, structure fires, wildland fires, vehicle fires. Um, and in addition, um, we had 62 mutual aid responses. And again, those are within the county, our adjoining counties, and then throughout the state. Another thing that's sort of important to, to note in terms of our call volume, it's not just a number, but when you look at it, and I apologize, I don't have a slide, but um, you know, in the last 10 years, the call volume for us as the city of Santa Cruz Fire Department has increased 30%. You expand to over the last 20 years, which is pretty much the majority of my career, our call volume has increased 48%. Uh, and that's without any sort of significant growth in the fire department staffing or infrastructure. So we are a skeleton crew that does a tremendous job at what we do and meet the need of the community day in and day out. Um, but of course, it is a challenge for us. And so uh, moving forward, we're going to have to be extremely creative as we try and address the needs of the community. Uh, next is our fire prevention division. Um, I have you know, a list of here of the things that we had done over the last year. You know, life safety inspections, we completed 662. Um, might not seem like that big of a number other than to point out that that's an increase of over 380%. Um, primarily due to the grand jury report that came out and, and sort of required us to do more that we were supposed to be doing. And we were able to accomplish that by adding the three temp inspectors that we currently have that really help um, fortify that inspection process for us. Um, in addition to all those inspections that we did, we helped along with ED and doing COVID outdoor expansion inspections. We completed 125 over the last fiscal year. 118 fire investigations. So in addition to doing uh, inspections, um, we have two full-time fire investigators within our division that are doing these investigations when we have fires in the city and in the county. And we've actually responded to some adjoining counties as a task force to assist in fire investigations. Um, for vegetation management, which is obviously important for wildfire resiliency uh, locally here, um, we were able to complete 13 acres um, of treatment, uh, shaded fuel break, uh, about a little over eight acres in Arroyo Seco and almost five acres in De La Viega recently. A lot of that was um, by being awarded a grant um, from the Coastal Conservancy for $100,000, um, which again was extremely helpful. Um, in addition to that veg management, we partner with a variety of neighborhoods. Those include Prospect Heights, 
And the most recent addition would be the Highland Firewise Group. Both are tremendous programs, the great partners with us in terms of preparing not only the, the environment around those neighborhoods, but the residents that live there um, for uh, any sort of emergency that they could face. Um, we also participate heavily in the homeless response and resource coordination. So we'll do inspections at some of the encampments. Obviously, we'll do open space management during high fire danger, i.e. Uh, closing the open spaces based on fire weather concerns. And then, of course, of course, um, with the adoption in 2019 of the uh, Wildland Urban Interface Fire Code, we do a lot of outreach, education, and enforcement with homeowners in terms of um, educating and ensuring that they are fortifying or hardening their home, as we call it. Um, so doing a lot out there. And I think it's also important to note um, you know, um, along with ED and planning, you know, a lot of these inspectors, the two that we have, um, the, the temps don't necessarily participate in this, but we really have had a high profile in inspecting um, those recent development projects that we've uh, referred to previously, 350 Ocean, the La Quinta project. So along with just your life safety, they're doing a lot of the rough inspections of sprinkler systems and other life safety inspections at these facilities. So. A lot's going on for these, these two individuals. Um, for our marine safety, obviously, like I mentioned, Beach Lifeguard Service for Main Beach and Capitola. We also incorporate an on-call marine rescue unit where we'll have um, lifeguards that are on call 24 hours a day to supplement our uh, rescue-based swimmers on the engines for any sort of cliff or ocean rescue in the city or in the county as a whole. Uh, I mentioned the fire engine based rescue swimmers. We have a total of 12 at this point and looking to add more. Uh, we operate four uh, PWC personal watercraft uh, that we use for rescue. Um, we currently have them staged on Cal's Beach. We have one on a floating dock off of the wharf and we have um, some also stored at the, uh, the harbor itself for rapid deployment if needed. And of course, like I mentioned, our lifeguards are uh, providing a services, lifeguard services for the city of Capitola. That was last year and again this year as well. Um, I, I want to point out, I think I mentioned it yesterday in the beach safety presentation that uh, total beach attendance in 2021 was uh, just um, under 860,000 visitors and that's between Capitola and Santa Cruz. Um, from that we were, you know, had 237 water rescues. Um, we also in addition to those had 30 vessel rescues, so sailboats that break their moorings, uh, people in kayaks, those types of things. Um, but along with that, one of our more, most important tasks that we do is that preventative lifeguarding and um, our lifeguard staff made uh, uh, just under 143,000 contacts with the, the tourists and the local community in terms of making sure people are safe and prepared in the ocean environment. Uh, the training the, uh, division, again, that division of one, uh, manages our training needs and requirements for all of our personnel. And that includes live fire training. So we'll put all of our people, both new and seasoned, in live fire training uh, exercises. Uh, currently, that is done up at the Ben Loman Training Center, a partnership we have with Cal Fire. Um, it's, it's critical for us to make sure that we're effective, uh, efficient, and safe. Um, we participate in the regional Santa Cruz County Fire Academy. We're actually um, completing that this week and have a graduation that will occur uh, tomorrow at Santa Cruz Bible Church. Um, that's actually our second uh, regional academy in this fiscal year. Uh, we also did one in-house and from those three training academies, we, we were able to uh, produce nine firefighters that came to the line. Unfortunately, we lost a few uh, through going to other agencies, but again, I think we still came out sort of um, netting uh, more than we lost, which is a good thing. Um, the training division also conducts all of our promotional testing uh, for all of our ranks um, and they co coordinate all the regional training opportunities with a lot of our allied fire agencies, active shooter training with all the county law and fire, as well as EMS and, uh, and AMR and county EMS. Our emergency management, like I, I talked about before, manage our EOC uh, up at NETCOM, up in De La Vega Park. Uh, they, he has, this is Paul Horvath, again, sort of an army of one, if you will, has managed the COVID-19 virtual response EOC with a lot of other city uh, staff that are assisting in the identification uh, of the need and the procurement and management of all the supplies that we have had citywide. 
Um, also responsible for our Community Emergency Response Team, AKA CERT. Um, Paul also does a tremendous amount of work in the Department of helping us identify and apply for grants, and of course, coordinating those grants uh, for vegetation management particularly it is, is high on our list. And um, we just recently have submitted um, just under $500,000 worth of grants um, to a number of different sources to procure funding, both for the, the work of creating shaded fuel breaks, but also getting the heavy equipment, the chippers, the masticators, the skid steers. Um, in addition to that, we also like to use some of that money to provide yard waste dumps, dumpsters for our FireWise partners so that we can sort of help, um, you know, create the environment and invite people to do some home hardening and defensible space at their homes. Um, and then of course, one of Paul's big tasks uh, as of late has been to help train city staff and managing and supporting our EOC activations um, should we have any in the near future. Um, so talking about what we've accomplished in fiscal year 2022, these are not limited to, but include um, the items you see here. Um, again, like I mentioned with Paul's assistance, we successfully oversaw and planned the procurement of supplies and of course the cost recovery for COVID for the entire city. Um, we coordinated our um, insurance service rating submittal for the Santa Cruz Fire Department. Uh, we completed vegetation management, like I mentioned in Arroyo Seco and De La Viega, totaling 13 acres total. We provided statewide mutual aid in 13 large incidents throughout the state and we were reimbursed for the admin time, the equipment, and the personnel to a tune of $987,000. We were also able uh, to, um, with your assistance and approval, order a type one fire engine to replace one that is 21 years old. And as we'll talk about in the CIP process, this is becoming uh, an increasingly um, heavy, bigger challenge, not only for us, but the fire service as a whole. Um, to get on a waiting list and have any sort of fire equipment, whether it's an engine or a ladder truck delivered, um, went from 18 months when we placed this order to now 25 months. And of course, as you can imagine, with supply chain issues and inflation, that cost has increased in the double digits to a tune of, I believe, 12%. So um, that's, um, we're lucky to have gotten this one in here and we're, we're celebrating that process itself. Um, like I mentioned, we completed three Firefighter One Academies, two uh, regional and one internal, and we conducted uh, city EOC uh, training um, in the sections of finance and operations, and we'll continue to do the same next year with a disaster exercise planned for the entire city and all the participants sometime in October. So um, moving on to our proposed budget reductions uh, for this next fiscal year. Um, this is our fire department budget. Um, we sort of included, and, and I think I'm gonna sort of uh, provide an explanation or at least um, some context here. But of course, the majority, like the rest of the departments, um, is tied up in personnel um, with um, supplies and services being just 8%. And then 18% uh, eight, is sort of the revenue that we bring in and that revenue um, includes sort of three major things because again, the fire department is a service provider and doesn't really um, collect a lot. But when we do, um, it totals out to um, a total of uh, 4,571,000. That includes um, 3.2 million for our UCSC contract to provide fire services on the campus, as well as that 987,000 I talked about that we get from the state for providing mutual aid um, throughout. Uh, we also are given 134,000 plus um, for lifeguard services rendered to the city of Capitola. Um, and that this 18% also includes the public safety impact fee. Um, it, at its inception, we saw 10, 20,000, um, but we are predicted with the current development that is going on and, and predicted, uh, we're looking to collect $200,000, which will sort of help plug some of the gaps in terms of our apparatus and equipment needed to, to meet the need of the community. Um, but again, part of what I wanted to talk about is if, if you take away that revenue from the pie chart, um, we really are um, extremely lean in terms of our supplies and services. Uh, it's only 10% and that, that supplies and services is everything from paper clips to chainsaws. Um, and I say that sort of jokingly, but that's it encompasses our recruitment, our promotional process with consultants, 
our safety clothing to outfit all of our personnel, our fees to NETCOM, and of course, a training budget to make sure that we keep everybody prepared. Um, and then of course, 90% of that um, is going to be our personnel. So we are extremely lean. And I will point out that over the last four years, our operating and maintenance budget have really have been pretty well managed and extremely efficient to where we're down to, you know, the average over four, four years is about $14,000 that we have left in reserve. So we're, we're really trying to manage, and I think we're very successful in managing the budget that we are provided. Um, so moving on to the proposed budget reductions that we have put forth today. Um, first and foremost, um, of that two and a half percent, um, we are looking to uh, freeze the division chief position for one year. This position was the position that I vacated um, and uh, curling will remain um, vacated with a savings of $482,000. Um, in addition to that, we want to talk about reducing funds for our marine safety um, equipment. Those That equipment includes everything from lifeguard towers to paddle boards to even our jet skis or PWCs for rescue. Um, we've, we've increased our fleet and got them up to date um, in preparation for this, but that's something that we'll be cutting and of course have to be creative by ways of grants um, or other donations um, um, in the future. Uh, we canceled the purchase of a fire staff vehicle for a total of $30,000. Um, because we have been so historically successful and um, aggressive with our grant allocation, we're looking to reduce our funds for vegetation management by $100,000. And, um, you know, because we do bring in funds from Capitola for providing lifeguard services, we still are at a net loss. And so if we canceled that contract moving forward, uh, we would save $50,000. Now with those, there's of course impacts. And that's sort of what I wanna um, discuss with you today and talk about what this means for, for me uh, as the fire chief and as our, for our department. Um, so of course, if we reduce the funds for veg management, I know it's a, it's a very hot topic and rightfully so. Um, it makes it a challenge for us and our partners at parks and public works and water to uh, maintain you know, over you know, the 1,300 acres of city-owned open space that we have. Um, we, we do a really good job. Again, we cooperate and collaborate with our partners, um, but of course, um, decreasing that funding will be a challenge. Um, it obviously would uh, potentially increase the wildland fire threat to the WUI or the wildland urban interface that is located within the city and our surrounding areas. And of course, would draw down on staff time to identify and apply for and manage the grant funding that we do get. Um, so that's that's um, sort of what's at risk in terms of reducing our veg management budget. For the reduction in marine safety equipment, of course, um, like I talked about, this is things like towers, PWCs, paddle boards, all the tools that these folks use to do such a great job down there. Um, in preparation for this, this reduction, we've tried to bring everything up to date and of course um, have a robust maintenance program to make sure that we take care of those things and get a longer life. Um, in terms of freezing my old position or the division chief position of prevention, um, let's be honest, it's gonna reduce our efficiency and effectiveness in, in our prevention division. Um, we're really gonna have to go down to the must do's which are inspections and fire investigations um, plan checks, uh, those types of things. Um, it's going to be an increased workload upon myself. As someone that was just in that position, I know it intimately. Um, I'm willing to take on um, some of those challenges, um, both as the fire chief and now the de facto fire marshal. Um, but again, I have a, a, a great team there and um, you know, I'm going to be relying on them to assist me in taking on these additional responsibilities. Um, and then with that, it'll again be an increase to the limited staff time that we currently have in prevention for grants to assist with homeless response coordination. And of course, um, we, we have been in the process of developing a five-year wildfire resiliency plan. Um, that's gonna take a lot longer and, and may potentially be tabled. Um, in terms of canceling our star, uh, fire staff vehicle, um, it's, you know, to me, a, you know, somewhat insignificant in the sense that it reduces our liability in, in our staff vehicle fleet may increase a small bump in repair and maintenance costs. But again, just like our lifeguard equipment, we've, we've recently sort of increased um, our pool, so to speak, of staff vehicles. And so I, I think we'll be okay with this one. Um, and then the impact of canceling the capital lifeguard contract, 
Um, again, I, I think it's an important service. Um, it, what it would do is it would, because we're currently um, providing the service to Capitola, but also at the same time shepherding them, uh, the city of Capitola, as well as Central Fire, to possibly um, be able to stand on their own and provide that service either as Capitola, as a city on their own, or have Central Fire provide that since they are in their, their district, so to speak. So we're really trying to teach them and bring them up to um, an operational level to provide that service. Um, but with that, you know, we really are trying to regionalize this approach to marine services, both with the lifeguards and potentially procuring a fire boat. So um, by sort of canceling this contract, there's a cost savings there, but there's also sort of the trickle down in terms of the progress that we've made uh, in, in the area of um, lifeguarding and marine services. Um, despite those cuts, um, our goals still remain uh, very lofty. Um, for 2023, we are looking to, um, you know, extend the acres that we've treated, go from 13 to 20 of um, treat 20 acres, create shaded field breaks in our WUI um, through grant funding. Like I mentioned, we are in the process of applying for somewhere between 400 to $500,000 worth of grant funding for the work and the equipment necessary to do it. We would also like to develop an RFP and identify an implementation strategy for a standards of coverage survey. Um, it's basically, you know, like I mentioned before, we our call volume has gone up significantly in the last 20 plus years, but we haven't grown um, as a department in terms of staffing and infrastructure. I think we need an outside consultant to sort of tell us where we are now, what we need, and then take, put that under the lens of where we're going and what we may need to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the community now and in the future. Uh, we want to identify funding partnership and location for a public tra public safety training center um, like PD uh, training is a huge part of our of our ability to remain effective, efficient, and safe. Uh, we currently only have two training centers in the county, and for us, they're about 16 miles away. There's an outdated facility in Watsonville that we currently use for our academy, um, as well as the uh, Ben Loman Training Center. Again. Uh, not within the city makes it very difficult for us to um, provide support, um, being that they are so far away. Um, and again, they are very old and outdated and are in need of some assistance. So we're really looking at trying to identify funding and partnerships within the county to identify a location and a site and a facility that we can construct there. We want to continue to at least focus on regionalizing lifeguard services between Capitol and Santa Cruz, one of my visions that I've told to the staff down there is what does it look like for us to provide the necessary ocean safety services from Santa Cruz to Capitola and all the pocket coves and beaches in between. Um, and again, we can do that by, you know, creating relationships and fostering um, those relationships with Central Fire, the Harbor District, as well as the city of Capitola. So we'll continue to do that as well. And then last but not least, we wanna conduct um, additional EOC training and um, and also uh, wrap it up with a disaster exercise in the fall to make sure that all city staff, as well as ourselves, are prepared for the next disaster that we may face. And with that, I will wrap up. I apologize if I went over, but I am open to any and all questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Chief Odie. Um, okay. There was a lot in there as well. And um, I have a couple of questions uh, and I see council member Cummings has hand raised. So um, let's start with council questions, uh, council member Cummings and then council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I was just um, wondering, well, thanks for that presentation first and foremost. And I was just wondering, you know, at, with the increase in wildfires over the past, you know, five to 10 years, but, you know, with ongoing increasing wild, wildfires and the um, attention on that at the state level, are there any opportunities for um, funds that could go towards vegetation management or any of these other um, needs? Yeah, so we're, we're working pretty heavily. I mean, uh, this my team, we worked on, you know, applying um, through, uh, Congressman Panetta's office for earmark for for just that for the equipment and the funding. So it's not necessarily a grant. It was more of an earmark, but we're really trying to be proactive and creative in identifying these funding sources. And again, between myself, some admin staff, uh, Paul Harvat in the OES office, 
and my uh, team of two in prevention, we're trying to sort of, um, you know, look for all those sources for grant funding. And of course, I think that's another important piece to the FireWise relationship that we've created. A lot of those folks in Prospect Heights and Highland are, uh, uh, you know, wildly talented and motivated and have really helped support us or help identify um, these grant funding opportunities. And we sort of try and go at them, um, you know, with a team approach. So we're constantly, again, I'm, and I'm open to any sort of, you know, um, suggestions or help from anybody for that matter. Those are all my questions. Thank you. And on that note, I know we just received word that um, the uh, funding in Jimmy Panetta's office, that your mark funding did make his list. And so there was $400,000 um, on that list for wildfire resilience in Santa Cruz to uh, support a five year vegetation management um, program, workforce development, and procurement of heavy equipment. Um, so, fingers crossed. <laughs> Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. Rob, for the presentation, um, just so much there to, that really demonstrates the, the creativity and, and and the innovative ways that you approach uh, really challenging uh, circumstances, and you know how, how you deal with just under being understaffed, um, which even at full staffing seems to be the case, um, and you know so want to want to try to support you in addressing those challenges. Um, I don't have specific questions at the moment, but I did want to say, um, and, and this is not to suggest that, I mean, I think that we should be able to hopefully fund all of the, the needed positions in our departments, and that's true across the city. Um, but with respect to the Marine uh, Services contract, um, Marine Rescue Services contract with Capitola, I know that was kind of, it, it's been ongoing and it it really was uh, an effort that met a critical need for Capitola at the time and um, you know and obviously there's a benefit to us across you know the the ocean doesn't have those jurisdictional boundaries <laughs> um, and so I'm just I mean I I, I um, am very wary of Cutting that now, especially given what you've said about the work of trying to bolster their their own capacity and and trying to do some uh, more regional planning around that. And so I, I guess I, um, I I'd, I'd like to see that funding restored just on the face of it, based on what I've heard. But I would ask if, from your perspective, um, that's something that you feel like, given the uh, progress being made in that direction, that a couple more years or this at least this year would be kind of vital. I, I, I want to make sure that I'm getting that directly there from your perspective. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Councilmember Brown. And as you know, um, the Marine Division is near and dear to my heart. That's where I came up, um, both as a full lifeguard and a, a city lifeguard. I was a rescue shore for, for over a decade. And so it's really important to me. Um, I think to get there, like you mentioned, we have to be creative. And one of those ways is um, I'm really trying to foster those relationships. Um, again, you, you, you may have seen that um, in a little bit of the effort we made with that PSA and trying to bring us all together. We're all doing the same job. Sometimes we're we're um, we're spinning our wheels and not working collaboratively enough. And so I'm really trying to, you know, we in the past we provided lifeguard services to the harbor, um, to Capitola, um, and um, we need to continue to do that because again, I think it's something that's it's it's a necessary service. But it can be expensive, and so I think we're we're all better off and stronger and more effective if we do it together. So I'm going to continue to foster those relationships, and I would agree with you that um, I don't think, and this is you know off the record, if you will, but I don't know if Capitola and Central will be at that level where uh, my staff is working extremely hard to provide them the training, both um, entry level lifeguard to su supervision, to really give them a real life perspective of what it means to run a marine division. Um, we've just been fortunate through, you know, having a, a long history um, with Parks and Rec and now Fire Department running that program that we really, again, feel as though we are the stewards of that program, um, both in the city, but also in the county. 
Um, I know even the challenges that state faces with lifeguarding in their state parks, uh, I think that even makes us more important. So um, I'm committed to continuing um, to foster and develop those relationships and maintain them to really make sure that we have a robust um, shared or maybe regionalized lifeguard service. And so I'm committed to that moving forward for sure. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, Cause of, to Councilmember Brown's question in regards to Capitola, yes. like could they potentially find a way to offset the loss of, you know, the 50,000 uh, to get the service, you know, for, I don't know, is that something that's been discussed as an option? Yeah. And I, I, you know, Matt may want to jump in because he was part of our uh, negotiations with them. There's okay. some, some of those losses, you know, it, it's, it's sort of hard to quantify, but, you know, there's some more operating costs already that we, you know, that we're, that we're doing um, down at the beach. But in terms of the personnel, again, which is such a heavy uh, lift for our department, both on the fire side, but also at the, um, at the beach as well, that that's some of our costs and we've asked them you know, to help supply us with additional supervision, um, you know, funding additional positions for that effort. Um, and it's just difficult for them to get there. Um, but again, I, I think it's more of, for me, it's the educational piece now. As I show, as my staff works with their staff to sort of show them what is required, my hope is that when we reconvene in the fall, that they will have a better understanding of, of what this job entails and how you, and in order to do it appropriately and properly, um, it's not just an insurance policy. You, you really have to be there to be effective, both you know, to affect the rescue, but also educate the public and make those, those contacts. And again, I think by us shepherding them in that direction, it, you know, we may be able to sort of bridge that gap in terms of funding. They'll realize that what is necessary to get there, whether it's on their own or as our partner. Um, but again, I think that's, that's the time it's gonna take um, as we teach them and sort of lead the way and show them the proper way of delivering lifeguard services. And I don't know if Matt wants to comment. I think you covered it well, Chief Odi. I, I would just add that we've been in ongoing dialogue with Capitola of what the future partnership could look like. Um, I think we're all a fan and um, understand the merits of leveraging a shared service model look across our relatively small region. Uh, it's been a good fruitful partnership leading up until this point. Uh, Capitola is at an inflection point trying to determine how best to provide those services in a cost effective way uh, for their organization. Um, and obviously we want to help with that. And uh, there may very well be opportunities in the future for us to re-engage in uh, a shared service model and potentially pulling central into that as well. So those conversations are ongoing and uh, we'll keep the council posted as, as they progress. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Are there any other council member questions? Um, Chief Odie, thank you so much. Um, I think what stood out to me was the increase in the last 10 years. Did you say 30% increase in, in uh, calls or yeah, so without? That's the call volume. So, you know, in the last 10 years, it's a 30% increase. And again, those calls range from those pickup and putbacks I talked about or vehicle lockouts to major medicals and of course fires. Um, and then of course, in 20 years, the our call volume has gone up 48%. Um, so we're always, we're just gonna see an uptick. And not only as the call volume increased, but you know, the types of calls that we go to um, seem to expand. Again, when you talk about all risk, it's everything under the sun. So if someone's pipe bursts in their home, they call the fire department. We come out and we we call it water evacuation. We we have water vacs that will suck up the water, we'll squeegee it out your front door and, and sort of get it ready for, for um, you know, another company to sort of come in and repair everything. But um, to obviously our paramedic services where we are going um, you know, to people's homes and, and, and treating people that are in cardiac arrest or in a car accident and suffering traumatic injuries, um, as well as being a fire department, we respond to fires, so. It's just amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you uh, so much to your entire department. And um, I, I know that we all hope to continue to support this department um, with its goals 
uh, moving forward and the needs, um, certainly our needs as a community have increased. So that we recognize that. Thank you. Council member Brown. Thank you. I just had uh, one other uh, area that I wanted to um, kind of comment on and ask about from your perspective. I, I kind of building off the increase in, in calls for service and the nature of those calls, uh, such a significant number being medical. And um, I, I mean, I see it out in the community when I'm out there in the field myself, um, just walking around. Um, that and I and I get that it must be really incredibly frustrating for you all to have so much of your time taken up with those calls, and um, and I also recognize that there are kind of jurisdictional authority and kind of legal questions and and other rules or, around um, what kind of response is needed, um, but I certainly um, want to at least you know, in wh whatever capacity I can try to be helpful in um, talking about and thinking about how we um, find ways to better address that so that you don't get, I mean, it just feels like it's a big resource, time and resource suck. Um, and there, there have to be <laughs> other ways. And this isn't to suggest that you haven't thought of them or, you know, there, but, but just, it just feels like that's a space where there's work to be done. And um, I wanted to just say, I'm, I'm whatever capacity I can serve and help help with that. I want to do that because it just seems like, especially without having additional um, staffing with the, that increasing number of calls, you're something's got to give um, at, at some point. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just wanted to, it's kind of a comment to question um, if you want to weigh in at all. Otherwise just know that it's a priority for me and I'd like to help. Uh, Council member, thank you for the, the comment and for the, you know, the prioritization of it. Um, I will say it's important to note that um, it's never um, a frustration for us to do any response, whether it's medical, fire, that's what we all signed up for. Um, in reality, it sort of, you know, sort of reaffirms our commitment to the community by way of we, we are here for anything and everything. Um, but to your point with EMS and medical calls, you know, we, we are, again, when I talk about relationships, we're currently working you know, with the county and NETCOM and other fire agencies to sort of um, uh, adjust and, you know, with the times in terms of what we respond to, how we respond to them, what units respond. And so we'll always continue to have that dialogue and make sure that we are sending the right units to the right call at the right time. Um, I think it's important to note as well as, you know, we're looking currently with the state of the AMR, con the AMR ambulance contract um, they're challenged in staffing as well and their ability to respond, which uh, has a negative impact on our on scene times, uh, which then trickles down into our ability to respond to other calls. Um, and so I've got my command staff looking at, um, you know, we were approved by council last year to, to uh, uh, purchase a rescue, a heavy rescue, and it was going to have an air unit on it, but we have decided to pivot based on this need that we've identified um, that instead of having an air unit, it will be transport capable. Um, we'll still have all the rescue components for all of our equipment that's necessary, but we have found that with AMR's inability to respond into the city in a timely fashion, it puts both the community, city workers, and fire department staff at risk if we can't make sure that we have the right resource to take someone to the right facility. So again, I'm very keenly aware of, of those needs, and I'm working with my command staff and other county staff to make sure that we're, we're uh, you know, meeting all the needs as they come up. So. Yeah, I, thank you. I appreciate that. I know there's a lot of layers and a lot going on there, but just again, if there's ways that council members can be supportive if in trying to get movement in certain areas, for example, I'm I won't go into into the weeds on that right now, but um, I you know I'm I'm aware and uh, I know other council members are too. So thank you. I, I appreciate that, council member, and I will definitely be reaching out to each and every one of you when the time comes. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so if that concludes questions, that concludes this presentation. And I want to again thank um, Robert Young, Robert Odie. Thank you so much for the presentation and for being here.
Um, at this point, we will recess for lunch and uh, we will return in uh, 30 minutes. So at one o'clock. We will continue our presentations. Thank you. Is the city clerk ready to resume? I am, thank you. Thank you. All right, at this point, we will resume our meeting for today, our budget hearings. Uh, we've heard from several departments and next I will call on Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works to give a presentation on the Public Works budget. Great, good, good afternoon, Council. Uh, and it's my pleasure to, to present the FY23 um, budget. Started here. So, what I will cover on uh, my presentation is the department overview, our core services, and uh, FY22 achievements, FY23 budget, an overview, as well as uh, reductions and changes. Um, my organization consists of a leadership team of uh, eight individuals with myself. Uh, we have uh, communications in Janice Biscard in communications, Bob Nelson in charge of resource recovery, Ann Hogan in charge of the wastewater system, Filipino Warren in charge of operations. Are uh, we to be, sorry to interrupt. Are we supposed to be able to see something? Oh, uh, that would be helpful, huh? Sorry, my fault. Hold on. Let's go back here. Thank you. Let's share that. Am I able to share that or is that? Hold on. I know you have that beautiful slide in the um, binder. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry, the sharing. Oh, there it is. Okay, got it. Let's do that. Let me. All right. How's that? Yes, thank you. All right. I'm sorry about that. Um. I did want to point out, I have two vacant positions um, that are critical. Our parking services manager is vacant, as well as our transportation uh, manager is currently vacant. And we hope to fill those in the, in the next few months. So Public Works is your largest organization with 264 FTEs. Um, our largest group and the largest division is resource recovery with almost 95 uh, employees. Uh, next, we have a wastewater uh, division at 56 FTEs. Uh, parking is our third largest organization at, at 48 FTEs. And then operations at 34. And engineering at 19 with traffic engineering at six and admin at six, so very lean administration. We'll talk about core services and we'll kind of skip through the each of the divisions. Uh, core service for resource recovery, uh, collection, provides refuse recycling, green waste collection to residents and businesses, provides food scrap collection at commercial kitchens. And we will be expanding this later uh, this summer to every household in the city and provides uh, street sweeping, removing nearly 500 tons of debris last year We'll be piloting a mandatory parking restrictions on street on your street sweep day in critical areas that identified in our storm drain plan. So high debris areas will be targeting those areas first. And then re we respond to illegal dumping and hypodermic needle uh, reports. Uh, in resource recovery at the facility, uh, we process, market, and sell recyclable materials uh, that we've collected. We work with the county to accept household hazardous waste materials. And we divert construction materials from the landfill and repurpose those materials. Uh, and then 
Resource recovery also manages the airspace to ensure the longest life of each landfill cell that we create. And I like to tell this story. When I got here 21 years ago, we had about uh, 15 years left of life in the landfill. And I think our latest assessment now is we still have over 25 years of life based on the management uh, that our staff has done with that airspace. We continue to extract methane from the landfill and produce power, and we reduce the, the release of greenhouse gases by doing that. Under waste reduction, this is our outreach program that promotes reduction of waste to meet the city and state goals and mandates through public, business, and school outreach and education programs and events. We educate about the source reduction, about reuse, recycling, wish cycling, household hazardous waste, composting, and pollution prevention. We also lead policy development for the city through ordinances such as restaurant food, food to go um, packaging. And we provide waste reduction audits for the city's green business certification program. Under wastewater division, our core service uh, collections maintains over 150 miles of underground sewer pipes and 29 lift stations. We replace up to a mile of pipe every year and clean and maintain storm drain networks and provide flood control support, respond to sewer overflows and maintain the leachate collection system at the resource recovery facility, which sends it to the wastewater treatment facility for treatment. Uh, our treatment facility treats wastewater through all natural biological process and treats in excess of 7 million gallons a day. It's a regional facility and about 50% of our customers are outside the city limits. We generate in excess of 70% of our energy used through digester gas and solar, saving customers money uh, as cutting the cost. We're a key partner in the Pure Water Soquel project, uh, important to support county water supplies. And tr treated water is typically used inside the facility for process water and saving potable water. Although during the construction of the Pure Water Soquel project, we are using potable water for a short term, but hope to return to using our treated water. We produce biosolids for reuse in non-food crops, and we educate our customers about their services through outreach and facility tours, which we hope to restart those tours uh, in the coming months. Environmental compliance and lab. The environmental compliance provides inspection, monitoring, and guidance to local businesses on discharges into the sewer system. Issue they issue discharge permits to industrial dischargers and liquid waste haulers. And they work to eliminate violations, but they do have citation and fine uh, ability when it's required. The laboratory provides a wide range of analytical and technical sampling and monitoring of the wastewater treatment process and in support of the city's stormwater, watershed, and landfill programs. It also provides man mandated monitoring of our nearshore bacteria and other indicators of environmental health and provides analytical support to other city departments in the county. Our parking division, parking has uh, three main course services, parking operations, parking programs, and maintenance. Parking operations, we maintain four parking structures and 19 parking surface lots, five fewer than in FY22. Um, 1,900 meters spaces, maintain the parking on the municipal wharf, our bicycle locker program, citywide enforcement, of parking and revenue collection, as well as citation review and collection. We've created parking programs, including residential parking programs, downtown parking permits, validation programs, special events, WARF's local programs, park cards and park mobile, as well as EV parking and charging, which we recently updated. In addition and maintenance, our we do the maintenance in the downtown district, the sidewalk cleaning and garbage service, two sets of public restrooms, pay parking machines, meter maintenance and graffiti removal. Core services for the operations division are streets. 
you know, they're small, but they're a mighty team of 11 positions. Um, they're responsible for sidewalk, curb and gutter, catch basin, insulation and repair, repairing and replacing street lights, managing the vegetation along our sidewalks, roadways, bike lanes, and other areas to enhance transportation and public safety. Vegetation, sediment, debris removal from our streets, creeks, and rivers to maintain flood control. Assist on encampment cleanups and debris removal. Provide critical project coordination logistical support to city projects, including unsheltered populations, response work, repairing, replacing, installing street signs, fencing and guardrails, and producing signage in-house for other city departments and painting, including the street markings, such as curbs, striping in the sidewalks, as well as the critical logistical supports for setups at special events. Our mechanical maintenance team of six, plus one supervisor and account assistant, provide maintenance of the city fleet, including police vehicles, refuse, and heavy equipment, administer city fleet, including vehicle replacement, working to replace vehicles with electric and alternative vehicle, alternative fuel vehicles whenever possible. They also provide 24 hour fueling service. And then our facility team of four provides routine maintenance and repair on 28 city owned facilities, provides 24 hour response for facility emergencies, provides certain janitorial and sanitation services at various facilities and provides safety inspections for all our facilities. And our energy management is an energy project coordinator that leads the city critical energy efficiency programs and retrofit projects, as well as overseeing our solar voltaic operation and applies for funding and rebate opportunities, assisting meeting the city's 2030 climate action plan goals. The new division uh, within public works with this budget is the is the Homeless Field Services Response Team. Um, this is this division will com compose uh, four employees, a supervisor, a lead, and two workers. And it'll work in support of the Homeless Response Manager and Coordinator position to help implement the Homeless Response Action Plan. Obviously, four workers is not gonna solve the homeless response, but we'll work with other city departments and other employees to help um, support this effort. The exact roles and re responsibilities uh, of these positions are rather new and we're still developing them, but um, I'm confident this will be an effective way to kind of focus our effort in homeless response and relieve some of the day-to-day -day activities from other areas of the city and allow people to focus on their core efforts. For services uh, in the engineering division, uh, we design capital projects uh, for both public, uh, for both our utility undergrounding, sanitary sewer and treatment, storm collection, refuse recycling, and city facilities improvement, as well as multimodal transportation and street design. Engineering develops the project concepts and secures the grant funding for the project. We provide review and inspection for development projects. We issue permits for projects such as street opening, utility installation, concrete work, and more. We, we create planning and environmental documents, including CEQA certifications, traffic impact fee studies, area plans, utility and facility plans. And we develop and implement the city's stormwater, wastewater, and refuse plans and programs in compliance with state and federal mandates. Our funding of roads, sewers, storm drains, and refuse projects, engineering manages and administers the utilization of key funding sources, which pay for these repairs and improvements. Um, gas tax, uh, SB1, Measure D, Measure H, all funding pay for street improvement projects and raise, raising the city's payment condition index, trying to reach our goal of 70 out of 100. We're right on the edge there. We're about 67 right now at this point. Measure E provides funding for projects and programs intended to keep our rivers, beaches, and oceans clean. And engineering does an excellent job in seeking grant funding for projects to supplement the city's uh, limited funding resources. 
A capital investment program will be discussed later um, in the presentation um, as a total citywide capital investment program, but engineering develops and implements the city's five-year capital investment plan. Engineering assists other city departments with the implementation of their capital projects. And some examples of two major long-term projects that engineering is working on right now is the rail trail, segment seven, phase two, which is getting ready to uh, break ground, and the Murray Street Bridge seismic retrofit improvement project, which hopefully will probably by the end of the year is when we expect to be able to bid out that project. The city faces a short and long-term unfunded list of capital projects in excess of $360 million, so still a major shortfall. Transportation engineering, design capital improvement projects for the city transportation and parking systems. They respond as citizen requests and hazard notifications to improve our and maintain our city's transportation system. We analyze traffic patterns, issues, solutions, and include, including the traffic signal system. Develop and implement plans for downtown parking and using transportation demand management and other parking analysis to, re to reduce the demand. We also develop and implement citywide active transportation plan to improve pedestrian and bicycle networks. Perform development review and inspection on private development projects as related to transportation and implement it, implements the coastal rail trail by leveraging our local measure D dollars as match the state and federal grant. Transportation planning, they develop and update the active transportation plan allows us to apply for active transportation program grants and helps prioritize fundable pedestrian and bike projects develops local roadway safety plan, used for the Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP grants, as well as prioritized fundable crash reduction projects. Actively se seeks and secures grant funding for transportation improvement projects identified in the ATP and elsewhere. The division currently has an excess of $20 million in grants funded projects scheduled through 2025. So they're very successful going after the the available dollars and they assist with the development of the climate action plan set goals for greenhouse gas and trip reductions and ways to improve our multimodal splits under education and outreach we create and implement several educational outreach programs and supporting support of creating safer streets and encouraging alternative transportation the go santa cruz is one one such program which is signed up in excess of 1,000 individuals and distributed nearly 1,000 free transit passes and accounted for ten, tens of thousands of miles of non-single occupancy driving miles. The division also utilizes Street Smarts program to provide targeted education. It's working on the development of a, the city's Vision Zero implementation plan. And it's working with other municipalities and educational institutions on the almost on the new almost all county wide bike share program the contracts currently in negotiations and we hope to roll that out very soon uh, fund safe routes to school education programs at all santa cruz elementary schools and and about achievements from last year uh, we put these in the order of the re-envision Santa Cruz and under infrastructure. We've implemented administrative requirements for the SB 1383 short-lived climate pollutants or the organics a law that was passed. Uh, we've almost completed the construction of the landfill cell 3B and we're under construction of the source water pump station and tertiary treatment facility and distribution system at the wastewater treatment plant known as Pure Water Sotel, Sotel Project. We've entered into the second phase of the wastewater treatment facility infrastructure study and condition assessment, highlighted what equipment uh, is has a risk and needs to be replaced and then prioritize those for capital improvements. We've completed the construction and currently commissioning the wastewater treatment facility ultraviolet disinfection system. 
and the Riverwalk Lighting Project is under construction. Library Lane sewer and path widening was completed and we're nearing the completion of the Highway 1 and 9 intersection improvements. Under fiscal sustainability, we received grants for two electric refuse trucks and 12 plus EV chargers for public parking areas that have been replaced. The replacement of low gas mileage vehicles with alternative fuel and efficient models, including 10 hybrids for all electric vehicles. And under downtown and business revitalization, we continue to support business with COVID-19 impacts through parking re cost reductions and incremental restoration of the daily rate in lots and garages. And implemented a seawalls mural project, project art in our city garages and lots. Looking at our budget and our expenditures, I think this is a, this chart's really illustrative of how public works is, uh, expenditures are split. And you can see the two major sources of our costs in public works, resource recovery, 25.5 million is 32% of our total expenditures, as well as wastewater, 23.5 million is 29%, both rate-based, um, and then the parking district at $6.2 million is 8%. Also, it's funded by um, parking fees and pay for service. Uh, at mechanical maintenance is an internal service fund at 3.8 million, it's 5%. Uh, parking non district, that would be your general areas outside the downtown, is 3.2 million. And that also covers the cost to issue citations and collect those. That's 4% of our budget. Street maintenance and operations, 3.4 million. That's only 3% of our budget, as well as stormwater at 3%. And then the, all the others are very small at 2%, 1%. If we look at our revenue, very similar um, setup where Wastewater and resource recovery also make up a significant portion, 37% for wastewater and 35% for resource recovery. Uh, general fund is about $4 million, uh, 6%. Our parking district fund is 3.9 million. And then we have gas tax, equipment ops, uh, work parking, and then the stormwater funds and then TIF. In looking at the comparison from last year's expenses and last year's revenue to this year, I think it's it's illustrative to see um, it's fairly similar on the expenditure side. Um, the refuse is a little bit less uh, and wastewater is a little bit more, um, but fairly comparable in a $70 million budget. It's about, about a million dollar difference at that point. Most of it is um, split among the funds, small increments. Revenues is a little bit different to look at. And I, I think the big difference here is our parking revenue is um, down about $3 million and that's all COVID related. So that's, we're hoping to see a comeback, but we have reduced that um, to be more realistic of where we were last year. And um, that was the one fund that really took a hit with uh, the impact on COVID. A net general fund cost, if you look at, again, a comparison from last year to this year, we've reduced our general fund uh, by 200,000, reduced the worth gate expenditure another 14, so about 219,000. But our general fund revenue is also reduced almost a million dollars and that um, again, majority of that was parking revenue and citation revenue. Um, and then, so our net general, net general fund cost is up about 787,000. Our general fund reductions, um, that we were asked to provide, we had a lot of reduced reductions in, in small increments, but the major 
was the eliminating elimination of two service maintenance workers. They were vacant positions, but we eliminated those. That was 174,000. For staffing changes, uh, we are adding a half a position in administra administrative assistant at wastewater fund, uh, replacing uh, the landfill gate attendant with, it was a service maintenance worker, we'll now use it, or a refuse worker, it will now be a, an actual landfill gate attendant and have this the refuse worker back work back at the resource recovery facility. And then we have a half, uh, half FTE in the park is, parking office representative to help with any permit assistance if the OVO, when that gets um, in place, will need assistance to implement that program. And we did reduce our two service maintenance workers um, that were general fund on the, um, from the streets division. We are adding the four positions we talked about, um, senior homeless response worker, homeless response field supervisor, and then uh, two field service workers. Um, notable topics for FY 2023. I, I think the big one for us that how we'll incorporate is the addition of the home field, homeless field services positions. Um, we're working hard to put these together and implement those into our operations group and how that fully integrates. Uh, we have significant capital projects underway, rail trail segment seven phase two, the Murray Street Bridge uh, is close to being bid. The San Lorenzo River Lagoon culvert uh, will start this summer. We're waiting on the two permits and pure, pure water Soquel is currently underway. The food scraps program is rolling out to residents. Uh, we continue our fleet electrification. And then the pilot program for the manda mandated no parking on street sweeping. We're gonna evaluate the pilot and see how effective that is and then hope to roll that out later in the year. And with that, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. I know I covered a lot. I feel like each presentation just gets meatier. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mark Dettel. Uh, appreciate the presentation and truly uh, represents the scope of work across public works department is varied and um, there's a lot that's being done. So uh, thank you for highlighting all of that and breaking it down. Um, I will at this point bring it out to council members for questions and comments. And I will start with council member Golder. Thank you. Um, agree that it was really, you know, interesting hearing all the different um, components of public works. One, it's kind of a slightly technical question. And I just came to me again while we were, we were listening. What streets or what neighborhoods were you going to start that pilot program of the parking? On street sweeping days. Yeah, it's, you know, we were actually going to start with Belker Street before COVID hit. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No problem. We had we had worked with that neighborhood um, mm -hmm. to try that out, and, and and then COVID hit, and so we put that all on the shelf. Um, we're going to go back to them and see if they're still ready to to do that again. I think we had a plan laid out, but we're really going to focus on the areas of uh, identified in our stormwater permit of high debris areas and work there and kind of roll that out. And obviously there'll be outreach to any neighborhood before we start to make sure that um, that they're on board and they understand. Because the, obviously the, the issue is where do you park, right? If you're going to roll that out, how do we do that so that people have a place to park their cars um, in that one to two hours, either in the morning when we get out and do the street sweeping to, to do that. So it may be alternate day street sweeping so that they can park on the other side of the street when we go by, or we're gonna work all those details out. But yeah, that's the challenge. That's interesting, thank you. Thank you, council member Golder. Do other council members have questions for public works budget? Oh. 
Okay. Wow. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, then that uh, concludes this department's budget presentation. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation and the information. And um, if anyone has follow up questions, I know that Mark Dettel will be available to answer those questions. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. So we will now continue with our budget presentations. I will now call on Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation, to give a presentation on Parks and Recreation's budget. All right. And we'll just need, um, yep. we'll need Public Works to um, stop sharing and then we can share our presentation. Great, thanks guys. All right, well, Lindsay's getting that teed up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to present our fiscal year 23 budget. Um, joined by Lindsay Bass here, principal management analyst, um, and waiting in the wings is our park superintendent, Travis Beck, um, and acting recreation superintendent, Isith Ray, uh, is out there as well. All right, Lindsay, let's dive in. All right, so similar to other departments, uh, here's our presentation overview. We'll start with a little bit of background um, and some of our fiscal year 22 achievements. We'll get into our fiscal year 23 budget um, and then talk about some key topics and then what is needed uh, moving into the next fiscal year. All right, next slide. All right, wanted to just start our presentation today, um, again, just sort of grounding um, ourselves in, in the mission of Parks and Recreation. Um, this is really our, our why. why. Why does Parks and Rec exist? Uh, why, do, why do we do the work that we do? And it's really rooted in, in this mission. And this mission is also reflective of not just our national trade uh, agency, the National Recreation and Parks Association, but also the city's health and all policies. Uh, so our mission is providing quality public spaces and experiences that build a healthy community, foster equity, and better the environment. So we'll carry that theme uh, through our presentation today. All right, next slide, please. All right, so there's a lot, uh, a lot to cover uh, as it relates to parks and recreation. It's always difficult, as uh, we saw with Mark Dettel's presentation. How do we cover so much work in a 20-minute period? So. We just wanted to do a, a little bit of a, a parks tour here to start. And so when you think of, or when a, a general uh, member of the public or a visitor thinks of Santa Cruz, what comes to mind? And so we really reflected on this. And so uh, there are things like our tree-lined streets. So here's a photo from Pacific Ave. And Lin yeah, Lindsay, keep rolling through, thank you. Um, our open spaces, our trails, places that we have to get outdoors and recreate. Uh, our beaches, uh, the iconic wharf. Uh, programs uh, like Junior Guards, and then uh, Community Arts and Culture. So Nutcracker here is seen at the Civic Auditorium. So really Santa Cruz is Parks and Recreation, and Parks and Rec is at the heart uh, of both that identity, uh, the sort of brand of Santa Cruz, um, but really uh, why you know people love to visit, love to live uh, and work here as well. All right, so we'll start um, with our org chart. So the Parks and Rec Department uh, has um, 83.5 FTEs. Uh, shown on the screen here are a uh, list of names of all of our supervisors. Uh, these folks cover the Recreation Division, the Administrative Division, um, and our Parks Division. Under each of those names, you see a number of FTEs or full-time equivalent employees uh, who work in each of these functional areas. So I'll go to the next slide, Lindsay. So just wanted to, to give a shout out to, uh, to our people. So all those FTEs, you see uh, the numbers on the previous slide, but here are a few photos of, of the folks who are really the boots on the ground, the folks getting the work done um, out in the field, serving the community, the folks that um, are interacting on a day-to-day -day basis with our community. So just wanna give a shout out uh, to, to all of our folks uh, working out in the field. This next slide here, um, we definitely can't do uh, the work that we do in Parks and Recreation without our partners. 
and volunteers. This is an area that we've able, been able to really scale up in the past year. Um, through the pandemic and COVID, people have wanted to get out and volunteer. So we've seen numbers and volunteerism increase uh, throughout the department. But we've got a lot of formal partnerships as well with groups like Save Our Shores, with the Museum of Natural History, uh, many others. Uh, the, the famous Jane Mio down in the bottom left corner. So just some amazing partners um, and volunteers that we work with to get the work done in Parks and Rec. I want to just highlight a few of our fiscal year 22 uh, achievements, a lot of uh, really amazing achievements in fiscal year 22, but just to call attention to uh, a couple. One, um, wanted to highlight our after school care uh, programming, after school enrichment, partnership with city schools, uh, serving youth and families uh, who needed that extra time, who really needed that program after school and that time after school. So a really amazing program uh, to get that going, especially um, uh, with a focus on Bayview and, and Galt Elementary Schools. Um, one of the other categories here is stewarding our natural resources. So we've made a lot of really concerted investment uh, into just modernizing some of our aging uh, facilities and infrastructure. So investing in new uh, high efficient LED lighting, uh, new boilers, um, uh, solar panels up at the golf course, and a lot more uh, focus on uh, battery powered parks equipment. So if you ever see uh, a gentleman named Mayasha who's working around the city hall campus, uh, you'll notice and be amazed how quiet he is uh, with his battery powered uh, lawn mowers, uh, edgers, leaf blowers, and so forth. So with that, I also wanted to highlight um, our grant um, uh, success over the last year. And Lindsay can advance to the next slide. So over the last year, uh, we've really increased um, our uh, receipt of, of grant funds in a really significant way. So what this reflects um, is about a $1.4 million uh, total in new grants that have come into the department. And we found a bit of a sweet spot with grant applications between the $30,000 and, and about $500,000 range. We've applied for a number of, of larger grants, multi-million dollar grants, but have not seen the level of, of success that we're hopeful for with those just yet. But we've seen a, a lot more success, a lot more effort and attention uh, going toward grant applications over the last year. And so we hope to continue to grow this, but wanted to highlight the success um, over the last year. And so again, before we uh, go to the next slide, um, again, just wanted to reflect on um, these both these accomplishments in fiscal year 22, um, but again, the, the work and scope of operations um, within Parks and Recreation. So we did a bit of a tour. You saw some of our staff, but again, just big picture um, in Parks and Recreation. We're maintaining about 1,700 acres um, of parkland, 170,000 square feet of facilities. Uh, and again, as we uh, talked about with uh, our, our mini parks tour, really a key part of the $1 billion annual uh, tourism industry uh, here in Santa Cruz. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I'll shift it over to Lindsay. Uh, to talk about our budget in more detail. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, so I'll take you guys through the dollars and cents of the FY23 budget. Um, and I'll start with some context, some department context um, for uh, how, how we found ourselves positioned going into the planning for FY23. So um, the past four fiscal years, we've seen um, the department uh, make over $1.5 million in structural reductions. Um, for FY23, we were given a target of three, just over $350,000. Um, when we added in personnel increases, that target um, grew to just over $620,000. Um, that's a sobering amount, um, considering the amount of structural reductions um, already made in past fiscal years. Um, it's really exemplified by the picture on the right. <laughs> in terms of the size of the bread has not changed, but the amount of peanut butter that we have to work with is getting smaller and smaller. Um, so just to, to uh, approach this as thoughtfully as we could, we developed um, key budget principles. And I'll just mention that if we had had to make um, $620,000 and change in strict expenditure reductions this year, it would have been very hard for us to maintain these principles, especially bullets number two and three. 
So it's getting increasingly hard to make reductions that um, do not affect community and council high priorities. Um, it's also getting very hard for us to not impact areas of the department that actually generate revenue for the general fund. Um, so these are just a, a couple of um, complexities uh, in our budget that we wanted to make you aware of. Um, so we didn't have to do that, thankfully, and we appreciate the flexibility extended to us this year to put forward a mix of both structural revenue increases, just over $400,000, um, as well as about $200,000 in structural reductions. I believe there's a $30,000 water reduction here um, that we're counting that was not counted um, in uh, maybe the latest list of reductions you all received. So um, just to note that we did shift that over to the wharf um, to address um, increased trash issues there. Um, but you can see uh, how this folds across the department um, and a more detailed breakdown is given here. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on each of these items. Um, I will talk about a few of them. Um, the first being our reduction to the sister cities budget. So that budget started at 6,500. We brought it down to um, 3,500. So it's a $3,000 reduction. Um, in the past few years, we have made um, significant reductions to other partner budgets um, that help us produce events like the Japanese Cultural Fair, Woody's on the Wharf. Um, so we're, we've seen and have tried to help those groups find creative ways to bridge those gaps. Um, we see that happening, which is encouraging, and we're hoping that this is an opportunity for sister cities to work with their support group as well as the department to find creative ways to, to bridge this gap. Um, the next reductions that I'll talk about are in the, re the recreation area. Um, so these first two are teen and youth temporary budget reductions. Um, these two areas will still run a full complement of programs. However, these reductions mean that we really don't have any margin for anything new. Um, we know this is a dynamic space. We know this is a space that is um, really embraced by council. We would like to be able to engage and partner on new things, um, but we won't have that flexibility moving into FY23. Um, this also takes away any flexibility that we uh, have had in the past for school schedule changes. So say we need an extra week of camp um, because of a change in the school schedule, um, we really won't have that flexibility to add that in. Um, so those are, those are just some considerations um, for you all um, uh, in terms of the impact of these reductions. Um, the next one that I'll talk about is the classes activity guide. Um, this, uh, our activity guide is well known in the community. We send that out three times a year and um, we will try to kind of revamp how we do that in the coming fiscal year to really emphasize online um, as well as do a limited print run that will really leverage our partners. Um, so getting those print copies out to um, our city schools uh, partners as well as um, library branches and other key access partners. Um, again, this is one that, you know, we would love to try to do that um, re-engineering of how we deliver the activity guide and reinvest that money elsewhere in the department, but um, this is a reduction that we're, we're making. Um, uh, the final one that I'll mention is um, the just under $20,000 reduction on the Harvey West pool. Um, and this will make it uh, uh, not feasible to run year round operations at the pool. Um, given the increases in utilities, um, water, electricity, chemicals, um, it is becoming more um, difficult to uh, run on the margin there. This reduction would make that um, increasingly difficult. Um, even with this budget, it is um, a stretch for staff to be able to cover that um, asset. So um, that is one that will have an impact. Knowing that um, it is a priority of the department to pick back up the pool feasibility study, 
um, and uh, move that forward. And what that will do is it will provide options for both investment um, in the facility and um, companion operating models that would allow us to understand how we operate the pool year round in a cost and sustainable manner. Um, so that's kind of the uh, broad overview of um, the reductions that we're putting forward. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, we will have a $16.9 million budget this year. Um, last year we had a $16.3 million budget, um, but with our revenue increases, the net um, impact to um, the city and the general fund will be less this year. So that's a really good thing. Um, so really, really strong revenue recovery. We'll talk more about just how focused the department has been on cost recovery, but um, I'll just cover real quickly a large portion of our budget is in personnel. Um, and we run above the national average for um, parks and recreation agencies in terms of the percentage spent on personnel. Um, we will be making some changes this year. So we'll see some budget neutral changes in um, our administrative division that will increase flexibility and allow us to spread um, our workload a little more effectively and equitably of a, across staff. Um, we are realigning some administrative costs to the wharf. And the big ask here is the addition of the full-time special events coordinator. Um, with uh, the easing of the pandemic, we are seeing a surge in registrations and reservations, basically everything, like requests for events um, across the board. So staff whose workloads um, were uh, less during the pandemic um, are seeing their plate overfloweth. And as a consequence, it's really, really hard for them to absorb this um, at this point. So um, this added capacity would be a huge, huge help to the department. Um, if we turn to the gray piece of the budget, which is our supplies and expenses, capital outlay, just wanna focus on a few big pieces of this puzzle. Um, the first being, uh, we're the city's uh, largest water customer. So um, a water, sewer, and refuse makes up $1.5 million of our budget. We have been able to hold our water budget pretty uh, even over the last five to six years. Um, that's in large part due to conservation efforts we've been um, spearheading at the golf course. So hats off to that team. They've been doing a phenomenal job. Um, However, given what you heard last night in the Water Department's budget presentation, it's going to be increasingly difficult to do that. So we're doubling down on water conservation system-wide um, to try and hold this number in check. Um, but as you heard, uh, those annual increases are projected to be around 10% um, for the coming years. Um, so we're trying to get ahead of that and plan for that, um, but it'll be hard to keep that in check. Um, Sewer and refuse is another area. As we've seen increased use of our parks, beaches, and open spaces, that trash has to get collected, and that means increased cost to our department. It also underscores a really interesting dynamic between our department and enterprise funds. And so as rates go up there, um, so does the need for general fund budget to, co to cover those expenses in our budget. Um, Another big boulder in our budget is um, our professional services. I just want to call out that a big portion of this is spent on tree and vegetation management. Not nearly enough. I'm hearing our park superintendent in my ear, <laughs> but still a good portion of this budget. Um, and another unique quality of um, this line item is the fact that about $350,000 is actually paid out um, with, uh, based on revenue that we take in. Um, so as we take in revenue for sports leagues, we have to pay sports officials. As we take in revenue for classes, a percentage of that goes back to class instructors, um, similarly with operators. And so um, this is a fully cost recovered line item, but um, it is a, a piece that does um, sit within professional services in our budget. And then finally, fleet is um, just under $400,000 of um, uh, our supply and expense budget. And um, just wanted to mention about 25% of the fleet is now leased through Enterprise Fleet Management, a program run by Public Works. Um, the nice thing about that is that it provides us some flexibility moving into the out years to begin to electrify um, our fleet as those options become available. And so we're very keenly focused on um, how we uh, continue to support the city's uh, climate goals. 
So this slide is a lot. Um, I'm going to cover it at a high level, but just want to put that high level budget a little more in context and give you some um, sense of how it sits in relation to the past four adopted budgets for the department. Um, so to focus on revenues first, the green bars, um, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that, um, as I mentioned previously, we're returning to pre-pandemic cost recovery levels, which is awesome. Um, we'll be at 32% projected um, for the coming fiscal year, and that's above um, the national cost recovery average for parks and recreation agencies. Um, and I'll also mention that we tend to overperform on revenues. So this, while it's a high estimate, um, we're being conservative. So we have um, big ambitions um, for the coming year. If we focus on um, expenditures, um, the lower half of this um, right-hand side of the slide, um, I just want to emphasize that, you know, if you look at 2019, we had 87.25 FTE, um, $9.6 million in personnel expenses. Now, fewer personnel are costing us more. Um, so just really emphasizing the increasing personnel costs and also that, you know, that doesn't include some of the positions that we have reduced from our budget. So, you know, we're still operating without a construction specialist. We're operating without part-time positions um, that are, are key for the Civic Auditorium. Further, um, it doesn't incorporate um, uh, how we address the fact that we've got a couple of non-competitive regular staff positions um, in our complement. Our administrative assistant two and recreation supervisor positions were identified in the compensation study being non-competitive. So how we figure that out in the midst of you know, structural budget deficit challenges um, is tough, um, uh, but necessary. Um, turning to supplies and expenses, um, I'll just emphasize that, um, again, in FY19, we were operating with 6.5 million. Um, this year, we're operating, you know, right at 6 million. Um, and we're doing that knowing that inflation is really magnifying the, the impact of having to operate with a smaller supply budget. Um, so uh, that's been the case um, over the last few years. And with inflationary levels right now, it's going to make um, spreading this peanut butter really challenging. Um, so just a little more context for you on the budget. Um, so I've been talking a lot about revenues. <laughs> and the reason we talk a lot about revenues in the Parks and Recreation Department is because um, it feels like uh, one of our only ways um, to address kind of these uh, growing uh, expenditures and make sure that we continue to maintain a cost recovery that basically protects us from any additional reductions. Um, so uh, we know it's difficult to do that, but um, we uh, make our best effort. And one great proof point of that is what we've seen at the golf course. Um, and so I really, really want to emphasize the awesome work that's been done by our operator there. Um, just before the pandemic, they brought in and kind of restructured fees there, brought in dynamic pricing, um, got the restaurant up and running. And so FY21 was the first year we saw full cost recovery there. Um, in ages, we were many years ahead of schedule in the golf course operations plan in doing that. Um, and, you know, we were all kind of worried that that might, you know, might not sustain as the COVID pandemic bump waned. And we're really excited to share that it is sustaining and that as of quarter three, we're still on track to have full cost recovery for this fiscal year, which is great. Um, and that's due in large part to the combined focus and effort of our team working in close partnership with our operators up there. Um, so this is a great example of what we want to replicate um, in other revenue generating areas um, of the department. Um, one big priority for FY23 is the Civic Auditorium. You'll see um, some really wild swings in revenues and expenditures here in the Civics um, data. So they got hit really hard with reductions in FY21 and 22. Um, you'll see their revenues dipped really low in FY21 when they were basically closed. But they have rebounded, and that team is so creative um, and scrappy. <laughs> Supervisor Jesse Bond went out and got a small business administration grant of $300,000 um, to help um, address 
um, a drop in revenues. Um, they also, um, because they were closed the first half of the year, are now using a lot of that saved temporary staff budget in the back half of the year to load up on events and really drive revenues in the second half of the year. Um, so I think when we add in the additional revenue that they bring in through admissions tax on their tickets, they would probably be at 100% right now. Um, so this gets another smiley face from us. We like this, <laughs> it's trending in the right direction. But for the Civic team, it's something they won't be able to, um, to sustain in FY23, um, predominantly because of the um, eliminated staffing positions. And so they'll have to run a very streamlined set of um, events, um, but that's something that we wanna work with you all on. And we really do wanna bring and put together a plan and bring that back to you um, and how we would bring those positions back with event revenue that would help to offset that and really, you know, put them on a cost recovery trajectory um, that, that doesn't impact the general fund and serves as a benefit ultimately. Um, so that's a big focus for us. These are um, some examples of where we're going to be working um, and how we'll want to be engaging with you all on some of these cost recovery journeys. Finally, I'm going to just briefly cover the Children's Fund. It's the first time the Children's Fund has been in our um, budget proposal. We usually take this as an independent item. And I'll just emphasize that in the last several years, the fund has really been critical um, and a critical safety net for vulnerable children and families um, at all age ranges, um, uh, from the early ages to um, elementary to teens. Um, so during the course of, you know, the CVU fires and the pandemic, you know, making sure that there's access to early childhood care, as well as scholarships for our programs um, has really been essential. And we've been hearing that from families that have benefited from um, children's fund resources. Moving forward for FY23, um, we'll plan to um, put forward um, the same type of um, distribution of uh, the FY21 audited um, cannabis business tax um, that is appropriated for the uh, Children's Fund. Um, and we'll uh, recommend that 50% uh, go towards early childhood development as it has been done in the past and 50% to um, prevention and vulnerable youth. Um, so no changes here, just that it's appearing um, in this forum rather than as um, a standalone. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, turn the presentation back over to Director Elliott to bring us home. All right, thank you so much, Lindsay. All right, I know we're a couple minutes over, so I'll uh, move quickly through these final slides here. Our fiscal year 2023 strategic themes, I just wanted to highlight uh, here uh, and bring some context to the budget that we brought uh, forth to the city manager and the city council here is really in line and reflective of our parks master plan. So we get this question from time to time at the parks and recreation commission is how are we implementing the parks master plan? And that really starts through our budget. And so what we've put uh, before the council here um, is really reflective of these different uh, goals and themes that are reflected in our master plan. All right, as we look ahead to fiscal year 23, again, a few key topics. Um, a lot of these are geared toward public safety uh, in parks. We've talked a little bit about the bread as the scope of our work and the peanut butter uh, meeting the resources. And so very grateful uh, that the council uh, and really city is supporting uh, more peanut butter in the, in the realms of homelessness with the Homeless Response Action Plan, sidewalk vending and Senate Bill 946 that we've been working on recently, so very grateful that there's additional uh, resources or peanut butter in those areas, but definitely something to look forward to um, is a broader conversation with the police department, with um, uh, Chief Escalante and his team about public safety and enforcement in parks. So a key theme that we'll look at uh, in this upcoming fiscal year and likely beyond. And then also, as Lindsay alluded to with the Children's Fund, um, focusing on equity and vulnerable youth and families um, implementing the Children's Bill of Rights uh, and Measure A uh, as well. So a few key themes in 23. All right, next slide, please. All right, so what is needed? So we'll continue this analogy to the very end, uh, the, the peanut butter. Uh, those resources are, are what 
uh, are most uh, critically needed. So we've got a lot of bread. We've got a large uh, park system, parks and recreation system uh, in the city, a lot of needs deferred maintenance from a capital improvement standpoint that we'll talk about in just a little bit in our CIP portion of the budget presentations. But what's needed for fiscal year 23, and Lindsay alluded to this a little bit already. So uh, seeking budget approval uh, for the requested personnel changes and additions. Uh, our general fund CIP investment into the parks and rec system, uh, the overall system. Um, and then this continued focus and really the support from the council, the support um, across the city, this, this focus on strategic revenue generation and cost recovery. So if we're talking about the wharf or we're talking about the civic auditorium or, or the golf course, any of these things, how do we work together uh, to be strategic about revenue generation and making sure <clears throat> that we can sustain the world-class amenities that we have throughout our park system. I think with that, I think that ends our presentation. Lindsay, if you can advance to the last slide there and happy to answer any questions uh, that the council may have. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Director Elliott and Lindsay Bass. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for the peanut butter analogy. Uh, <laughs> Um, so much is, is uh, being done in your department, and um, I appreciate the breakdown as well as the information in our uh, budget binder. Um, I know that we have, um, if you could just, uh, I have one question on um, the Reductions, was that a total of 350 that you had um, recommended? Was that the total? No, we put forward a mix of structural revenue increases that okay. were just over $400,000 and then um, about $200,000 in reductions that added up to that target. Okay, got the it. ability, the flexibility to include structural revenues um, was incredibly helpful this year. This would be a very yes. different conversation if that had had to have been just expenditures. Yes, uh, completely. And I really applaud your team for working with limited resources and um, really keeping it, keeping everything moving forward for our community. Um, I'm going to bring it out for questions, uh, and I will start with Council Member Golder. I don't need to go first every time, the gas bag over here, but I just wanted to say thank you to the Parks and Rec Department for all of the collaboration, like in my other role as principal. It's been fabulous at the elementary school, and I just want to express my appreciation and gratitude on behalf of the school um, community here at Santa Cruz City Schools um, and that partnership has been phenomenal and I know we we're planning on ramping up a little more next year and um, I think it's a great way um, you know to reach more of the community uh, and I appreciate that so thank you I, you did you barely touched on it but it really needs a huge shout out because it is a lot of work thank you that's all <laughs> thank you council member brown Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Tony and Lindsay, for the overview. Uh, this is, it's always great to see the amazing, the, the visuals, the photos, and to hear about the, the work that you do and, you know, just how creative and innovative you all get with the very, very limited resources that you have. <clears throat> um, I have one question. I have, well, I have some comments I'd, I'd like to make, and I have one question, which now I'm not remembering, so maybe I'll make my comments first. Oh, um, I know what. So the so um, on the on the goals for this year, uh, I it, it's great. I love everything that I'm seeing, and I'm um, I'm going to put in another plug for Neri Lagoon, um, and I'll talk about it later on the CIP as well. Um, but you know, it's I see it come up in in lots of the presentations. You know, images of near Lagoon. It was used by multiple departments today, um, aside from Parks and Rec. And 
Um, and I know that there's, um, you know, aging infrastructure there as well. And the, you know, the walkways and, and some of that work. And, and so I'm, I'm just hoping that, um, I, I didn't see it as a goal. I'd love to see it as a goal. I know, um, that may be, we may be looking at a year, a couple of years out, um, on that, but, um, just wanted to put in that plug about, uh, about Neri Lagoon. And then I just, I want to make a few comments now while we have a little bit of time to do that. Um, so I, um, I'm going to strongly advocate as we are considering our uh, final budget adoption uh, for no reductions to Parks and Rec this year. I recognize that there's um, needs across all of the departments. And um, so I, I don't really say this lightly, <laughs> um, not just because you have some of the, you know, my favorite programs and, and work that the city does in your department, but um, also because um, we know that as you have, you know, when the really major cuts had to happen in the uh, late 2000s, uh, that your department is really, if I look at the, and I don't have the exact numbers, I was going to look those up and I just, it takes a while to find them, but I can see um, that, you know, personnel wise, Parks and Rec has not recovered um, to even close to the staffing levels that you had before the Great Recession. And um, so I think that, um, you know, given where, where you're at, that um, we ought to be fully funding <laughs> what your, your budget this year. Um, <clears throat> at, and at a minimum, I'd really like to see, and this is um, partly for my colleagues, um, just to be thinking about, um, I wanna say it now, um, I'd really like to see um, at a minimum, the proposed reductions to the youth uh, temporary uh, workers and, and teen uh, temporary program, that's about $35,000, if I got that right, um, be restored. Uh, those are, I mean, that's a critical program. And as you said, Lindsay, it, it, it helps the, um, you know, it helps you all be nimble around um, needs that come up throughout the um, year, it certainly, I, I mean, the way that you all stepped up during COVID to provide, to help provide um, additional uh, resources for, uh, for children and for city workers, <laughs> families, um, it's, you know, it's just your ability to be able to do that is, is so critical. And, and I, I want you to have a little bit of a cushion uh, to be able to do that. I also think it's critical that we provide those opportunities to youth, um, to teens, to, for as, as internships and um, that that um, you know extra help when it's needed. Um, I also want to say a couple of things about the pool right now. Um, uh, Councilmember Watkins and Myers and I, as some of you know, uh, were on a subcommittee for uh, to talk about how to um, how to reopen the pool and. Um, with members of the Parks and Rec Commission. And it, it was a great experience to have those conversations and learn about uh, the both the operational needs, but also the infrastructure needs there. And it became so clear that the pool has really <laughs> reached well beyond its useful life. Um, and so that work to do that feasibility study, which we learned about had been really successful with the Harbor High pool project, um, seems really critical. And I know that's, um, because you have had really limited administrative capacity um, and you all are covering so many things, um, it just feels like having that funding available. Um, and I think it was a 19.5, so about 20K cut for the pool, which wasn't specifically for the feasibility study, but um, I'd like to see that funding restored as well um, and, and not, or not cut this year and to keep the pool open or help with the feasibility study, whatever the, the need, um, my the most need is there. And I really hope that we can consider making an additional contribution to that, uh, should, uh, you know, once the, the final picture on potential new revenues becomes clear. Um, so, and I absolutely support the events coordinator restoration. Thank you. Um, thank you to, uh, folks at the city who are making that happen. Um, so I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of lay those out. Those are real priorities for me. It's, you know, when I look at the numbers of the particular asks I'm gonna make to 
um, put back into the budget. It's a little, it's about $50,000. It's um, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping we can figure out a way to make that happen. And um, really uh, my, my bigger goal is to not cut your budget at all this year. That's what I'd really like to see. So um, I'll leave it there for now. Um, not not really questions, but I, I just want to really appreciate the work you all are doing and um, you know how you deliver for our community and uh, tourists as well. Um, but you know the people who who rely on our services here. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, Tony Lindsay. Just want to thank you all for all the hard work, especially, you know, during the pandemic and now that we're coming out, especially, you know, with everybody wanting to be outside more and being in groups, um, can definitely understand the challenges that you all are facing. And then Tony also want to just um, give you and your team a lot of credit for being able to get the golf course to a point where it's actually, you know, recovering all of its cost. I know when I first got on council, that was a big issue. And, um, and it's just great to see that you all were able to work that out and we're seeing a high demand there. So, you know, um, really being able to demonstrate how we can make the golf course effective at generating revenues. And, um, you know, historically, and to council member Brown's point, I know the parks department has taken a lot of cuts and we haven't seen, um, many of the positions that were cut or many of those cuts restored as we've seen in other departments. And so, um, given, you know, the high demand for parks and services, I think it would make sense that, you know, we try to figure out a way to not cut the parks budget this year. Um, as it was said in that presentation, there's an increasingly high demand for parks and the services they provide. And, um, you know, there's an opportunity for us to, again, like, you know, by supporting them and them demonstrating that they're able to generate revenues, I think it would make sense for us to try to really support them right now as their momentum is building and there's opportunities for, for them to really, um, have programs that actually, you know, recover costs and generate revenue for the community and all the community benefits that come with everybody wanting to be outside. So hope we can, you know, look at that. I know there's departments in the past where um, we haven't made cuts or reductions. And so hopefully we can figure out a way to make it work for the parks department this year. They deserve it. Thank you, council member Cummings. Council member Kalantari Johnson. I'll echo my colleagues um, sentiments. Thank you guys for the presentation and the incredible work. You have um, a lot of bread to cover and, and as you said, not enough peanut butter. So um, whatever we can do to help bring in the peanut butter. I, I mean, I, I don't know how that would work, but if we can um, avoid cuts to your department, I, I would be very much in support of that. And in particular, what what council member Brown brought up around the youth programs and the teen programs. Um, I don't need to say it to you all, but upstream prevention ends up saving us a lot of money um, in the larger societal context, as, as you all know. Um, I did have a comment and a question about the children's fund. It's, it's really, really exciting to see the outcomes the number of people that that served and the outcomes it's produced. Um, trying to find my notes now around it. So, uh, so fiscal year 21 was 211,000 and that's before the 20% of measure A, correct? I just wanted to clarify that. That's great. And then is there a um, estimated projection of what FY22 will bring in? Because at that point, the 20% will have gone in, correct? Correct. So FY22 will be audited. So halfway through FY23, those funds will be available. That will still be at the 12.5% rate. Uh -huh. But once we get all the way through FY23, that'll be a full year at 20%. So that'll be the first point in which we can, um, or we'll see the full effect of measure A. Got it. We don't have an estimate at this point. Is that hard to? We, we have estimated what that amount could be, yeah. um, given present 
yeah. cannabis business tax revenues and somewhere between three to three fifty um, k annually. Right. So that, that's something that we look forward to, and um, I think as Measure A continues to be implemented and the oversight committee gets put in place, mm-hmm. you know, thinking about um, agreed upon outcomes that that fund can help drive um, will will be a focus that and a conversation that we'll definitely want and be encouraged to engage in with um, you and, and other partners in that work. Great. Thank you. Thank you for um, helping shepherd that process. And, and I see my colleague, Vice Mayor Watkins, isn't here, but I do just want to acknowledge her leadership and, and um, bringing this to our, our community and, and generating this source of revenue. Thanks for all your work. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, are there any other questions from council members at this time? Okay. Um, and then, then that concludes this department's presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, I will now call on Bobby McGee, interim finance director, to give a presentation on the capital improvement programs budget. Thank you again, Mayor, and uh, good afternoon, members uh, of the council. Welcome. Thank you. Righty, so um, the next item before you is the capital investment program. Um, This PowerPoint presentation includes uh, a number of different departments as well as I'll provide an overview. So um, I'll just keep sharing my screen and ask the departments to let me know when they're ready to move forward in the in the slides. So on the agenda is the uh, 2023 proposed CIP and then the general fund top CIP projects uh, as listed by department. And then the departments have some individual items that they would like to discuss. So the CIP budget uh, as it stands right now um, includes $123 million. As you can see on this graph here, most of that is in public works and the water department uh, with the remainder of that spread among other departments. The unfunded CIP by department totals about $365 million, as you heard me say yesterday. That includes about 70% in public works, uh, as well as a a very large chunk of uh, known CIP unfunded needs in parks and recreation. And so when we were putting this together, we created a priority list that included uh, several different criteria as we went over this. Um, being fiscal sustainability, uh, the location, the project location, and also the infrastructure. So items such as what condition is the asset currently in, um, project readiness, is it shovel ready, um, uh, and other types of uh, criteria that you can see listed here. So the top recommended CIP projects for this year, um, as I mentioned yesterday, there's $5 million that is programmed into this budget. And these are all of the priority projects that were identified um, as part of this process in working with all of the departments. And so you'll hear a lot more about these as we move on. Okay. And with that, I will uh, ask the Public Works Department if uh, they're ready to start their discussion. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Council Members, Mayor, uh, Nathan Wen. I am the Assistant Director of Public Works slash City Engineer, and I will be presenting the uh, five-year capital investment program. Um, This first slide is to kind of give you an overview uh, of our projects in Public Works, you know, roughly We have over 100 projects uh, that we have in our CIP, um, roughly estimating about $180 million and um, about 60 million of that is grant funded or through uh, accepted through fees. 
Um, many of our projects, um, as you'll see, um, or, or experience are multi-year. Um, we do, we are able to knock out some projects in the current year once we get them, but many of them are long range efforts. And so, uh, do require kind of, uh, again, a long range view of them. The 10 categories that, uh, public works manages are listed right there. Um, gas tax, arterial roads, um, et cetera. Um, so we do have a lot of different funds, uh, as you can imagine, public works, um, oversees and has a lot of different functions within the city. So from, um, you know, managing streets, collections, wastewater, uh, refuse and parking. Uh, the funding sources are also uh, widely distributed. Um, I think, I believe Mark, the director, uh, mentioned some of them earlier. You know, we have our gas tax, SB1s, funds that help our roadway reconstruction, um, traffic impact fees from development uh, uh, projects. Um, of course, there's assistance from the general fund, but then we also have some tax measures there too as well, uh, measure D, um, H, and E as well. Um, some deficiency fees, we also collect um, uh, permit parking fees, um, parking in lieu fees, but parking deficiency fees have actually been uh, converted more of the parking in lieu. And then of course we have our meter collections. Uh, the CIP that um, was a part of the packet and presented to you guys was presented to the Transportation Public Works Commission um, back on March 21st, and uh, they recommended re uh, approving the uh, administrative draft at that time. Thank you in advance it, Bobby. Okay, so um, as far as our capital investment program, uh, this slide essentially highlights some of the most current and significant projects that we have underway. You know, on the left side, you can see there the uh, projects that we have under construction. So uh, storm drain and paving uh, improvements, that's about a $2.5 million project that was recently awarded to Granite Rock. You'll, you'll see the rehabilitation of Chestnut, um, which will include uh, replacing, I think, upwards of 30 curb ramps some pedestrian crossing improvements will be also be associated with that. Um, you know, the, the project was predicated on, you know, some failures that we had uh, because of a shallow storm drain um, system that we have. And so uh, we're using some innovative technique there to do some dual pipes um, for that shallow piping. Um, Mark also mentioned earlier, Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 2. We're very excited. Uh, we made that award uh, just a week ago to Anderson Pacific. It's a about $11 million project and that will extend you know, the rail trail from Bay, California um, around the wastewater treatment plant behind La, La Bronca Park uh, to Pacific Avenue uh, roundabout. Murray Street Bridge has a retrofit project. You know, that's a large project that's um, been on our books for quite some time. You know, it's roughly, I think the latest estimate is going to be closer to $30 million. Uh, That project will come to you guys actually later uh, at the next council meeting. But Again, that is a uh, project, uh, really a requirement our end to uh, upgrade that that bridge, and will include some, you know, increased uh, with bike lanes and a nicer pedestrian facility uh, on that ocean side. Um, next up, we have a parking access revenue control system. Uh, that's the parks upgrade. We've been working on that one for quite some time. I'm excited that we're we're getting closer to doing a site acceptance test for this new parking equipment. Uh, we have it in the Riverfront Garage as well as the SoCal Garage. Uh, if successful, uh, this upcoming month, um, we'll be looking at expanding it to the SoCal garage and out on the wharf. Uh, what's exciting about that too is the backend uh, software, you know, where we're hoping to modernize uh, our permitting system where people can go online to renew their parking permits and kind of expand our capabilities for things like residential parking permits, overnight permits, uh, et cetera. So it's a great project. The resource recovery facility, um, landfill cell 3B, that's a large project. Um, you know, it's a, I think it's close to $5 million and that again, extends the life of our, our landfill. Uh, very exciting to see that one uh, get near to, to completion. The San Lorenzo Riverwalk lighting project, um, that is under construction right now. Um, you've probably seen some of the light poles out there. Um, the poles gotten finished in San Lorenzo Park, which we're excited. Uh, there has been a supply chain issue, and so um, we are waiting. I think it's going to be, we're looking at July now as far as a completion date for the Riverwalk lighting. Again, that's between um, Water Street and Highway 1 along the Riverwalk, both on the east and west side. The San Lorenzo River Culvert Project, again, another great, exciting project that we're all looking forward to. Um, that's roughly the $2.5, uh, $3 million project. Um, we are expecting to start on July 5th. Um, with completion in October. Um, it is contingent on receiving a couple of grants and most importantly, uh, one from the Army Corps, which uh, we hope we get any day now. 
uh, state route highway one um, intersection improvements. Um, that project is uh, continuing. Um, you know, we're excited to see the islands in place, a couple of the corners look like they're getting closer to being completed. Uh, that, that project is looking like though it's going to be pushed out as to a September completion. You know, that project is roughly $6 million and a lot of that was paid through a couple of different various grants, STIP and as well as our uh, traffic impact fee program. The Trevithin Storm Drain and Sewer Project, uh, that project is wrapping up uh, quite rapidly. Uh, we should have some final paving, I believe, this week or next week, followed by some finished uh, final striping. Uh, again, that uh, alleviated some of the flooding that has been happening for quite some time uh, along Trevithin, and it really is the phase project. So this is kind of the first phase, and as we look to uh, continue to rehab or um, upgrade the storm drain and sewer system along Trevithin, um, those will be some future projects to come. Uh, let's see, Westcliff um, Storm Drain, uh, Westcliff Drive Storm Damage Repair Project. Uh, you may have seen that one. That's definitely a high profile project, just given its uh, location over by Chico. Uh, that's moving forward quite well. Um, Reaver Construction is working on the grade beam out there. We had our uh, Public Works Week um, uh, uh, lunch presentations out there, and it, it was deemed a success. And we're excited to get that one hopefully buttoned up uh, sometime in July is what we're aiming for. Uh, wastewater treatment facility, Title 22 water. Um, this is a great project that we're working with the Soquel Creek Water District, um, again, and recycling some of the water that we have, um, using it, reusing it back on site, uh, replacing some of our filtration system. I believe this project that's currently under construction is gonna be able to handle upwards of 300,000 gallons a day. Um, half of that water will be reused on site. And then we are looking and working with, um, you know, the water department and regional transportation commission about a potential future recycled water bulk station, maybe somewhere on uh, Bay in California. So those are the major projects we have that are under construction. And I'll go through the projects that we have in design. Um, I'll try to go through these a little more quickly here. So the city arterial collector streets, uh, paving program, um, you know, we're looking at a few different uh, streets to, to repave in this upcoming uh, year, um, including Ocean Street and uh, Bay Street. Um, uh, potentially San Lorenzo uh, Avenue and Riverside if, if, uh, 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 Council, if you guys approve, you know, some additional general funding for that. Uh, we have the CMMS uh, upgrade. You know, this has been a big project, multi-departmental. Um, it's going to uh, really help um, streamline some of our uh, processes to, to uh, maintain our equipment. Um, and we are in process of uh, getting in contract with the highest ranked vendor on that project. The downtown intersection uh, two-way left turn improvement project is an exciting one. You know, and this, is, this project was created in response to all the development that uh, we are seeing now on Front Street. So this includes uh, the three intersections at uh, Front and Laurel, Front and Cathcart and Front and Soquel. So taking a real fresh look at doing uh, intersection improvements and removing some of that or most of that parking out there to accommodate a two-way left turn lane for the, I want to say close to 2,000 units, you know, that were that will be coming online in, in the future. Um, rail trail segments eight and nine, um, that is currently under design right now. Uh, I expect a, uh, an EIR to come back to you guys, to the public, later this summer, early fall. We're really excited about getting closer to getting some final plans and specs uh, sometime next spring. And we are applying for some uh, construction funding, ATP, uh, Active Transportation Cycle 6 grants. Uh, and that, again, it goes from uh, Wharf all the way, the Wharf roundabout to 17th Avenue. And we are working in partnership with the county and uh, RTC on that. Uh, Pogunet Creek sedimentation removal. You know, that's an important project. We had some flooding uh, a few years ago um, over by uh, kind of club, a club, golf club drive in that area right there. Um, there was a code violation that we're working through with the adjacent property owner, um, but we are working towards getting some, um, uh, again, that sedimentation removal, uh, initial work assessment done, and then uh, looking for a longer term uh, plan for um, some engineered um, solutions. Uh, sewer system improvements, that's something we always are constantly work on uh, year in, year out. We, this year, we're looking at um, lining some manholes um, as well as uh, doing to extend some of the life of the manholes as well as some of the pipe that we have. 
Uh, storm pump station number one uh, rehabilitation. This is this is very critical infrastructure. This is the pump station owned by Front and uh, Laurel uh, that keeps the downtown from flooding. So um, the st pump station is it's very old. Uh, um, the pipes are very shallow. We have an RFQ out right now to hire a consultant to help redesign that pump station and and uh, may get included with uh, the downtown expansion plan that the um, planning department is also working on. Um, let's see, the last two, uh, wastewater treatment facility, electrical system. This is another large uh, project that we have. Uh, we, we currently have a consultant on board helping us uh, redesign or um, really modernize the electrical system that we have our treatment facility. Um, it is roughly gonna be about a $20 million project, so it's quite large. Um, again, there's some of the system electrical components are antiquated and just are no longer supported. So that's that's a, a big one for us. Um, and back in 2019, we did a, a facility, you know, equipment study. Um, and, you know, in that study, we had identified uh, roughly at least $15 million worth of uh, projects or, or equipment that also needs to be upgraded beyond the electrical system. So we are working on, um, again, hiring another consultant team to help us design um, and uh, construct um, some of those improvements at the wastewater treatment facility. And that will be likely a you know five year plus program as we um, uh, work to upgrade that the equipment out there. And then the last two uh, items or projects that are listed there are the only two new projects that are being proposed in the public works a capital investment program. And uh, the first one there is the Bay Drive protected bike lane and ped path and that came out out of the request of the transportation public works commission and we're excited about that would remove a northbound lane uh, between uh, escalona and iowa and uh, allow for a uh, protected bike lane as well as a two-way pedestrian path and then a southbound a lane uh, would be converted to a protected bike lane and then the last one there's the escalona storm drain pipe replacement we actually did some initial work um completed i think it was just last fall um, to help alleviate that, this this is kind of the extension of of that Escalona culvert, which would require some right away and a retaining wall, and and is added in our CIP program. Um, Bobby, next slide, please. Okay, and this is my final slide. This is our final slide to show you here um, is the capital investment program, the unfunded projects. Um, and as Bobby mentioned earlier, and we've we've mentioned in previous uh, budget cycles, is that. We have a large looming uh, list of unfunded projects, over $300 million worth. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff lives in the active transportation program. A lot of it is just missing sidewalk and curb ramps and, and uh, storm drain projects that we just, uh, there is no funding dedicated for. Um, what, we, what we have shown here is the listed uh, projects that are um, in order of significance that we're seeking for uh, general funds to help plug. And, you know, the first one there that you see is the West Cliff Drive stabilization. And uh, this has to do with some of the, uh, you know, re, uh, king tides that we've had over the several years that have started moving some of the, um, you know, large rock down at the bottom. We're, we're looking at uh, two locations, I think near Woodrow, one location near Columbia, where we can place some of that in or replace some of that engineered rock to make sure that um, our path uh, stays stable out there. The second one there we have is the Ocean Street Reconstruction and Paving Project. Shows $2 million. We were uh, fortunate to be awarded actually a $1 million STIP grant uh, recently. So we are requesting about $1 million to help uh, complete the Ocean Street uh, Reconstruction Paving Project. Um, again, that project you've driven on Ocean Street. Um, it is pretty beat up. We are uh, hoping to kind of revitalize that entrance to the city of Santa Cruz with that project. Uh, the third project we have there, uh, you know, public facilities, energy savings and maintenance. Um, that's kind of a little bit of a catch all with our public facilities uh, projects. You know, we're requesting 200,000 from general fund to uh, really focus on rehabilitating the um, uh, restrooms outside the council chambers. So if you've seen some of those restrooms there, the flooring is actually, uh, there's actually a basement there and the flooring is actually starting to um, uh, uh, deteriorate. And so we need to really uh, put some money to rehab uh, those restrooms. Um, San Lorenzo Boulevard East Cliff Paving Project. Uh, if you've driven on San Lorenzo between Ocean and Riverside, that whole, or all the way out to Laurel Street, that whole roadway is really beat up. And that actually has to kind of do with the uh, shoaling that happens on the San Lorenzo River mouth. As we know, the water backs up along the river. 
and uh, really just puts uh, destroys the base uh, that Phoebe exists over on San Lorenzo. And so we're hoping uh, after the culvert goes in that this paving project then can also be done to you know extend the life of that roadway. Um, Riverside reconstruction and paving. Now this project came out of um, our underground uh, Riverside uh, utility project. I think back in 2016 or 17. Unfortunately, it was a large, expensive project to underground all the utilities, um, and we weren't able to award that project. But the street itself on Riverside is still really, really in poor shape. Um, with the development of the Marriott Hotel getting near completion, uh, we felt that it's time to bring this back uh, closer uh, to try to revitalize, repave that um, entire street and do some you know, uh, bike and pedestrian improvements as well. Uh, six, the Civic City Hall, Civic uh, parking lot reconstruction and paving, uh, roughly two three hundred twenty thousand. So that's the uh, you know parking lot um, that leads to Fire Station One behind the Civic. Um, that is a concrete uh, uh, driveway street, and it is really beat up. And you know uh, we definitely just want to reduce liability, similar to what we're doing behind uh, the Parks and Rec building uh, later this year. Uh, Bay Street reconstruction paving. Uh, you may have seen all that work that was happening with PG&E repairing their or redoing their gas line uh, on Bay Street. Uh, that street too is also in very very poor condition. Uh, we're excited about that one. Uh, about how that street connects from the rail trail to Bayview Elementary to UCSC. A lot of uh, multimodal use uh, on that uh, length of street. So we'd like to see if we could get some additional funds to help uh, repave that street. Um, Number eight, I mentioned earlier, that's the new project, Escalona Storm Drain Pipe Replacement. So that's about half of that funding we're searching for now. Uh, item nine, uh, Wharf Roundabout Bike Lane. This really came out of um, the idea of doing a mitigation for, uh, you know, we've had a lot of concerns and, and, and comments over the years with uh, bikes being able to travel northbound on Pacific through the roundabout, that it's a bit of a challenge. We've added striping and some additional signage over the years, but. Uh, what we're really looking at is trying to do is um, add a bike lane, uh, which would require obtaining some right away and redoing some of the curb gutter and sidewalk out there. So um, we put that on there. And then uh, 10, I mentioned this earlier about the citywide sidewalk and curb ramps. You know, that 2 million is really kind of a, kind of a, again, an initial step to kind of pick the most critical uh, locations in our city. We probably have roughly over, $25 million worth of side, missing sidewalk and curb ramps. Um, and then you can go to a lot of our different neighborhoods and we still don't have a lot of ADA compliant uh, curb ramps out there or no curb ramps at all. And so we're, we are looking and we've, we've had requests from different neighborhoods of requesting sidewalk um, facilities. And so this would help mo help move that needle uh, as far as getting that, those facilities in place. Um, SoCal Pine Storm Drain Improvements. Um, this one's been on our books for a while as well, but. Uh, you know, if you've, uh, when it did rain pretty intensely, um, we had a lot of flooding that happened on SoCal in front of the kind of the Whole Foods parking lot right in that area. All that parking is no longer usable in a, a good storm. Um, we do have a design in place, so it is essentially shovel ready um, and requires tying into the existing storm drain or adding storm drain system along Pine Street. And then lastly, we have there's a Branch 40 Creek channel repair, uh, roughly $3 million now, potentially more. Uh, we need to do some more analysis with regards to that. And um, any funding that we put towards that is going to be a multi-year effort. Uh, that's also going to be uh, include some fish and channel repairs as well. Um, again, uh, that $3 million, uh, it, we want some starter funding to kind of get us towards that goal of uh, repairing that. And with that, that uh, completes the public work CIP. Uh, do you, are we doing questions at the end there, Bobby, or? Uh, happy to take questions now if the council would like to, or we can certainly save them to, to the end, whatever the council would prefer. Okay. I see a couple of hands up. I'm happy to answer questions now. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Cummings, I think I see there. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess one of my questions is, you know, we, we get requests all the time from people in the community about, you know, for example, <clears throat> um, 
speed bumps in certain neighborhoods and sidewalk repairs. And so I'm just wondering, um, like, how do people get kind of repairs or what's the prioritization process for people being able to, you know, get some of these needs addressed around roads and road repair and, and road safety? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the question there, Councilmember Cummings. The most oftentimes I would say that if um, we are looking at simple repairs, you know, that are hazards, you know, we do have the um, online portal, the crisp, you know, response system to uh, create work orders for our operation staff to do some immediate fixes. But for things like uh, traffic calming devices or really a traffic calming system, you know, those kind of comments uh, we try to put towards um, our active transportation plan and our local, local roadway safety plan and developing um, projects that can be incorporated into those plans because that is how we, um, we use those plans to identify funding sources, go out for grants, and then really program our workload as far as staffing, being able to um, you know, actually generate um, uh, designs and uh, a biddable project and things of that nature. So, you know, we we are we try to focus um, the you know the public's um, requests towards revitalizing those plans when those when those come to before commissions and councils, so that that helps uh, staff prioritize um, you know the different types of treatments in, in different streets in the city. Great, and then uh, a follow up to that. I'm just wondering. Um, when the construction of the Marriott off Riverside and LeBrant finishes, um, is that road going to be repaired? I know they're doing a lot of, you know, they're pouring a lot of concrete for the sidewalks over there, but that road's been pretty torn up from all the heavy trucks coming through to build that building. It's been going on for a really long time. So I'm just wondering what, if that's on the list of roads for repair. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you for the question, uh, Councilman Cummings. It, it is on the, list of our unfunded list at the moment. So that is uh, project number four that we've listed, or number five, the Riverside Avenue reconstruction. It's roughly estimated about a million dollars that we're requesting. Um, it, and we are cognizant of the fact that Marriott is opening. And so, um, you know, we want to be able to try to tie it in with that um, sooner rather than later, getting the road rehabilitated um, as that, again, is an entrance to the boardwalk and the, you know, the, the whole Beach Fast neighborhood. And then my last question, because this came up, uh, I received a complaint a couple days ago um, regarding sidewalks and just wondering if you all can speak to, you know, it sounds like how sidewalks in front of residential properties are, are the responsibility of the property owner, yet it's something that provides a public good. And so some people would say, you know, if, the, if, member, if that's open to the public and it's not private property, why is the city not? responsible for paying for that. I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Um, sure. Yeah, thank you again for that question. It's uh, a great question. We do receive it a lot in public works. Um, you know, state, uh, the state law or state recognizes the burden at which um, the cost of putting sidewalks onto local agencies, it was too great. And so uh, there is a state law that essentially allows agencies to, um, you know, put the onus or liability and responsibility of sidewalk repairs and so forth on the adjacent property owner. And most, if not most local agencies in the state of California essentially have adopted that law, including us. And so uh, it essentially, again, states that um, the responsibility of the repair uh, of the sidewalk or uh, curb and gutter is put on the adjacent property owner. But we do, uh, you know, for the public works department here, we do work tirelessly to try to get grants, active transportation program grants, highway safety improvement grants to help install those sidewalks that are, again, in the public right of way, but then ultimately become the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. And is there anywhere people can go to get that information on how they could receive some funding from those grants? Um, the, let's see, online, we do have that information with regards to the responsibility of the sidewalk. The grants themselves, the granting agencies are typically awarding to local agencies, not necessarily to individual homeowners. So they can't apply for that through the city? Mm, not typically, no. All right. Thank you. 
is one of my questions. I might add actually that um, sometimes their insurance, their homeowner's insurance may help them out because it does remove a liability. If somebody trips and falls and on that sidewalk, they can sue that property owner. So there is an interest there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council member Golden. Mine is actually kind of a follow up to Council member Cummings, but it was um, in the, during during the pandemic, I noticed a lot of people out and about on Westcliff, and then I got um, complaints about of uh, uh, bikes versus pedestrians versus you know all that. And one thing I noticed, um, I just walked on the other side of Westcliff, the house side, and there was only maybe fifteen, less than twenty. I don't know exactly. It's been a couple of years since I counted houses on that side that did not have sidewalks. But I think if there's any opportunity to, and I, and I understand, and so I get one question is, at what point does the property owner have to put the sidewalk in? So, because is it is there, you know, a point, in, you know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. We, we commonly get that one as well. Uh, thank you for the question there, Golder. Uh, Council Member Golder. Uh, typically, uh, when a property owner comes into redevelop their property and it's over 500 square feet, it triggers a public improve, improvement requirement. And that's most often a sidewalk and or maybe a street light or a curb ramp, depending on if you live on the corner uh, of a, a street there. And so that's typically the most common way that you'd see a property owner install sidewalk on their own is when there's a redevelopment that happens or a remodel that they decided to move forward with. And then there's a public improvement that's included with that. Um, we as staff, we do work again, as I mentioned earlier, about applying for grants and you know, trying to score grants that are, um, you know, a safe house to school grants, uh, those after transportation uh, grants that you know, lead towards, you know, um, commercial and, uh, and uh, recreational facilities, you know, those tend to score a little bit better or of course uh, neighborhoods that are in, um, more in a disadvantaged community that also tends to score better on these grants. And so we do try to do sidewalk infill projects. We've been really <laughs> successful, but um, um, yeah, it, it is it is an ongoing challenge that we have uh, in public works. Is, is there any other, is that, is that, cause I mean, a lot of the houses already done, they're pretty large. Like, is there any other requirements, like, you know, any other, permits or other things that one would want where it would trigger um, the need for putting that? Is there, is there something we can do to, to, to kind of think about, you know, the str strategically about what streets people are generally walking on? You yeah. Know, yeah. I think that's, that's a change part of our policies in any way to, to um, facilitate that. Um. I think that's that would be incorporated with our active transportation plan. Uh, we did complete our ATP plan back in 2017 with a lot of neighborhood outreach back in 2015 and 16. Um, we are trying to re revamp that or uh, take a fresh look at the ATP plan. And actually, we're hoping to, again, uh, take a look at some of these sidewalk infill projects and see how we can really prioritize them in certain neighborhoods. Um, so that is, it is a plan that we have in place and we do look at some of the missing locations for sidewalk and bike lanes and those type of facilities. Um, but taking a fresh look at that plan will help us reprioritize where to, you know, look for funding for those type of improvements. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other hands up, so I will pass it on to Parks and Rec. Thank you so much, uh, Nathan, for all that information and presentation. Okay, uh, ready for Parks and Rec. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks, uh, Bobby, for advancing the slide there. All right, so just a brief um, summary of some of our capital improvement accomplishments uh, from the last year. And Bobby, you can, yeah, this is what we'll look forward to, to uh, fiscal year 23. So yeah, either either slide. In that last photo that you saw, that was a, a photo of Central Park, some capital investments that we made at Central Park. If you haven't heard of Central Park, it's a tiny little park over near San Lorenzo Park, um, but it means the world to that neighborhood and that community. So we were able to make some investments there. The iconic um, merry-go-round there in the background was able to stay, um, but uh, a really fun day there at Central Park. Um, Overall, we made uh, over $300,000 in capital improvement uh, investment throughout Parks and Recreation in fiscal year 22. 
Um, one other project that I wanted to just highlight uh, quickly, this is not an accomplishment from 22, fiscal year 2022, uh, but will uh, uh, go underway soon. And it was a question that Council Member Brown uh, had during our operational budget <laughs> a discussion, and that's related to Near you Lagoon. So near the Lagoon, we are working with Public Works um, on that. We received a grant for $200,000 from the uh, State of California uh, Parks Department matched by the wastewater utility at Public Works. So a $200,000 uh, investment uh, from Public Works and a $200,000 investment from the state to invest in the floating walkway, uh, about uh, 440 linear feet uh, of floating walkway um, over at Neary Lagoon. So that project will get underway uh, really soon. So um, just a very quick snapshot on some of the, the CIP projects last year um, and one that is really uh, in the works over at Neary Lagoon. So as we look uh, at fiscal year 2023, uh, here is a summary of the Parks and Recreation Department's capital improvement allocation requests. So two uh, different sort of buckets here. So. On the left-hand side of the screen, uh, this represents our Quimby and Park Facilities Tax uh, Fund source. So these are impact fees um, based on, uh, essentially based on new uh, development. And so this is the primary source of our capital investment uh, fund for parks and recreation. So it's a, a relatively small amount, uh, but this is where we draw from uh, typically year over year to find funds to invest into the park system. So um, uh, a number of, of items here that we're planning to invest in or hoping to invest in in, in fiscal year 2023 with council appropriation uh, of the budget. Um, a theme in both of these, both Quimby uh, and park tax and then the general fund CIP, really the way that we've thought about all of our capital improvement requests this year have been uh, rooted in three themes. So one is safety, uh, second is stewardship, and third is investment into operations that are going to create a, a revenue generation opportunity. So we talked about this during our operations budget, but we want to invest in things that can generate that revenue from a, a sustainability standpoint. So we'll talk about those. A um, couple that I just wanted to highlight on the Quimby and park tax uh, table on the left uh, hand side of the page. Again, in the spirit of stewardship, the golf course water conservation, investing in modernized infrastructure there uh, to make sure that we can serve as much water uh, as we possibly can up at the golf course, knowing that uh, water is obviously a scarce resource and uh, becoming more expensive um, and is a huge portion, almost 10% of our overall budget in parks and recreation. So an investment there is really wise, water wise, environment wise um, and financially wise um, the last item, the CIP system condition assessment. What this is, is we uh, we really don't have a strong uh, understanding, frankly, of our capital improvement needs across parks and recreation. We know that there are a lot of needs, but we've not done an assessment um, with architects, engineers, and other experts to really understand what are the, the needs, how much deferred maintenance do we have, and what is that value? So to really help the city council finance department to help parks and recreation understand what those needs are. Uh, we're proposing a system condition assessment uh, that we would do across the parks and rec system uh, to understand really what's needed from a capital um, investment standpoint. The, the next slide, um, and you can keep it on this one, Bobby, but the next slide I'll show you, we estimate that it's about a $70 million uh, price tag in terms of deferred maintenance, but that system condition assessment will really illuminate what those needs are. So that would be an investment um, in that respect. I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, uh, on these certainly that council members may have. On the right-hand side of the page, this is our general fund capital improvement uh, request for 2023. Um, this uh, frankly is not a source of funding uh, that Parks and Rec has really been able to leverage over the past decade or more. Um, with the exception of emergency projects that come up uh, where we uh, have needed general fund uh, emergency uh, investment uh, dollars. So the items here, uh, we're just very grateful to have the opportunity to be on this uh, on this list uh, for items um, uh, to invest in through Parks and Recreation funded by the general fund. So just quickly, 
first one uh, that we have on here is related to downtown recovery, infrastructure, site beautification, safety improvements. This is one of uh, the city council's priorities as it's set through the uh, re-envisioned Santa Cruz um, uh, platform um, and really um, it would allow us to, to kind of build upon or enable the downtown design standards project that is currently underway. So a, a, a real investment um, into our downtown. Uh, the second item that's on here, uh, this is in that safety theme. So it's our parks operations maintenance yard. Our parks yard is at Harvey West Park where we uh, have our um, a parks operation housed and we have a failing roof and a leaky roof over there. So this would be a proposal to fix the roof uh, in our um, maintenance yard over at Harvey West. The next uh, item is related to an investment in an area where we can generate some significant revenue uh, potential. Um, this is the disc golf course at De La Viega Park. Uh, this is a proposed investment in the infrastructure needed um, and updates needed for a pay to play model at the disc golf course. So we host, uh, the city hosts between 40 and 50,000 rounds of disc golf at De La Viega per year. It's a top 10 uh, world ranked disc golf course. Um, and we've worked with the disc golf club and had conversations about what this might look like um, in terms of charging a really a nominal amount, maybe five or $10 uh, a round of disc golf, but that would generate significant revenue for the city. Um, but that would be enabled really only by an investment into the infrastructure needed uh, to, to enable that pay, uh, pay to play model. Last item, uh, item on here is the structural and safety related projects at the driving range. So this is in that uh, really two categories, the category of safety and then the category of uh, revenue generation as well. So the driving range is part of the golf course, um, a portfolio overall. We've seen a lot of success there the past couple of years. The driving range uh, is an old facility and in the past year has uh, physically collapsed. Uh, so we've had to prop up a portion of the driving range. The driving range also serves as our cart barn where uh, golf carts are parked. So we've patch that together, but the driving range really needs some serious investment um, in terms of stabilizing the facility, uh, making it ADA accessible, um, and making sure that that part of the golf course portfolio is really successful. Um, we were working with our operator and we were losing somewhere in the ballpark of $10,000 or so per month uh, in revenue, losing that while the, the driving range uh, was closed because of the, the collapse. So this would allow us to invest um, in that uh, aspect uh, of the golf course. At the bottom of the screen here, and we'll talk about this more with the city council uh, at the end of June on a separate topic, but related to the uh, Poganip Lower Meadow Remediation and the Homeless Garden Project. So more to come here, but this is something that we have not included on our uh, fiscal year 2023 budget, uh, but it's something uh, looming out on the horizon that we anticipate the lower meadow contamination. This is a uh, lead contaminants from historic skeet shooting on the park. That le the remediation will be in the ballpark of somewhere between two and $6 million we anticipate, but we're getting final numbers on that. We'll bring that back to the council in late June and have a better sense um, of what that might cost. And for some context, we are hopeful um, and really anticipate pursuing state grants to fund that. So hopeful that we don't have to absorb that within the city's uh, general fund um, or other capital improvement budgets. So more to come on that. All right, so the next slide is just the uh, our estimate on a capital improvement, uh, or really our deficit or unfunded uh, budget which we, uh, we estimate at 70 million, but that facility assessment uh, will allow us to really evaluate uh, uh, conditions, facilities, parks, and get a better handle on what that number is. And then um, hopefully as part of the long range financial plan, build a, a real capital improvement uh, strategy or plan. How do we fund this? How do, and what is that amount? How do we prioritize these things um, over the next five, 10 uh, plus years? Right, so with that, uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, Lindsay Bass is still here. And then also our park superintendent, Travis Beck, uh, is here to answer any questions as well. So thank you. Thank you, Director Elliott. Uh, do any council members have questions on the C 
PIP presentation for Parks and Rec. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. And now, economic development and housing. Good afternoon, Mayor Brunner and members of the council. Good to see you again. Um, I have just a, a few short slides and um, I'll just start out by saying our um, funding um, for our department for CIP is all non-general funds. So we have grant funding, um, some of it I went over earlier um, in earlier today's presentation from Economic Development Administration, EPIC grant, infill and infrastructure grant, affordable housing, sustainable communities grant. Some of these are not yet budgeted because we don't have those grant agreements yet and haven't received those funds, but they have been awarded. Um, we also have funding and I'll go over that um, in a couple slides uh, from our affordable housing trust fund. And that includes deposits that we were awarded through the state HCD local housing trust fund match and the permanent local housing support. Um, we also have economic development trust fund um, funding uh, for our CIP. And then um, we do have some uh, redevelopment agency bonds um, that are um, specifically for projects that were in our last approved um, infrastructure plan for redevelopment that we still are moving forward on. Next slide. Um, the first project is Pack Station North that I just want to briefly say is in our CIP. We do have budgeted this year, and this is for incoming grants that we've received for Pack Station North, 7.7 .7 million, almost 7.8 million. This is for the 94 unit affordable uh, project in New Metro Center downtown. It also includes roughly 8,000 square feet of commercial retail, um, com retail along the bottom of Pacific Avenue where the Metro is now, and then some office space above, and it does include a green roof. Um, and uh, specifically on this project, we have uh, three million of that seven million. Three million is in home funding, and the balance of that, uh, about four point eight million, is um, from our affordable housing trust fund, and that includes our uh, awarded HCD local housing trust fund match funding. Next slide. And then our next project um, that we have funding for this year is the downtown library affordable housing project. Um, we do have a total between last year and this year, uh, 3.9 million um, that is set aside, uh, earmarked for this project through the state HCD local housing trust fund match that's in our affordable housing trust fund. So that's the 3.9 at the top. Um, and additionally, we do have uh, 500,000 in Measure S funding funded uh, specifically for the library portion of the budget. We do track all that separately. Um, for next year, and then some in the ED Housing Trust as well. Next slide. Um, additionally, this year we've been working um, per council direction um, with the farmers market on developing the permanent home for them on lot seven. And so we've been working um, with the, the original architect, this is group four, um, to revise the drawings. And we've also been having conversations with uh, Swinson and uh, the LLC that owns the parking lot behind uh, the um, New Seasons, and specifically about being able to combine some of their parking area with ours on market days. So we've been having some really interesting discussions around that. Um, but looking at uh, what we have currently budgeted, we're asking to budget an additional 500,000 from our Economic Development Trust Fund so that we have what we feel like is sufficient funding to be able to do the permanent structure component of the project, which is down um, scaled a little bit based on feedback from the farmers market leadership on what they want for sort of a year round structure on that lot. So more to come on that. We will be coming forward uh, to council fairly soon. We're hoping to go to the farmers market board um, in late June with some preliminary drawings. And if they um, approve those, feel, give us some good feedback, we'll come to council and present those to you as, as well. Uh, next slide. And then um, finally, um, we have in our CIP for this year is um, some additional funding to supplement the uh, 620,000 Economic Development Administration grant we received last um, prior year. It wasn't quite last year, I think it was the year before. Um, and then we also have um, in a prior year budget, 154,000 budgeted um, from our redevelopment bonds. So 
this additional funding is just to make sure we have enough funding um, anticipated. Um, we, it's out to bid right now um, to actually replace um, the pilings underneath uh, underneath this area on the wharf so that we can build and do a new project there going forward. Uh, next slide. So the breakdown of our funding sources, as I said, all non-general fund is the majority of it is our affordable housing trust fund. That's why you see our affordable housing projects. We do have some for some of the related infrastructure um, out of the ED trust fund, um, also affordable housing sources, HUD and home funding. Um, that 500,000 I mentioned are the measure S funds um, as well as just 2% overall um, from the city's public trust fund for the wharf. Next slide. I guess that's it. <laughs> any any questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Hey, uh, we're good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Welcome, Chief Odie. Hello, Mayor Brunner, Council. Thanks for having me back again. I'm um, just going to cover. Um, sort of a brief overview of our five-year sort of verbally um, asks for um, CIP, but more specifically what our fiscal year 23 unfunded requests will be. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so again, prior to going to, into this slide, I just wanted to point out that over the next five years, um, there will be sort of a, a heavy ask uh, from the fire department um, in terms of uh, CIP requests, and they're primarily infrastructure, specifically facilities and uh, uh, apparatus. Um, the facilities include, and, and you see it's in the, in our fiscal year 23 ask, um, some, some you know, um, minor improvements, um, but all the way up to and including um, some fire station replacements, as well as additional uh, facilities like the training center, um, which would be an ask, um, you know, in future years. Um, in addition to uh, facilities, we're also going to be, like you see in, in this year's request, um, fire apparatus. Um, when I came on, I inherited a, a pretty robust um, apparatus replacement plan, but unfortunately it, it had been paused um, and sort of set back a few years. And so I sort of dusted it off and really trying to accelerate that process um, because we, uh, in terms of our fleet, um, we're ailing. I'm keeping it together with baleen, duct tape, and popsicle sticks. Um, we currently um, have every reserve apparatus um, in service as we speak. And our ladder truck, which I'm requesting this year, um, is out of service for the fourth time in two weeks. And um, um, I'll, I'll talk more about the importance of the ladder truck to our city as well as the entire county. But again, these are just to sort of paint the picture for the next five years what the fire department is requesting from council and the community as a whole in terms of what we need to make sure we can do our job safely and effectively. Um, so moving on to this year's asks um, for um, unfunded CIP requests, again, primarily from the general fund. Um, first and foremost is our HeartSmart station, uh, station alerting system. Um, for those that have been by a fire station, um, it's basically just a speaker in the ceiling that goes off, it's extremely loud. Um, there is no gradual, um, it's, it's basically, it's rude to, to put it at best. Um, and that's what we've lived with for, for decades. Um, but basically, along with how it presents itself and, and alerts us to calls, um, we need to upgrade to the 21st century. Um, this is something other departments in the county are doing as well. But most importantly, I think, is um, you know, there is a health and wellness component associated with this um, new station alerting system. Um, it's tied to, through a number of different studies, reducing um, job-related cancer, cardiac issues, which are obviously very prevalent in the fire service, um, as well as uh, mental health issues and um, career suicide, which is um, a big risk for public safety as a whole. In 2018, the World Health Organization designated shift work and the related sleep disorders as probable carcinogens. Um, and again, sleep deprivation can increase suicides by 40%. And this is due to the abrupt uh, lights and loud alarms that cause this sudden heart rate increase and lead to cardiac and uh, physiological um, spiral, they call it. Um, so really there is a solution that we've identified. Um, again, we're partnering with um, other local agencies um, because we work with our NETCOM dispatching center, they have to be incorporated into this process. And so we're asking for 150,000 from the general fund to um, integrate and install this brand new system. 
um, so that we can again um, be more effective and efficient in serving the community, but also take care of our workforce and obviously reduce um, workers comp and disability claims in the future. Um, secondarily, um, we're making a request for fire station number two. Uh, it was actually um, in the plans 20 years ago when we had a bond measure to improve fire stations around the city. Fire station number two itself actually had no structural upgrades whatsoever. It was basically new carpet and new paint. Um, in the middle, in the last uh, about 10 years, we did have a uh, ADA bathroom upgrade, um, which was required and needed. But one thing that was in that plan 20 years ago was a separate fitness room for um, firefighters to maintain their health and wellness, as well as a place to store equipment. Um, and that never actually came to fruition. And um, I don't know if anybody has visited uh, fire station number two, but it was built in 1947. And we have effectively outgrown that facility, both as the people that live there, but the equipment that resides. And right now we have firefighters that work out in the same room as two pieces of equipment that are diesel uh, motor equipment. And so as you can imagine, there is the health risk right there. And so it's, it's something that I've highlighted and I think really needs to be taken care of ASAP. Um, third on there, actually I'm gonna skip over that because I have a slide dedicated to the ladder truck. Um, and I'll just skim over these last three really quick. Um, but we need a new generator for fire station number three. Um, obviously, we need to meet the electrical needs for the fire station during power safety uh, shutdowns, any outages, and also need to meet um, the electrical requirements and demands of our uh, SCBA, our air bottles. That's where we fill them up for the whole entire department. And it's very common that uh, when we are in generator power, we actually trip breakers and are not able to fill those bottles. So that is an upgrade that's needed, um, obviously for day-to-day -day operations, but for any um, you know potential disaster in the future. Um, a Butler building at station number three for 26,500. Really, this is to protect our investment and our apparatus that we currently have and will be getting in the future. It's basically a metal skinned uh, structure that will be in addition to the facilities that are on site there to protect again, the apparatus and equipment that we have, because again, storage, um, like many other departments and many people is at a, um, a premium. And so we need another place to actually store our equipment and protect the city's investment. Um, and last is just sort of something that again, wasn't done um, years ago in station upgrades. And that's just a sewer line clean out for fire station number three on the west side for 45,000. Um, so next slide. Sorry, that's just, there we go. Um, this one here, I just wanna dedicate some more time because it's extremely important um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we're asking um, from the general fund $1.5 million for a ladder truck, very similar to the one that you see in this photo that was bought 10 years ago. Uh, our current ladder truck, like I just said, is over 10 years old and per uh, the National Fire Protection Association is recommended to be put in reserve status um, and then consequently, uh, 10 years after that, it's, it's supposed to be retired. There's some other factors that are considered, but um, as I pointed out earlier in this presentation, our current ladder truck has been out of service um, after being repaired two weeks ago, uh, four additional times. And the, the most recent was this morning where we had to put a reserve, um, which is only 75 feet, not hundred feet. And for those that might think that's trivial, um, this. This ladder gets us not only to the roofs of a number of our buildings uh, that we currently have and are proposed to develop, but it's also one of our primary tools for cliff rescue um, in our coastal environment. Um, I think it's also important to note, as I pointed out, current cost and delivery time from any manufacturer um, of fire apparatus is, um, is out of control. Uh, they are currently saying that we have a, uh, pardon me, I lost my screen here. There we go. <clears throat> um, the wait list, the wait time is 25 months just to get a chassis uh, and a frame with costs increasing uh, about 12% in six months. And this is nationwide that we're seeing this in the fire service. When I have meetings with other chiefs in the state, um, everyone's having the same issues. So it's imperative that we get on this list now. And again, like I mentioned, we have this apparatus replacement uh, program that was established um, by previous chiefs but we need to sort of revisit it and accelerate that um, or else we're going to find ourselves um, without the equipment to respond to emergencies. Um, not only is it important to the city as a resource, but we are one of only three aerial ladders in the whole county. 
and it's an essential asset for fire and rescue operations, like I mentioned. Um, and again, not to beat a dead horse, but we are already behind on a pre-established apparatus replacement plan. And that goes for our engines and our trucks. Um, and again, uh, moving forward in our five-year plan, we're going to be asking, uh, I believe it's in fiscal year 24, 25, uh, two engines. Um, so I just want to make you guys aware of our current needs. They're critical. And uh, again, they're required for us to be effective at delivering this important service to the community. And with that, I will go ahead and uh, take any questions. Thank you, Chief Odie, for that realistic, sobering analysis and presentation. Um, let's see, uh, do council members have any questions on these? CIP projects. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just curious about the uh, lifeguard station on the wharf. I know that's something that ever since I've been on Council, it was like that needed repairs ages ago. And I was kind of wondering, and I know that all of these, everything you brought up, you know, it's it's critical infrastructure that we need to make sure that we're maintaining and funding. But I'm just kind of wondering how that's doing, how this the lifeguard station's doing, and you know, what's the timeline on that needing some help, especially as it coincides with the wharf, um, the wharf master plan and and operations out there. That, that's a great question, Councilmember Cummings, and it's actually one of those facilities that we address in our five-year plan. Uh, at this point, if I look at here, it, it would be targeted for fiscal year 26 for $5 million. Um, again, we'd have to really coordinate with uh, the WARF master plan and that development, but we have been in, um, in discussions um, for that purpose. And to answer your question as to where it currently stands, uh, I think we're on our third sort of roof repair, because as you know, the wharf itself is 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 always moving, right? Um, uh, under those pilings, and so the roof and everything else in there are sort of you know walls crack, roofs crack, and so we definitely need something that um, wasn't built by lifeguards back in the '60s, but meets current building standards and also meets our needs for our staff that are down there. Um, again, we're trying to pile in 60 or 70 temporary employee employees. These are you know 16 to 25 year old men and women. Um, in this small little place where they share restrooms and showers and dressing rooms. And then, of course, we have all that equipment that we use for our operations on two beaches. And so th there is a critical need. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And, and that is part of our long-term plan. Great. Yeah, thanks for the update on where that's at. And I've been in there and took a tour. And yeah, um, <laughs> however we can help, you know. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I think it really says a lot um, when 13, uh, when there's 13 priority one citywide projects and six of them are in fire. Yeah, thank, thank you for recognizing that. And like I said, um, I, I just wanna get us back on track to make sure that we we're, we're there for the community and for the employees that are there to deliver this service as well. Thank you. Thank are you. There, are there any other questions? No. Okay. Councilmember Cummings, you, you have your hand up? Okay. Thank you. Welcome back. Hey, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. Um, looks like there are no additional questions. So um, just want to remind the council that uh, staff is um, recommending that you approve these group of projects as a whole as part of this CIP process. And um, if you want to see them again, I'm happy to bring them back up. Other than that, that is the end of our presentation. All right. Um, okay. And, and the approval is not today for the CIP projects. That's correct. Correct. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify that. And I also just wanted to point out to council members that the summary reduction uh, sheet was emailed to us today for us to further look at. And um, 
reach out to any of the department heads or city manager with any further questions or comments on any of those. And um, yeah, does that conclude um, our presentation, Sen? Okay, at this time then, um, it looks like I will be going out to public comment. Um, so if you are interested in commenting on our fiscal year 2023 proposed budget, you can raise your hand now either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to three minutes. And I will go out to our attendee list. And let's see. Hello, attendees. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Not seeing any public comment requests. Okay, at this time then I will bring it back. And that concludes public comment. Uh, and that also concludes our meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.